space for IFNA. The applicant indicated that approximately five students will be using the temporary school and that the proposed office space will include four offices. Confirmation of notice. The manager of development services will confirm how notice was served to advertise this public meeting. Uh, three of Mayor Lawrence, notice was served through advertisements in the local newspaper, mail out sent to neighboring properties within 120 meters of the subject site and a sign posted on site. Thank you. Staff report, the manager of development services will provide a summary of the application. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, the purpose of the zoning bylaw amendment, temporary use bylaw is to permit the placement of two temporary mobile trailers on the subject property. One of the proposed mobile trailers is to be used for a temporary school classroom for students who live on the adjacent property. And the second trailer is to be used for a temporary office space for IFNA. Independent First Nations Alliance. The applicant indicated that approximately five students will be using the temporary school and that the proposed office space will include four offices. The subject property is located within the residential type two zone and the proposed temporary school and office space is not permitted within the R2 zone. The applicants are seeking permission to operate the temporary school and the temporary office space on the subject property for a period of three years. Following <coughs> This tenure, the subject property will be used for residential purposes as permitted in the R2 zone. The permitted uses for the resi residential designation are referenced in section 4.1.1 of the official plan, which includes residential uses in addition to the following, public parks, schools, community facilities, places of worship, group homes, and emergency shelters are also permitted on land designated residential within the urban Sulacote settlement area and within the Hudson settlement area. Following a review of the land use compatibility policies, a temporary mobile trailer to be used for a school for a limited number of students that reside on the neighboring lot is not expected to negatively impact surrounding land uses. Potential land use planning impacts associated with schools such as traffic and noise are not anticipated as the number of students are limited and live on the abutting residential lot. Similarly, the proposed office space carries the same considerations in terms of traffic land use compatibility. It appears as though sufficient parking is available on the subject property to support the uses on a temporary basis. Given that the proposed office space is not permitted within the residential designation of the official plan, it is recommended that the temporary office use only be permitted for a period of one year should the temporary office be demonstrated to be compatible after one year, the temporary use bylaw for the temporary office could be extended to the maximum three years. From the land use planning perspective, there is a policy basis to support the proposed small scale school and office use on the subject property for a temporary period through a temporary use bylaw. The applicant will be required to enter into development agreement with the municipality it is also recommended that the development agreement include the requirement for securities in order to cover the removal of the mobile trailer, if required. It is recommended that the temporary school be approved for a period of three years and the proposed office use for a period of one year. That's it. Thank you. Um, correspondence from government agencies. The manager of development services will read out any correspondence received from government agencies and municipal staff. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, we received one comment from our public works manager, Andrew Jewell, as follows. I strongly recommend that no further development occur within Bernier Bay until the subdivision developer completes the construction of the street, which mainly pertains to asphalt servicing. Although I'm, I'm, I'm confident there are other deficiencies present as well. I just drove the street, Bernier Bay, and it would appear that they, bracket the developer, have now added additional granular material to raise the grade of the granular surface to the finished height of asphalt. In doing so, there are now manholes that are buried under aggregate and inaccessible, completely inaccessible when there are two residents, residences on the street that are occupied. More development anywhere in this subdivision will simply cause more issues for the municipality and all development should be halted until the subdivision is completed by the developer and the transfer of infrastructure completed through a certificate of, of acceptance with council's approval. Thank you. 
That's it for correspondence. That's it for government and municipal staff correspondence. Thank you. The manager of development services will read out any correspondence received from members of the public. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, we received one comment or actually like a petition from uh, signed by 24 members of the public, mostly residing in the 7th Avenue area. Uh, there, we the undersigned are opposed to the placement of the mobile trailers for schooling when they just finished a brand new high school. It is a residential neighborhood. Let's keep it that way. We do not want to see it cluttered with temporary trailers. Thank you, Stephen Otto. I believe kind of spearheaded this petition signed by multiple residents of 7th Avenue area. Thank you. That's it for public. Sorry? Sorry, that's it for public, Mayor Lawrence. The applicant's presentation. The applicant or a representative is invited to speak to the application. Is there a representative? I see Matthew, you going to speak? Yes, I will. Thank you. You hear me okay? Yes. All right. Um, just want to make sure I can kind of do. Well, how much time do I have there, Mayor? Mr. Clerk? I'm sorry? How much, how much time does the, uh, the applicant have to speak? Uh, that's at the discretion of council. Okay. So it's, it's, I mean, not half an hour, Matthew, but uh, you, you, uh, I think three, four or five minutes, there'll probably be questions. So go Excellent. ahead. Excellent. No problem. So thank you very much, uh, council, um, mayor, of course, all the other people on the line to the same time and on Facebook land. Yeah. Uh, before I kind of go, I'd like to kind of just kind of put some context to this presentation, of course, and why we're doing the things we're proposing these two zoning by uh, changes for 4.1 for Bernier Bay, but also 98 King Street. It kind of all ties in together. So um, I'd like to kind of share my screen and just kind of walk you guys through and everyone else is kind of observing if that's okay. So let me just kind of hit the button and kind of walk through this real quick for you. We don't have to do anything, Clerk. This is, uh, nope, carry on, Matthew. Absolutely. So, perfect. Do you guys have a, do you see a, a graphic there? Oh, hold on. Share button. Not there we go. It's, I think it's coming now. Yes. Okay. So let me just kind of move this over a little bit. All right. So you should have in front of you kind of a screen. This is a homeway community dwelling code response for your plan. Do you have that in front of you guys? Yes. Okay. So put in context here and kind of uh, forgive the kind of you know, where we're at kind of thing. So in response to COVID and pandemic, right, this whole plan of why we're proposing these two revisions would never have, have, have occurred. And the reason why is because, well, we have a bunch of students we service from the far north, uh, from um, Kitchen, Mesa, Newick, and Muscat down, uh, down First Nation. So the story is basically, we're, our always plan was to go ahead and develop Bernier Bay and having a third or potentially fourth residence. Because of the pandemic and the shutdown and the economics and banking and stuff, we were unable to secure the funding, the resources. And of course, when we finally got that stuff tied up, uh, we came to the realization that uh, the facility would not be ready till February the earliest. And that was based on two month ago kind of approval. We just didn't get it done in time. So we were scratching our head. And during this time, we figured out and realized that we had more students that wanted to come out to Sioux, look at the Sioux North High School than we actually had space for. So what this kind of graphic kind of illustrates for you is that here's our initial plan. We have 20 room for 20 students, two existing residents in Bernier Bay. And we have 30 students, actually more than that actually. And we had this problem of we did not have the resources, time, realities, crews, whatever. So I'm just kind of go on the next piece. The proposed plan was this, right? Was to kind of, because of the COVID pandemic, have our 20 students go with existing student residences, have trailer one available for education office space, right? I'll kind of explain why we went to that and supplement teaching area. Unfortunately with the pandemic and with the school opening, right? We're anticipating some kind of closures of, or to occur for whatever reason. And what we learned from the last eva not evacuation, but the last kind of um, sem second semester of last year is that we had a heck of a time supporting our students remotely and in their home communities to maintain their schooling. And there's a lot of challenges there in terms of infrastructure, access, connectivity, all those kind of barriers. And we had a heck of a time. And like most kids, we were, they were able to kind of struggle through it. We also recognize going forward in the education thing, there's gonna be very different going forward. So what we're looking for is support from you guys and the rest of council and the rest of the general public is to kind of give us a bit of office space, and supplementary teaching area. This is to kind of help us provide those gaps in the case of a, you know, 
know, some kind of shutdown as soon north, like this, maybe extended or not extended. Right? The other part of our plan was to also kind of convert our IFNA, which is part of that 4.298 King Street, from the existing commercial office space that we currently used to use, and we currently are converting it to a, a student residence. And the goal of that thing is to have that ready for September 1st or September when the kids arrive from north, September 8th, September 7th, that kind of thing. And what we have there currently on site is a IFNA temporary office trailer. So the plan is to have the 20 students plus the 10 to meet our 30 group home kind of uh, home away from home students, in addition to our six boarding homes, plus the other kind of eight students we have going to Thunder Bay and other places. And what we're doing is with this plan that we have proposed and have working towards it, sort of seeking public support and your guys' support is a, a plan that's very robust and meets the needs of our communities like kids that want to come out. Now, the permanent future plan is this, right? The reality is that we were gonna, our plan always was to build a third, potentially fourth residence in Bernier Bay. Because of those challenges, it didn't happen. King Street, we can come back to this thing and make it back into commercial res, commercial space, whatever the case may be. You know? And then the reality is, we I, I fully recognize the potential perception of eyesore of our King Street trailer kind of thing, but there is a method to the madness. And what we wanna do is utilize these three trailers we currently have on place and use them for remote office sites, uh, trailers in our communities. You know, there's a big challenge here of accommodation stuff and just at the same time too space kind of thing. So it gives a bit of a foothold. This is not, you know, the plans and the use of trailers is not a forever thing. This is a strictly a pandemic challenge, us trying to figure things out and, and work forward. Now I know there's a bunch of questions and comments about, you know, the setup of, this, of the students, this, this, uh, the program, all that kind of effort. And what I can say is that we have had tremendous success with this home away from home model. And it wasn't with the support of the people on 7th Avenue and other places in the past, right? You know, with our, with our 20 students that reside in these residences last year, right? We had some very positive feedback. And what we were able to do with full wraparound services and an army of staff doing some really good, cool and great work, we have been able to kind of have of the 20 students from the first semester, 84 courses, 83 courses were passed. And it's incredible work these kids have been able to achieve by us helping them remove the barriers. In addition to that, right, I've been doing my checks and stuff and in terms of ambulance kind of calls, police kind of interactions kind of thing. Nothing of the, of the case was that experienced or called upon at the, at the Bernier Bay previous like existing residences, right? So I know there's questions about, you know, having one person take care of these kids. And I think we could say is we have a wide variety of a full well, wraparound services and team. And I just wouldn't mind to have uh, Dr. Lloyd just kind of provide some context of the COVID, but also some of the things that we're doing. Let me just kind of unshare my screen and I'll let uh, Dr. Lloyd Douglas take over this little piece here and have some context. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. And thank you um, to everyone who is on um, this call. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors. So, you know, COVID-19 has really changed our lives. And uh, moving forward, uh, we have to adjust to the new normal. Um, you know, we have been blessed that in our region, we have not had, you know, you know, lots of cases. But what we're seeing in the North is that there's a risk to the students who are there now. The mental health issues, um, the issues around neglect, poor housing, and all of that is, is, is very serious. If you're keeping track of what's happening up north, I think to date from January until now, we've had about 13 suicides. Um, you know, when I spoke with the coroner um, the other day, um, saying that he's seen an increase in terms of deaths from drugs in the north. And our students, you know, this is what they're facing back home. Um, I appeal to everyone, you know, platform that what IFNA is, is seeking to do is to provide these kids with an opportunity to move forward. And um, of course, we're always doing this now in terms of balancing the risk. Uh, right now, the situation in our region is that the risks from COVID-19 has been very low. And um, this is just an opportunity to provide 30, 35 students uh, you know, with a shot at, you know, making making their lives, um, you know, improving their lives for the future. 
So that's what we're trying to do. Um, I can tell you that if the health, um, you know, there is a robust safety plan in place and we are, you know, we have plans around what should happen if a student uh, contracts COVID-19, all of that has been worked out. Um, so just to support um, Mr. Hopf, um, and most importantly, the students and their families, um, you know, just make an appeal that, that, that this is a measure due to COVID-19. And please do remember the risks that are associated with some of these kids who are back in their communities right now. And then the long-term risks of them not getting a good education. Thanks. Uh, the last quick comment there, Mayor, is I don't know if everyone's fully aware of the far north and how my peers in the tribal councils, right? And I'll be honest with you, we're very lucky and fortunate to have the assets and the opportunity to kind of bring our kids out. According to, according to my peers in the tribal councils here in Sulaco in the region, right, we're one of the only ones currently maintaining status quo in terms of bringing the kids that want to come out and can come out and are eligible to come out. Uh, majority of them are staying home and doing other ways of kind of dealing with the high school and do, providing that service, right? What I can say is that our biggest goal of IFNA is it's all about the kids. It's all about providing opportunity. We have some tremendous momentum with the kids and the growth, and we want to maintain that. And this is all about giving these kids a fighting chance. And these assets, this approach, this, this team that we have, it's, it's there to, for the kids. And I know there may be perceptions out there about is this for a money-making venture, that kind of thing. No, it's all about the kids, and it's all about providing that service. We have a proven track record of being a good corporate citizen. We're trying to contribute. We want to invest. We want to continue the good work. And we're looking for support from all, all areas, whether it's neighbors, leadership, mayor and council. And you know what? This is for our, our, our community members up north, especially our kids. So thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll now go to uh, questions from uh, members of council. So I'll just do this in the usual way, starting uh, with uh, Councillor Timpson. Uh, yes, a uh, question for uh, Matt. Um, I didn't quite hear what you said, something about police calls and ambulance calls and the changes there. That was one, one question. And uh, I assume you're not using boarding homes as much as you used to, is that correct? Uh, so, yeah, so two questions about how this model is improving on uh, uh, certain aspects and whether you're using boarding homes that, could you, might, would you mind reviewing that again? Yes, for sure. Uh, so in terms of police ambulatory calls from the previous uh, last year from Bernier Bay, uh, very little, if any kind of uh, presence and kind of uh, calls. There were there was a call uh, unrelated to our students. A uh, yeah, person had kind of fallen in the ditch and fallen down, couldn't get up, unfortunately, kind of thing. So called the police, called the ambulance that came by, helped the personnel kind of thing, right? Uh, in terms of uh, boarding home solutions and kind of thing, right? We do have about six students going to be boarding out within families, their families in town and also attending Sioux North, but our also approach is to do a two prong is dealing with 30 kids coming down, having them within our, our home away from home approach. Okay, thank you. Councilor Bath. Yeah, yeah I'm, uh, I, I'm certainly fully supportive of, of, of you know, uh, um, increasing our de development in two lookout for students. I am a little concerned with the three year time zone. That's a long time to have a uh, not great looking trailer in residential property, like, uh, particularly R1 property or R2 property. I am concerned with the time, the, the length of time. I would be a lot more happier if we could see this reduced to a year because, you know, I know certainly COVID is the problem. COVID may not be gone in a year. But uh, it's uh, we need to keep on moving forward, and I, th I think a three year uh, three year allotment for this is, is too long. I'd be inclined to be a lot happier seeing it as one year. Thank you, Councillor Fenlon. You'll need to unmute, Councillor Fenlon. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I, I sort of agree with it. I, I mean, we're in trying times here right now with uh, COVID-19 uh, and it's, it has set back people from doing things uh, normally, uh, you know, probably I would think a couple of years and it's, uh, it's going to take time to, for everybody to play catch up over time. So I, I'm, I'm for it uh, to maintain what they, what they got there and 
if we if they can do something in a shorter time, that's great. If not, well, we'll have to live with it to three years. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Yes, um, my comments are a little, or I might, I do agree with Councillor Bath with the uh, miss maybe a shorter duration on the time for for both. Um, we we also do have you know, this petition with these signatures against it, which I feel that there's just the context that Matt went through in explaining why this is going on and where it is, that was really missing from the reports going out that the public had access to. And, and you know, it's in the, the, the wording under around a temporary school, it kind of sets off some flags. And, and for people, it's it can be a little a bit of a knee jerk reaction when you hear that you don't see the context and understand what's going on behind the scenes here with what's the what is you know, with what the concerns of the members of the public brought forward. I, I, I'm, I would like to see it would be nice to see some of that addressed and it just it might just be a letter or phone call to some of the people just understand their issues and their concerns and address it and hopefully they're watching tonight and they can see your presentation and see what the purpose of this is and why you're doing it. It's not that you want to establish a school there. It's, this is a temporary use. You just need to get by for COVID. And, and that's, I, I think that would be, be a good step to get the people understanding. So everyone's on the same page here and, and equal playing ground. Um, my other, my other question, I guess, for Matt around this, is with regards to the public works manager's comments about developing on that street with that aggregate and stuff like that, and being that your your organization is pretty much the only developer there, would do you think your relationship with the developer would allow maybe you to lease or utilize another lot further back or around the corner from the uh, from the subdivision and? that you could potentially put the, these trailers on, keeping it close to the accommodations, but then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be down there, it wouldn't be down the street in the development where these issues are ongoing. Um, and that might just kind of alleviate both things. I don't know what your thoughts are on that or if that might be a possibility. Yeah, anything's a possibility. I know just the context too is that we initially, I believe, purchased these things, these two lots adjacent to our existing lots. So we have a total of four lots, two buildings, right? Um, we bought those things in April, I believe, because of the whole plan was to build the third and fourth residence potentially if needed. Third for sure, maybe fourth, right? Um, and what we're trying to do, if you look at the site plan, the application doesn't maybe serve it justice, but we're trying to put on more on the back corner of that lot. And to, to be honest, I'm talking to our tech folks and where our plans are is that do the finance to get the things done and then so working on building the third residence behind it and then we're our, we're hoping for is that this pandemic thing is is no longer an issue come next year next summer right and we can again just like this pull these things out recognize that everyone's kind of comments and kind of uh, perception and realities and we can get back to kind of uh, having these residences in the subdivision to us originally intended for but what we are trying to do is really just backlog and give us a bit of a fighting chance to kind of support these kids and that's kind of looking for right now. Councilor Cassidy, that you good for now? Yeah. Yes, yes, for now. So um, Matt, just to follow up on a couple of the, the, the councillors before I get to Councilor Lego. Um, the uh, the two years in, in, in lieu of three, is that something that you can you can look at or we're I'm a flexible guy kind of thing. We're okay. just like this thing works, so you know, term, whatever, right? So and, in, and what Councillor Cassie said about uh, the, the further consult with neighbours and the further education, et cetera. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you're paying attention here, I hope you, I know you are. Um, because there has been, and I'm doing this a bit prematurely just to, to perhaps uh, get the discussion in the right place. Because there has been a letter of opposition, does that mean we, Council would be wise uh, not to approve tonight, but it, it, we must go the, the extra 30 days? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, again, that's at council's discretion. The the approach that council adopted was uh, or has been typically that if there are uh, opposing comments or concerns raised at the meeting, then then council would send it back uh, to have staff address those those concerns and uh, uh, a, sup 
uh, a supplementary report would come forward to council at the next uh, at the next council meeting. Uh, so that option is available to council. Uh, I can't speak, however, to how that may or may not impact um, uh, IFNIS timelines uh, for for receiving students in September. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll move on. We'll come back. Uh, circle back, Councillor Lego. Yeah, I'm just wondering if um, these concerns that once, once COVID is gone, that well, hopefully gone, um, that it can be written into the bylaw or into the development plan that once it's done with, we can move on and they can look at building the third residence. And then we're not, hopefully it's in six months or a year instead of the, the two or three years that everyone, everyone around the table seems to be, everyone seems to be at, a, at about a two year period. Um, the shorter to me, I don't mind the three years. I'm, I would like to see three years on both of them. Um, if you're going to have one, you, you need the other one. Um, to me, what um, Mr. Hot was saying was that this isn't a school, it's more of an educational support for the kids, and they would just rotate through there for, for extra help after schools because they're all attending Sioux North High School. Um, so and uh, the last was again, how how do we get to this to the, the to the developer and get that road fixed? Because those are some serious concerns. Um, we have homes on on that uh, on Bernier Way already. Um, they're looking at building another one and another one possible possibly. Um, I don't know how how we go about addressing that or our support to IFNA to address that. Um, I don't know if anyone has any suggestions on that. Uh, those are my, my thoughts and concerns, so. Uh, CAO, uh, do you have any, I don't think the public works manager is on online, is he? No. Um, thank you, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Lego and, and rest of council. That's um, an issue between the municipality and the developer that we're currently uh, working on. Um, we did have an independent uh, review of all the infrastructure and it's going to involve some time and uh, meetings with the uh, developer to resolve those issues. Okay, so uh, I'll just go around the, t the, the council table one more time just to check if there are any comments or questions. Uh, and before I do, I'll just comment that I know uh, what Mr. Hobbs said about the calls for service, uh, placing an EMS through through my work with both the, the police and the uh, district services board EMS. I know uh, that uh, the, the calls for service are down this year and the inspector has attributed uh, a lot of that in terms of the students. One of the things is the work that agencies like IFNA are doing with the students, the total support they're giving students and how, how things have changed so dramatically in the last few years in terms of uh, policing encounters with students. So. Uh, what Mr. Hop was saying is, is quite right. The, the students are very well supported now. Uh, they're giving them every chance they can to succeed. Uh, I'll go around the table one more time. Councillor Timpson. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I definitely support the, um, the project and, the, and sympathetic to the reasons behind it. I think that there is some argument to be made though to uh, at some point meet with the uh, the, the people uh, leading, particularly the people that led the petition, and explain to them the reasons. Because as somebody said, the um, it was not out. I had I got the information about, you know, the background. I got that uh, through other sources, not through our um, report, and the public would not have that information as well. I don't know why we should have to wait uh, 30 days. Why could we not just do something in a um, you know, is sort of in a, a little, speed it up a little bit and maybe uh, bring this back as a special meeting in a week or so, if that's possible, a week or two. Um, but overall, I, 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 you know, I support the concept and I, and I can attest to the fact that the tribal councils are doing tremendous work with the young people. Um, the effort going into the young students now is, is incredible compared to to what they were able to do before. And uh, uh, I think the group home approach is, is far more effective than uh, uh, kids having to integrate into a family they don't know. And um, 
and that's just asking for asking for trouble for uh, the, the north is very troubled these kids are coming from troubled tra traumatized environments and they have huge they have huge issues when they come down here and i think they do far better in a group setting and it's far better for everybody so overall i'm in support thank you thank you councillor bath yeah I, i'm certainly in support of it i you know i want to applaud definitely for the work they've done and with the students and and the, the way it's turning out i think that's great uh, so, I, I, so I still have the same concern. It's, a, it's the, the time frame is long, and whatever we can do to shorten it up, I'm certainly not going to stand in the way of it because of that. But I, I think it's something that we need to make sure is on everybody's mind. I, we we need to uh, we need to, we have to move forward. We can't keep blaming it for, for forget, no, sorry guys, COVID for stopping everything. It's uh, it's it's here. We've got to work our way through it. It's not going away. We're not, we've got to work our way through it, and somehow we have to move it. But I, I support the concept, and uh, and I guess that's all. Thank you, Councillor Fenlon. Yes. Um, I, I, again, I still support it, and listening around what's going on, there, there's some. Uh, I can't think of a word for it, but they're to speed it up a little bit and get it going for the kids. And I think it's um, the kids are, it's a great help to them to, to have that uh, assistance to, to, go, to go between the high school and, and their residents and, and this other deal that's going on there. And I, I think it's, uh, uh, I've, I'm for it, so I'm not. That's about all I'm going to say on it now. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I, again, I support it, and I, I, I think it's it, it is great, and the model they are using is is excellent. I, I do, I do agree with Councillor Timpson in regards to maybe there is something we need to do to make sure that this the understanding gets to the people who have concerns in that neighborhood. So everyone is, there's not going to be any hard feelings and, and whatnot. And, and like I said, I think it's just a misunderstanding of what exactly is going there. Um, my suggestion is I'm, I will make myself available within the next week, two weeks, whatever time you need, Matt, to maybe potentially just kind of to promote this a bit to some of the neighbors and help people understand what's going on and, and try and address those needs or address those concerns going forward and, and potentially maybe maybe there is a, a plan B which might be another a, a potentially another lot just nearby and and go forward and bring it back and and then we can work at it and try and make sure we can still meet your time frame but still do do our due diligence and make sure that uh, we address the other concerns from the residents as well. Councilor Lego. Do we have do we have the option to vote on it tonight? Uh, clerk, yes. Yep. Okay. Um, to me, it's it, it's on the table. Um, I, I did like the fact that we got some more information because when you put the word school out, people think that that's what it's going to be. But from what's been explained, it's it's not a full time school. It's it's there for an edu educational resource for the students coming down. These these students are going to Sioux North High School. Um, I think if if there's doing a tremendous job getting the kids down here and providing these solid supports for them. Um, it's, it's great for everybody. Um, I don't know how treed that area is, or if you can see, we'd be able to see the, the, it seems that what Matt was saying was you can put the trailers up and then maybe at some point you can build the house behind those trailers while they're there. Is that what uh, Mr. Hopp had stated? Go ahead, uh, Mr. Hopp, please. Yeah, um, no, no, what I did say, the original plan you'll see on the kind of the application, right, is that the third unit would be in the front as kind of a parallel along the loop in terms of a similar frontage kind of thing. And then having the two trailers in the back, like on the back corner of that lot, and it's kind of a pie shape, but irregular lot, and we're trying to 
maximize this space, we'll put as far as we can, but also out of the way and do what we need to do kind of thing, so. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I don't I don't have an issue of voting on it tonight. Um, we're, we're here to make some tough decisions, so that's how I, I, how I view it. Thank you, Councillor Lego. All right, so we'll get to the options later, but right now we go to, uh, and Mr. Clerk, you'll have to help me with this, this part online. Questions for members of the public. Members of the public are invited to speak to the application. The public can ask questions of clarification or seek background information, speak in support of the application or speak in opposition to the application. All questions will be directed through the chair. It is directed that only, it is requested that only one question be asked at a time. Please identify yourself before you ask your questions so that you can be properly recorded in the minutes of the meeting. That's the same, the same wording we have for in-person meetings. So Mr. Clerk, help me with how we're going to carry this through. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, my recommendation is that uh, we approach the two individuals who are on the call, who have made arrangements uh, to uh, to participate in this fashion, um, and provide them with their opportunity to uh, to make comments. Um, the first individual, uh, if we wish to uh, do this based on um, order of uh, request, uh, the first individual would be uh, Mr. Alan Feeney. I'm just kidding. Mr. Feeney, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm I'm not against it or anything. I just have two questions. Um, when the children, as I understand that they're using it for two or three years as a temporary thing, what happens to the building? I missed the first part. What happens to the building afterwards? Mr. Hop? Uh, which site are we talking about here? I talk about both things. Is it 98 or is it King Street or is it Burner Bay? Uh, we're on. We're on uh, the application right now, Mr. Clerk. Is Bernier Bay? Oh, Sorry. I'm talking about. I'm talking about King Street. Um, yeah, good. Okay, Mr. Feeney, and we have actually the way these statutory things work is quite rigid, and that's our next next item on the agenda. So right now, we're, okay, we're, we're confined to Bernier. We'll come back okay. to you though. If that's okay. Do you have anything okay. on Bernier Bay? No, I don't. Nothing. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, three mayor my, uh, my apologies. I believe the uh, the second individual also wanted to speak to uh, Nanye King. Um, uh, forgive me for mispronouncing your name. Is it uh, Roselle? Hello. Yes, it's Roselle. Sorry. Sorry. It, it, it were, had you requested to speak to this application or Nanye King? Nanye King. Same with. Oh, okay. Great. So there's no one else on the call, Mayor Lawrence, who wishes to speak to this application. All right. So council and public, everybody, we are still on the Bernier Bay application. The next item is conclusion and closing of public meeting. Mr. Clerk, would you like to read this part? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, certainly. Uh, so this concludes the public meeting regarding uh, zoning bylaw amendment number Z03-2020. If any member of the public uh, wishes to be notified uh, of the decision of council in respect to the application, you must make a written request to the manager of development services. Notice to appeal the decision of council to the local planning appeal tribunal must be filed with the manager of development services no later than 20 days from the date the notice of the decision is circulated. The notice of appeal shall be sent to the attention of the manager of development services, and it must include the following uh, information, the reasons for the appeal and the fee as prescribed uh, by the local tr uh, planning tribunal, sorry, the local planning appeal tribunal act in the amount of $1,100 payable by certified check to the Minister of Finance province of Ontario. Only individuals, corporations, or public bodies may appeal the decision of council to the local planning tribunal, <clears throat> the local planning appeal tribunal. Uh, an appeal may not be filed by an unincorporated association or group. A notice of appeal may be filed in the name of an individual who is a member of the association or group. Thank you. So we're now, uh, Mr. Kirk, continue to help me. We have two options. Option one, if there are no opposing comments, but I believe there were opposing comments. So uh, that's correct, uh, Mayor Lawrence. So, uh, so council uh, th in this case, uh, yes, there was uh, opposing comments uh, in the form of a petition. 
So advise me here, do we go to, can we do option one or do I need to go to option two? Um, again, this is at uh, council's discretion. Um, the um, uh, council can choose to defer this for uh, for a period of time for staff to go back and, and uh, bring back a, rec a, a further recommendation or a, uh, a way of uh, a report that uh, sort of speaks to how the, uh, the concerns were addressed uh, by those who uh, are in opposition. Um, uh, or a council can choose to say that um, they've heard those uh, concerns, uh, but having heard the, the presentation by uh, the applicant, uh, council satisfied that uh, the concerns are, uh, have been addressed uh, by way of that uh, presentation is another option. Um, uh, uh, and in that case, then council would go with option two. Um, so it's entirely council's uh, uh, decision whether you wish to uh, defer this to a future date or whether you wish to uh, to vote on it this evening. I guess there's one way to find out if the if the option one is defeated. Can I go to option two? Um, uh, yes. So, uh, Jim, uh, the our planning consultant wishes to speak. Sure, Your Worship, maybe if I could just provide a bit of clarity. I've been listening to the comments and I've reviewed the comments that were provided. I don't believe in this instance there would be any benefit to deferring this application tonight to receive further feedback from staff. Uh, I have re reviewed the comments and uh, I believe the main concerns are related to compatibility of the proposed use, which staff uh, have provided a response to in the report already and have provided their opinions related to compatibility. So I think they're really the two options available to council uh, at this point, based on the discussion I've heard are to consider option one or to consider a revised um, option in terms of reducing the time period that the temporary use would apply for for the school um, for the, the school trailer from three years to a lesser number. So I think those are the, really the two um, key considerations for council, approve option one as is, or consider reduced time, time period. So just, I hope that provides a bit of clarity. I don't think there's any benefit in deferring. I don't think you're gonna get anything new from staff as a result of a deferral. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's 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 good information, uh, Mr. Hop. Uh, just because there was some council, if if the three years was changed to two years, would that be workable for you? Yes, it would. So um, I'm going to propose that uh, when the motion is read, I will change uh, the period of three years to two years, and we'll go. I'll read option one and ask for a mover and seconder. Fair enough, Mr. Cork. Following procedure. Uh, yes, uh, th uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Um, um, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering. It's not an amendment because it hasn't been put on the table yet. So correct. It's, it's a revision before it's put on the table. All right. So uh, here's the motion, uh, Council. Um, that Council receives the Planning Consultant's report dated August 19, 2020 and authorizes the passing of bylaw number 67-20, being a bylaw to amend the Municipality of Sulaco Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw 85-18 as amended to permit a temporary school use on the subject property for a period of two years and a temporary office use on the property for a period of one year. Um, mover, moved by Councillor Lego. Seconded by Councillor Timpson, discussion? Councillor Timpson. Yes, um, I, I still think that, you know, we talk about community engagement and we want, com we want uh, the community people to be part of our decision-making. Um, I believe that it's still, uh, it is only fair that the, that, uh, and I would like to see uh, the IFNA people, uh, Dr. Douglas and Matthew Hopp, sit down with some of the people and just explain to these folks um, the, 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 the reasons why uh, IFNA is going this route. I think we also have to think about race relations. And I think this would be a, a very good opportunity for IFNA to reach out to the, to the people that uh, uh, are, are uh, worried about this issue. Um, and, I, and I think 
we could do it in a week and we could bring this back in a week. I think that would be the best decision to make. I'm not prepared to oppose the option one, but I would think we would be better to defer it for a week and, and at least try to have some discussion with the neighbors in line with what we are uh, touting uh, in our strategic plan to engage with the public. That, that's where I stand with it. Councillor Fenlon. Um, one question I have is uh, with maintaining the office at one year, how is that going to affect the other two trailers? I, I don't know how they're, what they're, um, you have, you have the two trailers for the, for the kids and the one is for offices. Mr. Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, what we have through a previous kind of uh, variance request from last year, right? Yeah, we, we came to council and asked me to need some additional office space at 98 King Street. And what we have there is a, another trailer we have sitting there right now being utilized for our finance staff, right? So what we have there is a separate discussion, but it's part of it. Uh, it was never, we were trying to find office space last year and couldn't find anything, right? But in terms of the Bernier Bay, those are two brand new uh, trailers, units being brought in. Well, one's brand new and the other one is the former uh, Head Start program daycare trailer that's sitting at the, in the parking lot right now. So just to provide some context and background, where, where are these coming from and what they are, but that's where it is. I'm not sure if Councillor Fanon is asking about the compatibility, two years for the one use and one year for the other on the same site. Do you, or, is that the question, Councillor Fanon? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, does it, I thought it was the same duration, to be honest, two and two kind of thing in my head. Uh, the temporary office use on the property for a period of one year is what it, it, we have in the resolution. Okay. Um, in terms of it'd be ideal to have two years, but to be honest, uh, one and one and two, whatever the case may be, you know, our, my, my priority is to kind of have the supports for immediately for this year. And we can always cross that bridge later on or remove it kind of thing. So, okay. Okay. Uh, that's good for me. Thanks. Councillor Banth. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I understand Councilor Jameson's concern about uh, talking to the public about this one, but obviously this is a time a time uh, factor. If we're going to approve it, we need to approve it so it's going to work, and it's going to work for the school year. The school year is not going to be. You know, we've only got three weeks and two weeks to go already before the school year starts, and so if we start delaying this to discuss it, and potentially come come and bring it back to discuss it some more it's not going to be ready in time for the school year. So I am in favor of option one as we have amended. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I still kind of agree with, with what Councillor Timpson said about trying to at least reach out and, and just make sure the people that have expressed concerns, we've deferred things with less comments in the past and with less opposition and and I understand the time sensitivity of it but I also understand the, the importance of it and it just it, it's one of those things that I just think my concern too is is that it, the, the the ad was in the paper last week and it went out again today and that's my 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 concern here is is that these the people that express their concerns it hasn't been, it's been out for a week where people have actually seen it and the notice was posted on the site, which is back in the Crescent and it's not something you drive by all the time. And so it's been out for a week. So people just don't understand this, this program. And that's the reason I think we see this petition is you don't understand it. I've talked to a couple people that were completely against this. And then once I explained what this was a little further, they, it kind of went away. It was like, oh, okay, I see that. But I just think that that's, that needs to be part of this process is making sure we address these concerns. And I'm, I'm still kind of in the same mind again with, with Joyce here, or sorry, Councillor Timpson, is that I don't want to defeat it. I just want to see us take a consistent approach the way we've done it in the past, where when we have objections, especially 24 people on a petition, that we do our due diligence and address it. But 
like I say, I'm perfectly happy accelerating the timelines for if not to make this work for their school year and and going forward. And I just think there needs to just be a little more outreach to it, but I won't, I won't, I'm not gonna defeat it or I'm not gonna go against it. I would like to see both trailers be the same time though. I, I, I think we need to be, I don't think you wanna go one year where you're pulling one trailer out, then the next year you're coming and pulling another one. Well, how's that gonna affect development if you wanna put a building up there? If you're pulling these trailers out and going around the building and stuff, if it's gonna be a time frame, I suggest one year for both. And then we can, if there needs to be the extension after that, we can go for it. And, but do, don't piecemeal this with one year and two years and just do it the same. Councilor Lego. I was good with two years <laughs> for both. Um, if we can, if it's acceptable to Mr. Hopp to have a one year and then a caveat for an, an additional year, um, that I guess that would that have to come back to council or is that all written in? I don't know how that would uh, how Mr. that would work. Mr. Or Jamie Planner, yep, please. Yeah, sure. So three year worship in terms of uh, how that would work. Any temporary use bylaw is under the Planning Act can is in effect for a peer, a maximum period of three years. Council can again choose any amount of time less than that. And then councils can offer one year extensions past the three years as well. So let's say for instance, you decide to allow these for one year, um, in a year's time, it could come back to council for an extension request. And uh, it's, you don't have to pass an, a, uh, the new bylaw, it's simply council passing an extension. So you don't have to go through the full public meeting process again. So it's designed that you can evaluate if it works correct appropriately for a, a shorter period of time, but then provide an extension if that's the case. So, so that is an option that's available. Thank you. Councillor Lego. Yeah, um, and the only other thing I would like to maybe Mr. Hopp can reach out to Mr. Otto who spearheaded the petition, I believe. Um, maybe you can just give him that, show him that presentation that uh, this, is, this is the mindset going in they, they, they have more students that want to come down to Sioux Lookout to go to Sioux North. Um, I think that would be a, a good outreach as well from IFNA to the concerned citizens, uh, getting the information that we received tonight as well. So, and if we want to go with the one year and then option it for next year, I, I'm, I'm good with that as well. Just to get this moving so they, they know what they can do and, and not have to wait one or two weeks and then scramble for a week to get the kids in. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, I agree with Councillor Lego's comments. Mr. Hopp, can you just uh, can, are you able to do that to do the reach out? Oh, for sure. Um, yes, I would be happy to reach out. And I, again, I would have made some calls beforehand, but I kind of got that petition information earlier this afternoon. I know one of the people that want to provide comments on the next thing. I did reach out to, to Rochelle, Rochelle, I believe, to kind of have a chat and to be honest i'm committed to talking to whoever i need to kind of get some buy and provide the clarification so I'm, I'm committed to doing it very good thank you so uh, i think i'll just uh, call the vote now as it stands i think there's been enough clarification from uh, our planner regarding the the extension of the of the one year to two is is a relatively simple process if it's required in a year's time um so all in favor Maybe can we have a show of hands here? All in favor? Can we, cl can we clarify that for a sec? So we're, we're so I just want to make sure we're voting on the motion one that was read. The motion that was read. I can read it again if you like. For for two and one or one yeah. and one. Two and one. Okay. And based on the the explanation and clarification that the planner gave of the extension uh, being a relatively. Uh, easy to come to council it doesn't take a full public meeting next year and council decides whether to expand or not you 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 heard that clarification yes so it's yeah. so we're we're voting to go for one year for both trailers no nope. and then I'll, I'll, I'll read the, i'll read the motion again and maybe mr clerk would you read the motion that, that you have there now 
to you, Mayor Lawrence, certainly. Uh, the council receives the plan consultant's report dated August 19th, 2020, and authorizes the passing of bylaw number 67-20, being a bylaw to amend the municipality of Sulaco comprehensive zoning bylaw number 85-18 uh, as amended to permit a temporary school use on the subject property for a period of two years and a temporary office use on the property for a period of one year. That's the motion on the table that was moved by Councillor Lego and seconded by Councillor Cassidy. I'll no, call the- Timson. Councillor uh, Thank you. I'll call the vote one more time and ask, can I see all the councillors? I think so. Uh, show of hands, all in favor? We have one, two, three. Carried. All right, so that's, uh, we've dealt with item 4.1. We'll now move on to item 4.2, zoning bylaw amendment file number Z04-2020-98 King Street. The applicant is the Independent First Nations Alliance. This public meeting is being held pursuant to section 34 of the Planning Act as amended to consider a zoning bylaw amendment. The purpose of the zoning bylaw amendment is number Z04-2020 is to rezone the subject property from the downtown commercial zone to the residential type two exception seven zone to permit the conversion of an existing office building to a residential use for the purposes of student accommodations. The manager of development services will confirm how notice was served to advertise this public meeting. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, notice was served through advertisements in the local newspaper, a mail out to uh, neighboring properties within 120 meters of the subject property, and a sign posted on site. Thank you. The manager of development services will provide a summary of the application. A zoning bylaw amendment application, uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, sorry, a zoning bylaw amendment application has been submitted by the Independent First Nations Alliance to rezone the subject property from the downtown commercial zone to the residential type two exception seven zone to permit the conversion of an existing office building to a residential use for the purposes of student accommodations. The subject property is located at 98 King Street in the municipality of Sulacote. The subject property is currently developed with an existing building that is used for office space as well as a separate temporary temporary trailer being used as additional office space. The surrounding land uses generally include commercial and residential land uses. The subject property is located within the urban settlement area and is designated residential in the official plan. The permitted uses for the residential designation are referenced in section 4.1.1 of the official plan, which includes the following. A range of housing types and tenures shall be permitted in the residential designation. The subject property is located in the downtown commercial, in the downtown commercial in the zoning bylaw. The subject property has a lot area of 920 square meters and a lot frontage of 20 meters on King Street and also has frontage on 7th Avenue. The applicant is proposing to convert the existing building to accommodate a residential use. The building is proposed to be used for to house students containing 11 bedrooms, a kitchen, four washrooms, common spaces, and mechanical and storage areas. Following a review of the proposed application, it is our opinion that the application is consistent with the relevant provincial municipal policies. It is recommended that the application be approved and a maximum of 11 bedrooms be specifically used used specifically for student accommodations be included in the site-specific zoning bylaw. If approved, the following uses will not be permitted, bed and breakfast, boarding house, crisis center, and group home. In the future, if the use changes, it will be subject to the necessary planning approvals. Thank you. The manager of development services will read out any correspondence received from government agencies and municipal staff. Through Mayor Lawrence, we received no comments from government agencies or municipal staff. Thank you. The manager of development services will read out any correspondence received from members of the public. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, we received one comment from Rossell Yuko or McLeod. Uh, good afternoon. I just read the letter sent to homeowners close by the subject property. 
I have two properties near the area, 101 Queen Street and 99 King Street. In my understanding of the letter sent prior that this said building is under office renovations, but this new letter you are proposing will be used for residential home and student accommodations. How come there is a sudden change? Why this area? Can you actually do this? What can other landowners do in order for this proposal not to get approved? This area I chose to raise my children in because it's quiet, although it is a busy road, but still quiet in general. This could change that. There will be a constant of in and out in the area. In my opinion, First Avenue offers better for boarding home as it is very close to the new high school. I hope to get updated or if I could participate on a meeting just to hear what other landowners thoughts are about it, this proposal. Please let me know. Thank you. Sincerely yours, Marcel McLeod. Thank you. That's all from the public. Yes. Applicant's presentation. Applicant. The applicant or representative is invited to speak to the application. What? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure there, Clerk and Mayor, if you want me to do the presentation over again. Um, it's kind of the same one. I can do it if you want, or I'm not quite sure if it's benefit to the current uh, participants there. So, your call. Mr. Clerk? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, it's entirely at the discretion of the applicant, uh, whether or not they wish to present again. In the past, uh, I know we've had applications that uh, dealt with both an official plan and a zoning bylaw amendment um, that uh, the, ap the, the applicant presented uh, for the first one, but didn't for the second part. So uh, if, uh, if Mr. Hopp feels that uh, the first presentation covered all the key points, then, uh, then that's perfectly okay. Um, Sorry, go ahead there, Mayor. No, you, 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 it's your choice, Mr. Hop. Yeah, and I guess just for uh, Mr. Mr. Feeney, I don't know if he, he said he missed that part of the presentation. Um, would you okay, want so uh, Ben, if you feel you want to do that, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Okay, I just want to make sure. So I'm going to kind of go this in warp speed here again. But again, uh, Mr. Feeney, please, if you need to raise your hand and put it, I'll slow it down kind of for you. So. So um, just to kind of provide again context, round two kind of thing. Um, our plan was basically we were always trying to kind of do a couple of things, and specific to 98 King Street, that kind of thing. Uh, we're an organization that helps a bunch of First Nation kids from Muskrat Dam, Pickenhanchik, Muskrat Dam, and Big Trail. And really, what we have currently planning is we have the Bernier Bay, 20 students, but we have more than 20 students that want to come down and attend high school and so look out. So in a knee-jerk reaction because of COVID and the pandemic, we were really handcuffed in terms of our ability to do things. So we looked at, you know, in late July, or sorry, late, late July, well, what are we going to do? Because the financing, the option to build and the, the time frames construction for our third site, third building at the Bernier Bay was not possible. And really what we had to do is figure out what we're going to do quickly. So did the knee-jerk reaction of they kicking all of our staff out out of our existing 98 King Street and transferring that as we speak into a, a, a 10 unit student with a supervisory suite there. And I just kind of want to just kind of show really what we're trying to do is do a bunch of things in specific to the 98 King, right? We're kind of handcuffed with resources and what our options were. There are no suitable accommodations in Sulaco for a group setting kind of thing. What we found is that with um, the support program, the wraparound services, the investment of all the support people that we do have, there's, we do a great job of helping these kids. What we have done a great job about is, is done a great job of helping them with their academics. What we have found that with being able to help support these kids with their challenges they have, things that they've been going through, once you take away those barriers away, they do a really good job. And really what that means is academics comes shining through in a positive way. And really what it is, is we had 20 kids in the first semester in the Bernier Bay, 84 courses, 83 passed. And we were able to continue that success in the second semester just as well. So right now, currently, we have about you know, 36 students coming down right now today, coming down to Sulaco to go at 10 Sioux North. Six are in boarding homes, 30 in the, in the, are proposed in our uh, two sites, Bernier Bay and the Ifna King Street office. And really what we're trying to do is just provide the option and give us a bit of lag time to do a couple of things. And this is basically what we're trying to do is buy us a bit of time. The future plan, oh, sorry. Go that direction. The, per, the future plan is to go ahead and reinvest and get the third building up. And then we come back to the 98 King Street and say, what do we want to do with this, right? 
gives flexibility to kind of either continue on with support of council and the public, or do we go back to commercial? Doesn't really matter to me, but what I am focused on is trying to provide support for these kids in this COVID pandemic environment. If I am unable to, to you know, get the support from council and everyone else and support and buy-in, I'm gonna to have to go and attend kids and tell them you can't come down. And, and I, I don't know how I'm gonna do that. That's my problem, not yours, but that's exactly what's gonna happen. And I get to kind of deal with it. My community chiefs, the two chiefs from Muskrat Dam and, and Gisham Mesa and Inuit, Big Trout, and kind of explain to them why I couldn't pull this off in terms of getting the support necessary to do this stuff. Now, I, what I can say is from Bernier Bay from last year, there were no police calls, no ambulance calls. I know there's stereotypes or whatever you want to call. We do a great job of taking care of these kids and not just, you know, after school at nighttime, there are staff there all the time. We have a supervisory suite and that's, that's there. We're going to have two workers there in the evenings, weekends, that kind of thing. Plus all our well-being workers, multi-purpose counseling support. It's a full wraparound services. And we can, the proof is in how we've been able to succeed and do this thing, right? Now, the reality is if we didn't have COVID pandemic, we wouldn't be doing this, this commercial residential thing, but it is what it is. This is the best option we've come up with the timeframes that we have. And we're seeking the support and kind of clarifying. And again, I'm more than happy to go and talk to anybody and explain what's going on in the context, whether it's for the, obviously for the previous kind of zoning request, but also this one too. So I'm seeking your support, helping me help these kids. And really what we want to do is continue on building the success, the success that we had last year. And these kids, unlike everyone else and my peers, we're both the only ones bringing in the kids as per normal status quo from previous year. A lot of the other communities and my peers are keeping their kids home. And it's because they do not have a group home setting, home away from home. And this is just a tool and it's, it's not here to make money. I know people have this perception of it's a 11 unit apartment, 11 bedrooms, 700 bucks, 800 bucks a day, times it by month, times it by 12. That's some significant cash. This is not about that. This is about serving kids, helping kids, supporting kids, and giving them a fighting chance for the future. So I don't know, Dr. Loy, if you want to kind of add a quick, quick two cents, but I'll kind of just uh, stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Matt. I'm good. I'm good. I think you did a great job. Thanks. Thank you, both Mr. Hopp and Dr. Douglas. Uh, we'll now uh, move to questions from members of council and the public. First, uh, members of council. Uh, starting with uh, Councillor Timpson. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, certainly, um, as I said before, I appreciate very much what the Tribal Council Education Authorities have been able to accomplish in the last few years um, in keeping kids in school from the, kids in the north from kids from the north in school and uh, healthy while they're down here. Um, what to, I'm curious to know um, what will be the use of the the 11 room residence in a year after you've been able to build your third residence? What what are you envisioning for it after that? Uh, the simple answer is we convert it back to commercial or come back to council if you have a different opportunity. And I, I can't foresee what it may be, but maybe something else, but you know, the easiest way is revert it back. And really what it comes down to is we're having a heck of a time finding commercial space and looking around town and we're kind of, our existing staff are spread all across in home office, but also in Fun Street, old train station. And we're trying to obviously at the, at the existing kind of bring your base site too. So um, we're open for suggestions, but at the same time too, this is just giving us a year support lag. And then if for some reason we have the third unit built at Bernier Bay and we have this available and we have existing additional students that we have, Maybe we'll continue to have as a, as a residence, but at this at a minimum, we'll be doing commercial. And if for some reason something else that comes up, that maybe I've, we'll come back to council and propose here's another option that we didn't anticipate, such as just this whole pandemic COVID thing. So, anything further, Councillor Timpson? Yeah, no, I just, just the um, I guess it's a comment that, um, and I understand you know, where residents in the downtown core, you know, within the, those neighborhoods, that is the downtown area, the urban area rather, that uh, um, people are seeing their neighborhoods dissolve. Um, 
I, for example, I have eight neighbors next door to me that I don't even know because there are new rental units there. And um, I, I think that one of the concerns is that, and I, I share this concern that if we don't have affordable, like bio, access, accessible housing for anybody who wants to come and work here from the north, from the south, where there's neighborhoods that will keep people here, if we're all rentals and temporary housing, we're gonna lose our whole community sense. And, um, and that, that in the urban area, that is. And, that, and that's, I think, um, where some of this resistance comes. And I've often in the past suggested that we, we think about when we're putting these various um, uh, rental units or exceptions, spread them out throughout the community so that existing neighborhoods can exist as a neighborhood where, you know, there's nothing like having a neighbor that you can go next door and borrow a cup of flour from or ask them to watch your house while you're away, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just, I'm just saying that as a, uh, as a comment, it's not a, not my backyard. It's not the NIMBY thing. It's, it's, it's looking at how do we uh, preserve a community sense. And then also having said that, if, if there is a, a residence here, how can that residents, those 10 kids, how can they connect with the neighbors so that the neighbors aren't afraid that they're losing their, their, uh, uh, their, you know, their support system, their neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? Because often these, these types of residents become separate from the community and, and it uh, hurts and people feel isolated from them. And I'm just wondering what, like what, what IFTA could do in order to help these kids integrate more into that neighborhood. So th those are comments. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not opposed to this. I'm just saying, I think this is where some of the resistance comes. And, and I think it's important to take it into consideration. Um, and, and when we, when we uh, develop and, and go forward with these kinds of projects. Thank you. Councillor Bath. Yeah, I only have uh, probably one real question. Uh, the uh, I think this really highlights, you know, it continues to highlight our housing problems, no doubt about that. So the, the, I think everything we see on tonight's uh, agenda. The one concern I have, <clears throat> and it came up before when we had our, um, I can call them billet houses, and it was a concern I had then, Is and it's a concern here is the wording. It calls, It mentions 11 bedrooms. It shouldn't mention 11 bedrooms, it should mention 11 students. That to me, it closes the door for, 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 for overcrowding and it's such a simple thing to do. And I'm sure that's what it means, but we need to make clear that's in the bylaw. And that's all I have on that. Councillor Fenlon. Uh, I don't have any comment the same as, as the last, uh, presentation is pretty much and uh, I know I feel that that there's good things happening for the kids that are coming down from the north and and even if coming in from other ways other places that uh, we are trying are striving to pr provide them with housing and adequate housing at the time to keep this uh, flow going for the kids in the schools and uh, Make them welcome here and feel good about it. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I, I, I do support this as well. My just a couple comments um, is why is this going to an R2 and not a, a multi res? Um, I don't know if we can answer that. And why is it a permanent and why didn't we go to a temporary use bylaw like the other ones? If this is in response to a pandemic that's not consistent, why isn't this a temporary use? So perhaps I could turn to staff to answer those questions. Uh, planning consultant, are you on, Jamie? Or staff, our own uh, development services manager, Jody? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I hope Jamie's still here to speak. Sorry. To oh, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, Em, I was just slow to slow to the trigger here to, to sign in. Um, 
So in terms of, I think there's a couple of questions there. The first one related to why did was the R2 zone category selected in this instance? Instead uh, of the MR, yeah. The, uh, so through your worship, the R2 zone category was selected. It's uh, similar in nature to the other zone categories in the area. There's other R2 zones in, in proximity to the site. Um, also the built form on the property, just in terms of the existing building is characteristic of what we see in other R2 zone properties in the municipality. And uh, the proposed, what's proposed here is an exception that, that would provide some site specific zoning to the, the site. So the specific zone category isn't, uh, isn't, isn't uh, totally relevant to, uh, to what's being proposed. I would also like to address comment from Councillor Bath, just in terms of the, uh, the reference to the students versus number of bedrooms. The reason we're not allowed to reference students specifically in the bylaws under the Planning Act, we're not allowed to what's called people zone or zone for specific uh, persons in a community. So we're really required to zone based on the use of a building or structure. And that's the reason for the reference to uh, number of bedrooms as opposed to uh, students in the bylaw. And I apologize, Councillor Cassidy, what was the, the second portion of your question? Um, well, it was about the, uh, the R2. So why it was an R2 and why is it not a temporary use versus this a permanent? Right. So, um, so I've addressed the first comment about the R2 with respect to the temporary use. Um, what was applied here was not a temporary use bylaw. The applicant applied for a full rezoning application. Um, staff have reviewed that zoning bylaw amendment application in its entirety and believe based on the policies contained in the official plan that the proposed use is appropriate for the site. What I can do is just in terms of providing a bit of color in terms of the planning the reasons for our planning decision. We had a look at the surrounding land uses in the area. Uh, the property is across from the uh, across from the arena. It is within that downtown commercial zone currently. So the as of right permitted uses are numerous in nature on that property and relate to a number of commercial uses that are permitted as of right. Only a building permit would need be needed or a change of use permit to do a number of commercial uses. Um, so on, the, on that basis, the existing surround, like, surrounding land uses, the zoning permissions that are provided currently, and uh, the nature of the proposed lot, it was our opinion that the proposal was, um, did conform to the applicable planning documents and it, um, it was compatible with the surrounding land uses. That was one of the key considerations. So it was, to answer your question in a few short words, it, the reason the, the full zoning bylaw amendment is done here is because that's what that was what was applied for in this instance. Councillor Cassidy, good. Yeah, no, um, I got a couple more. Um, so I, I understand that. So my my hypothetical here, I'm throwing I'm throwing this out, is that we've had our two applications come through for eight units, seven units, and those have gone either way, and they've been defeated by us. Now we have accommodations in an R2 zone for 11 units. And, and like it just, what I'm, what I'm getting at here is our consistency across the board with how we handle this stuff. And my personal feeling on this one is that, is it should be some kind of a temporary use multi-residential to accommodate this for a certain amount of time allow for this if, if it's just going to look keep us across the board and how we conduct ourselves and what we're going through and what we're approving and, and rejecting I don't know that our two I, I understand what the planner's saying and with regards to the house and the formity but would you look at the densities and, and how many bedrooms there are in there it, it, it fits to me it seems like it's more like a multi-residential I could I would agree that it should be an exemption under multi-residential for to allow permit this and i was my other comment i was going to make was about the people zoning that that uh, jamie touched on there 
and that was exactly it isn't it? it says student accommodations in the bylaws and that's that's the one thing i don't want to go down to is is it is it student and old versus young versus whoever i don't like we went through an exercise and got rid of a lot of that stuff to clean it up so i don't want to see us going back to that with some of these exemptions um that's kind of my thoughts on this again i fully support this i want to see this succeed i just want to keep integrity with how council approves and approves decisions and going forward so i'll leave that for discussion all right uh councillor lego okay so when i grew up that was a home um it belonged to a family um i don't know at one point uh if not took over it must have been in the 80s or early 90s um so for the past 25 years or so there's been 10 12 people every day going in and out working in that in that building um so now we're we're looking at changing it from workers to students and the students will only be there for the school year gone back home at christmas gone back home march break gone for all the summer so you're looking at seven months of, of residency um i also agree with councillor cassidy about temporary use because we do need to be consistent here um, we we have refused larger single unit dwellings be, before um, and i don't know if this is this is a different situation um because it's not a is it a rental or isn't it a, a rental because it's for student accommodations is there a legal difference to that i don't know if jamie has an, an answer or jody has an answer to that for you your worship to the counselor maybe i can just provide a bit of additional clarity I've had a chance to just well uh, the questions being answered just have a look at the zoning bylaw and uh, a, a few more pieces of clarity to provide um, the issue so first off the issue versus rental versus non rental. Um, we don't really we don't zone for that through the zoning bylaw that's a type of occupancy or tenure of a building so that's not something we typically would deal with through through the planning process. Um, specifically related to back to Councillor Cassidy's question as well related to whether we it's appropriate for a resident multiple residential zone or an R2 zone. The R2 zones permissions provide for a number of multi unit type dwellings as well. The R2 zone provides for townhouses up to four townhouse units. It provides for permission for a triplex. The main difference between the multi-residential and the R2 zone is that the multi-residential zone permits an apartment building. Um, it too also permits townhouses. So we could use either one of those zones in this instance as the parent zone. In our view, the R2 is the most appropriate. Specifically, again, for the temporary use component of it, this building is proposed to be renovated to um, to allow for residential, for effectively a residential use of land uh, from what's a commercial use of land currently. This building does have permanent sewers. It does have, it, it is a permanent building. In the previous applications, we were looking at uh, temporary buildings on the site. And so there's a bit of a difference there in terms of the nature of construction in the building that exists. I will just point out as well that there is a temporary component to this bylaw um, already. And what that is, is a carryover from a previous temporary use bylaw that was applied to this site um, to allow for the trailer. So, so the trailer on the site would still be only permitted temporarily for another, I believe it is two, two years. And um, however, the, the, the main portion of the bylaw is for permanent uh, permit use. So hopefully that helps to answer some of your questions or provide a bit more clarity on the issues. Councilor Lego. No, I, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would just uh, make a couple of comments. I think the um, the site is currently commercial downtown commercial, which, uh, as uh, 
the planning consultant said, and you can you can tell me if I'm wrong, if somebody wanted to put a bar on that site, a restaurant with a bar, they could. If they wanted to put in a, bit, a store or retail, they could. It's downtown commercial allows for uh, many, many, a wide range of uses, and it would only take a building permit to, to do that. I think that's what you have said, uh, as long as it met the downtown commercial use. So the site is, is available for almost anything right now. Planning consultant, is that, have I misspoken there? Yeah, to your worship, you're you're correct. There's a whole host of commercial zones that are permitted as of right in the downtown commercial zone. Uh, those uses, you would, the approval that they would require is a site plan approval, which is not a public process, but in an effect, although this bylaw does allow for an additional use, it does um, take away a whole bunch of uses that are there as of right currently in the bylaw. So, um, we believe that from that perspective, as as the, your worship, you've mentioned it, that it, the proposed use is more compatible with the surrounding and existing development than what some of the as of right permitted uses are currently. I guess another comment is in terms of some of the other applications we've looked at and made decisions on over the last couple of years, uh, be they eight plexus, seven plexus, whatever, this is one, it's more like one residence with one door. It's like a, it doesn't have eight doors going into it. It doesn't have uh, the possibility of having eight cars or even 16 cars if there was a couple living in, in eight different units. It's, it's, it's one door like, like a private residence with 11 bedrooms, a large family. Uh, they used to be more, more of what we did many years ago, have 10 kids or whatever. So I think it's, it's, it's qualitatively different and, uh, than, than the, the other applications we've been considering. Um, those are my comments. Um, at this stage, we've been around the council table. I think it's time to go to the public. Uh, so we'll go with uh, questions from members of the public. Members of the public are invited to speak to the application. The public can ask questions of clarification or seek background information, speak in support of the application or speak in opposition to the application. All questions will be directed through the chair. It is request that only one question be asked at a time. Please identify yourself before you ask your question so you can be properly recorded in the minutes of the meeting. And I believe we're going to Mr. Kirk, Mr. Feeney first, was that correct? That's correct. Mr. Feeney. So in this case, you don't have to identify yourself. It's not like being in a public meeting. Uh, please proceed, Mr. Feeney. Hi, okay, uh, my name's Alan Feeney. I live at 90 King Street. And uh, for a little clarification ahead of time, I am I'm glad that the kids are able to come to school here. Uh, I had kids up north myself at one time. So I do have a couple of questions. One about is about the building. This is a temporary thing that you're gonna use it for children going to school. Uh, actually, it's two parts. Number one, does it stay empty when the children are not there? And number two, uh, once the temporary part is over and there's another place for these children to go, do we have like guarantees that if they will keep the building and make it commercial and it cannot be sold for like, because it's a 10 bedroom home, like for the purposes of like a treatment center or out of the home or out of the cold shelter or something like that? So I think the first question is for Mr. Hoff. Yeah. So we bring students down. <clears throat> we don't have it used in terms of space during that off. Kids are not there. Our primary focus is to have this as a residence for students to come in and have that space in the wraparound services. Um, we don't intend to kind of go ahead and rent it out in the summertime or sell it and have that different use used by whatever kind of thing, right? This is strictly a, a hot commodity because, you know, like, uh, the planner said, Commercial gives a lot more flexibility, but to be honest, we're kind of very handcuffed of our options of how to fix and resolve a problem in a very short period of time. And this was our best solution. The last thing I wanted to do in all honesty was to kick out our staff and I got a lot of feedback on that. And I'm not so positive level about that too for a bunch of various reasons, so. Okay. Um, and my second question, I guess, is to the council itself. Um, this is a very, very busy lane and nobody, nobody has, Everybody here has to have their driveway on the lane. 
There's nobody has entrance from the street except maybe one home. Uh, there's always vehicles coming and going because there's a lot of apartment buildings on the street now as well. And both entrances, they fixed one a couple years ago and made it worse somehow. It's really difficult to get in off that street if you have a small vehicle without scraping. And then the entrance right beside where the school would be, the kids would be going to school is kind of uphill. And the in the wintertime, it's hard to see up to get up onto that street because they do not keep the, uh, the uh, snow banks down. So it's really a difficult, like a lot of people who worked there before, I know they just drive up through the whole way instead of going up onto that street because it's really hard to get out there. So, um, and I don't know what the answer is, but you're going to have an awful lot of traffic on the street. There's a brand new fourplex right next door to me, and that'll bring at least probably four extra vehicles in as well. So, uh, Mr. Finney, you're you're commenting on the condition of the lane. Uh, exactly. If, yeah. Uh, as, as opposed to, uh, I, are you suggesting that this development will bring more traffic or, or just that the, overall the changes? Well, it, I think having any more people on here will bring more traffic and I, whatever you could do. I mean, and think of other kids. I'm sure you'll have big vans and stuff there. It, if it's easier to get in and off of this this lane, I think it would be beneficial to them as well as everybody else on the street. Okay, um, CAO, do you have any comments on the, the um, you may, I don't think you're prepared to talk about the condition of the lane or any comments? Uh, not at this time, Your Worship. I, if um, um, our public works director wants to comment on that, it's up to him. Was he on, is he online here? Yes, he is. Okay, uh, Public Works, uh, are you there? I don't see your name here, but. Uh... Uh, so you Mayor Lawrence, can you oh, hear me? You. I can, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not, wasn't really prepared to, to answer a question in regards to a lane, but a lane is a lane, um, six meter allowance. Uh, this one, I agree, is somewhat difficult in terms of the approach to the west, uh, fairly steep incline and uh, 7th Avenue is fairly wide, so the snow plowing activities in the winter probably do create uh, significant banks that at times probably are in place and could pose a sight line impedance for vehicles entering and exiting the street. Uh, I mean, and then in terms of the, the eastern entrance, we did repair the sidewalk there. That was what the repair Mr. Finney was referring to, and uh, the, the slope of the sidewalk was set uh, to to the maximum slope that could be obtained that is allowable for a sidewalk. So, and it still provides a little bit of a hindrance. I agree in terms of the inclination of the lane versus the sidewalk. So it's difficult. It's, it's typical of all lanes and uh, it's just, there's, there's really nothing we can do here with it. It is what it is. And does it accommodate uh, the, the traffic in the area? It does, but it, are there issues? Probably, but um, with caution and due diligence, I think, uh, it can accommodate what's uh, being presented here. Perhaps uh, we could just ask staff uh, to to uh, through through UCAO to have have another have a look a good look at the lane and see if there's anything uh, that can be done to improve it. And then if it, if budget is required, come back to council. Yes, we'll take that at a, under direction. Mr. Feeney, anything else? No, I just was going to. There's a lot of like we're right by. Fresh market, so a lot of people use our lane as kind of a, you know, a thoroughfare. I guess you would say to go to fresh market. So there's a lot of foot traffic here. So, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure that the children will be, you know, um, they'll be well supervised so that they don't, you know, because there are other people hanging around here too. Sometimes the park is right over there behind the church as well. So so that uh, um, just to be aware that there's a lot of traffic here for you know when the kids are around it there's going to be a lot of people around that's all thank you we'll go to our next uh, member of the public i believe it's uh Helen Kirk, Russell Yuko. hello it's russell russell um, thank you okay um i guess i'm the most affected here because um my house is just um, behind i mean yeah, 
just right in front of that building that you guys are um, building right now or renovating because the proposal before that I read is about this is just an office renovation and yes I understand I hear all this um, the pandemic that's going on in the school and um, the proposal now and having the 11, 11 boarding for students so um, will there be a staff in the building or is this is just strictly for students? Mr. Hoff? 24 hour supervision at all times. So 11 students plus two staff or one staff? No, what it is is 10 students plus a supervisory suite. And then within that, there's two by two full-time staff in the evenings, weekends, nights, that kind of thing, or not nights, but evening weekends. And then we also have a variety of other staff, multi-purpose workers, well-being workers, counselors, education, all kinds of stuff. We have a, a variety of staff. So you're gonna see foot traffic by the positive nature in terms of support to the kids. It's not the case of, um, you know, kids being left alone to their own devices and 10 of them into a house, you know, who in the right mind would let, leave 10 potentially boys in a house by himself, you know, we're not that crazy, you know. <laughs> Trusting. But 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 we love them a lot and we do our best and, and I can reassure you that you know the traffic you see now wouldn't be any different. It's just gonna be a bit younger traffic versus older staff kind of thing. And we've had tremendous success with the kids, but also there is no traffic in terms of police, ambulance stuff, right? You know, we, we do our best and, and ultimately at the end of the day, to be honest, I am the one ultimately responsible for all these kids when they come down. For lack of a better word, these kids are transferred to me. So when something horrible goes wrong, bad or good, right? Good is that's a representation of all the staff. Bad becomes my problem and I have to deal with it. And to be honest, I own it. So their guardianship is me at the end of the day, in addition to all my other duties at the same time too. So believe me, I am truly invested in these kids, have been, and I will continue to do so. Thank you. I'm also invested with my children too, because like Joyce Tim Thompson said earlier, the sense of community because of the students going on and off here and having um, this our apartment area. So really you don't have a sense of neighborhood and having residential home next to you or, you know, boarding, there will be a lot of um, in and out within the next, I don't, I'm hoping that this is a temporary and it will go back to commercial use after because, you know, the, the COVID. That's my opinion about this. No, I, I understood at the same time too, you know, um, I think at the end of the day, you know, we can work together in terms of supporting our neighbors, right? And in the case of you, I know you have a nice big driveway and I got potentially 10 shovelers ready to roll kind of thing, you know, and to be honest, that's what it's all about it, is working together and supporting one another, right? Um, nothing, nothing better than having 10 young men, grown, grown men, working together to try and support, take care of the neighbors. And you know what? I don't think it's going to be the situation where you think it is in terms of it's going to be more of a very positive one. These kids are great. You know, these are all warrior hockey players. These are all kids with different arts and talents and skills. And you know what? They just want a chance to try and just find a home. And we do a great job. And we look forward to working with neighbors such as yourself and, and growing together, to be honest. In, in addition, I am hoping that this won't be sold to, like Alan Finney is saying, that not for residential treatment down the road, because this is now having 11 bedrooms, so you have the, you know, that will open up for you guys to turn that into a treatment home. Yeah, we have no interest in a treatment home. This is student residence, and again, if you as a council and everyone else wants to turn us back to commercial, so be it. I'll be honest with you. The flexibility of commercial space in the future and transfer back gives honestly more options for me at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, we're not here to go ahead and sell it and have a potential situation where it makes it very really awkward for you guys going forward, not just you as a neighbor, but also the council too. So we're not in the business of, um, I'll use the word politely, screwing each other over kind of thing. We're here to work together. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, were there any other members of the public? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I believe that uh, those are the only two members of the public who requested to, to participate in the meeting in this fashion. Thank you. 
then we'll move along to uh, conclusion and closing of public meeting. And Mr. Clark, you may do your thing. Thank you. Certainly, through you, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, this concludes the public meeting regarding zoning bylaw amendment number Z04-2020. If any member of the public wishes to be notified of the decision of council in respect of the application, you must make written requests to the manager of development services. Notice to appeal the decision of council to the local planning appeal tribunal must be filed with the manager of development services no later than 20 days from the date the notice of decision is circulated. The notice of appeal shall uh, be sent to the attention of the manager of development services and it must include the following information. The reasons for the appeal and the fee as prescribed by the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal Act in the amount of $1,100 payable by certified check to the Minister of Finance, Province of Ontario. Only individuals, corporations, or public bodies may appeal the decision of counsel to the Local Planning uh, Appeal Tribunal. Uh, an appeal may not be filed by an unincorporated association or group. A notice of appeal may be filed in the name of an individual uh, who is a member of the association or group. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Clerk, I believe I'm going to go to option one here and uh, put this on the table. Mm -hmm. The council receives the planning consultant's report dated August 19, 2020 and authorizes the passing of bylaw number 69-20, being a bylaw to amend the municipality to look out comprehensive zoning bylaw 85-18 as amended. Uh, moved by Councillor Bath, seconded by Councillor Fenlon. Council discussion. I'll start with uh, Councillor Timpson. Yeah, could you read the bylaw again? This is essentially to support the uh, proposal. Yes, option one in the in your agenda. You, you'd like it read again? Councillor Timpson, I, I can't hear you, sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, the council receives the planning consultant's report dated August 19, 2020, and authorizes the passing of bylaw number 69-20, being a bylaw to amend the municipality's Sulaco comprehensive zoning bylaw 85-18. Okay, so is there anything in there about the time, the time period or the um, temporary versus the exception? Is there anything in there? Uh, could I ask your staff, uh, either Jody or Jamie to comment? Or Mr. Clerk? Yep, I can, it's Jamie, Jamie here. I can comment two things. There is a piece in here about the temporary nature of the, uh, the, the trailer on the site and then just about a couple other comments that were provided were concerns related to uh, potential future uses of being a group home or a treatment center. Um, the bylaw does specifically detail that uh, crisis centers and group homes are not permitted on the property within within that zoning. So any future use of that nature would, would require a zoning bylaw amendment and, and further public consultation. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Bath. Yeah, I have no further comments. Councillor Fanlin. No comment on. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I, I still think this needs to be uh, in line with the other one that we just went through and I think it should be into a temporary use. I, I think that's, we, we need to set that this is basically due to COVID that that IFNA has been put into this situation and this needs to be I think a temporary use and that's my take on it. Councillor Lego. I agree with Councillor Cassidy on the temporary use because um, I don't know how we would prevent IFNA down the road from selling it and someone using it as an apartment or I, 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 whether that can happen or not, but maybe Jamie can answer that. Jamie? Yep. Um, 
So in terms of future uses, any use not permitted by this site specific zoning amendment would require another zoning bylaw amendment. And with that would come another public meeting and opportunity for public consultation and review by council. And also obviously by planning staff at that time. So um, I think council and residents can be rest assured that this zoning amendment is uh, to, to specify that the specific uses on the site in addition to those of the R2 zone. So, um, any other use requires further consultation. Okay. Um, I also agree with what the mayor said earlier about that there, there is a big, there is a difference between what has been proposed in the past with eight separate doors going into eight separate or seven separate different apartments. Um, this is a communal living space, uh, just with separate rooms. Uh, there's well, probably two doors uh, coming in and out of the house. So um, if we have have no concerns or our, our um, bylaw, Jamie doesn't have any concerns that down the road it can be flipped over without more public consultation, then I, I, I would accept what's uh, being put on the table. All right, Council, I think everybody's had had their go at this. Uh, Councillor um, Cassidy, comment? Yeah, just with regards to what Jamie just said, Jamie, so I guess essentially, like, don't get me wrong, Matt, I, I believe wholeheartedly you guys are invested in this, I, I do. If this was sold privately, per se, to someone else, could they put 11 anyone in there? They're, like anyone like because you said we can't people zone so if this was told sold to someone else could they put 11 just anyone in there or or, or how, like how do we hold something to students or bedrooms like could they just rent out per room so you could have 11 just any people working people in there renting out rooms in a communal living space i think that, uh, that, that yeah thank you jamie i think that's for you not for mr hoff yeah Yep, so through your worship to the councillor, um, what the, it, it would become an enforcement issue at that time if someone decided to rent out to just members of the community. Um, what the bylaw states is that uh, it specifically refers to student accommodations and that, that this zoning would permit student accommodations. And then it defines what a student accommodations for this specific instance include. Um, so if the people aren't attending school or aren't, att aren't attending an institution or an educational institution, that use would not be allowed and it would become an enforcement issue and the, the municipality would have to enforce those, um, the bylaw in that regard. So yes, we would, we, the, the bylaw as constructed has the ability or does specifically state that it's for a maximum of 11 bedrooms and it's for student accommodations. Okay, so help me help me understand when we say we can't people zone, but we're putting students like we're defining a student within a bylaw. It, it, I'm just trying to I'm wrestling with the difference. Yep. So through your worship, I would equate it. It's no different than let's say a dormitory type use in a in a university or a college or even an off campus dormitory type use. Um, there, there are the, through zoning, we can specifically identify students as, I'll say, a segment of the population. Just because it's a student, there's no definition of how old a student can be, age, um, those sorts of things. So there's no determining factor in that, but it relates to why they're there and uh, that they're there for educational purposes. So I hope that provides a little bit of a distinction between what um, um, but I hope that answers your question. I got you. Thank you. Anything further, Council? Seeing no hands raised, then I will call the vote on the uh, the motion. All in favor? I'm sorry. Uh, all in favor again? Raise your hands. I can count one, two, three. Four carried.
Thank you. Five carried. Thank you. We're moving on to item 4.3, uh, quirk. Zoning bylaw amendment file. And Mr. Hopp and Dr. Douglas, uh, thank you very much. Um, you're welcome to, to stay. It's it's an open uh, open meeting, but um, you're welcome to leave. And thank you for your presentations. If you have any questions or need follow up tomorrow, uh, you can contact staff. Um, clerk, you. Uh, uh, through Mayor Lawrence, uh, any follow up would be with the uh, the development services manager, uh, Mr. Brinkman. And you're there. Good. All right, uh, Mr. Hop, Dr. Douglas, thank you. Um, zoning bylaw and amendment. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, Mayor Lawrence. I just wanted to, uh, for the record, to indicate that uh, Councillor Howie has uh, joined the meeting now. He had declared interest in those two items, so he is now uh, uh, on on the line and participating in the meeting. Thank you. Zoning bylaw amendment file number Z05 2022 Hoey Drive. Applicants Matthew Cullum and Beth Dasno. Introduction and overview. This public meeting is being held pursuant to section 34 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990, to consider a zoning bylaw amendment. The purpose of zoning bylaw amendment number Z05 2020 is to rezone the subject property from the residential type one zone to the residential one exception three zone to permit a secondary dwelling in an existing accessory building on the subject property. The manager of development services will confirm how notice was served to advertise this public meeting. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, notice was served through advertisements in the local newspaper, mail out sent to neighboring properties within 120 meters of the subject site and a sign posted on site. Thank you. The manager of development services will provide a summary of the application. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, a zoning bylaw application has been submitted by Matthew Cullum and Beth Dasno to rezone the subject property from residential type one zone to the residential type one exception three zone to permit a secondary dwelling in an accessory building on the subject property. The subject property is currently developed with a two story single detached dwelling and a one and a half story detached, detached garage. Immediate surrounding land uses include other shoreline residential properties. The subject property is located within the urban Sulacote settlement area and is designated residential in the official plan. The subject property has a lot area of 2,327 square meters and a lot frontage of 38, 38 meters. Uh, the applicant is proposing <clears throat> a secondary dwelling unit in the upper half story of the existing accessory building. A secondary dwelling unit within an accessory building is not permitted, is not a permitted use in the R1 zone as noted in section 4.29 of the zoning bylaw. And therefore a rezoning application is required. The existing two-story single detached dwelling has a gross floor area of 230 square meters and a height of 9.75 meters. The existing accessory building has a first floor area of 48 square meters and a second store story floor area of 29 square meters where the secondary dwelling unit is proposed. There's also an existing deck located on the upper story of the accessory uh, building. The proposed secondary dwelling unit is to be connected to municipal water and sewage supply and will contain one bedroom. Following a review of the proposed application, it is our opinion that while the application is consistent with the relevant, it is our, uh, that while, sorry, consistent with the relevant provincial and municipal policies, it is recommended that the application be approved and a maximum size of 30 square meters be applied to the proposed secondary dwelling unit within the accessory building. Thank you. Correspondence from government agencies. Uh, three minutes, we had one comment from our public works manager, Andrew Jewell. Uh, my first concern would be parking for the rental unit as there appears to be a secondary entrance that may or may not be an approved secondary entrance to the property, fronting the accessory building. And if this location was utilized for parking for the rental unit, the vehicle would be essentially parked on the municipal right away. Can you please have the developer include the additional parking location for the proposed rental unit in correlation to utilizing the existing primary entrance as parking may be somewhat restricted by the proposed location 
for the water and sewer service extension to the accessory building, assuming that the developer would not want to park slash drive on top of the service extensions to mitigate potential freezing. My second concern is the water connection coming from the main residence on the property to supply water to the proposed rental unit. In my opinion, this would be no different than a temporary house to house water connection that is sometimes utilized to provide water from one residence to another under extenuating circumstances. Frozen water, oh, bracket, frozen water service in the winter that cannot be thawed, for which the situation requires a backflow prevention device from the supply residence to the receiving residence, and the receiving residence is placed on a boil water advisory. I therefore think that comments should be obtained from the Northwest Health Unit, as well as the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, Drinking Water and Environmental Compliance Division regarding the house to house water connection. So just to speak to that, we did reach out to the Northwest Health Unit and Mike Mackey from the Northwest Health Unit provided this response. And to speak to the Ontario Building Code does permit uh, services to be tied into an ancillary building on the same property as the primary residence. Um, so it's permitted by the building code and the discussions with Mike Mackey. Uh, he says, as discussed yesterday, the idea of requiring a backflow preventer and requiring a good water sample results for the new hookup location, I feel is a good requirement. I agree that this is different than a temporary load connection, but I think the same safety precautions are warranted. Thank you. Mem uh, applicant, uh, sorry, uh, correspondence from members of the public. Uh, three Mayor Lawrence, there were no correspondence. There was none, no correspondence from the public. Thank you. Uh, the applicant or our representative is invited to speak to the application. I, I see Mr. Cullum there. Do you wish to speak? Um, sure. Um, you guys can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, there's not, not much to say besides, I mean, if there is a, a driveway issue, um, we can we can kind of work with uh, with public works to determine the, a solution to that. Um, the, exit, the driveway that does access, <clears throat> sorry, the back of the garage um, did have a permit pulled when we did the, uh, when we built the house five years ago. So we did have a permit for that that access, um, but it would be um, it would be within the uh, municipal right of way, depending on where that person parked their vehicle. Um, but we could we could add an additional space on our existing driveway if necessary. Um, and the water and sewer servicing wouldn't cross either of the driveways if it was connected to the house anyway. So that I don't think there's a freezing issue there. Um, and it would be insulated and heat traced, uh, just as our main service is from the from the road. <clears throat> and uh, other than that, I don't I don't really have any other comments or, or anything. Um, but if anyone has any questions about access or anything like that, you know, you can you can ask for sure. Thank you. We'll go to uh, questions from members of uh, council, and I'll start with uh, Councillor uh, uh, Timpson. Yeah, um, uh, I just was wondering about the, uh, the structure of the garage there, Matt. Um, just from the picture, it didn't look hardy, but I know that you built it, and I'm sure it's very hardy. But can you comment on the, uh, the structure? Can you, you know, the can it can it hold an apartment? <laughs> I guess that's my that's my question. If can a garage hold an apartment? Can you? If you um... I mean, it, it was constructed to the building code. The trusses that were installed were an attic and truss uh, design that uh, were actually engineered for um, having solar panels. So they had some additional engineering. Um, and to my understanding, were um, built with a higher uh, load value on them. Um, it's just, uh, to me, it seems like it's you know very similar to the second story of a house, so I don't know how that would be any different. Councillor Timpson, if I may, perhaps uh, the 
development services manager, who's also our chief building official, might might be able to comment. Sure, uh, through you, Mayor Large. Yeah, the the trust is a ruminatic trust, and Matt is correct in that the the trust design was beefed up to support the uh, the solar panels as well. The the four of these ruminatic trusses are rated for fifty pounds per square foot, which is the same rating for a residential floor system in the code. So. From a building code standpoint, as long as he has a window in the bedroom and a window in the living space, which according to his design, he does, uh, and direct access to the exterior, which he will with the direct access to the balcony, uh, you know, he still has to go through a building permit process and meet all the requirements of the code. But yeah, so far structurally, it, it sh it, there's no issues. Councillor Timpson. Do that to say. Uh, well, actually, just a technical question there. Um, the so the trusses will hold the uh, solar panels as well as the uh, resident. I mean, it's they'll hold lots. Is really what you're saying? Uh, three Mary Lawrence. Yeah. So the the truss is designed for use within the truss itself. In essence, it's basically. The truss is designed in a way so it has a large open area within the truss, where a typical truss has web work through it, so you can't utilize the space. It's just, in essence, empty airspace above your insulation level. So this would be, this is basically a room within the attic. And how 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 will a, a, a facility like this be heated, Matt? And will it be? Oh warm enough in the winter, given that it's, you know, above ground? Well, um, I mean, currently the, the building is insulated and heated. Um, at this point, I just heat it with a construction heater, a um, 30 amp breaker. Um, I am considering, depending on cost, I mean, I have a baseboard electric heater upstairs at the, at the current time with a thermostat on it. So currently it's maintaining you know, the temperature that would be required for living space. And I, th I think that would probably be addressed in the building permit process. You know, um, most, of these, most of these questions, Councillor Timpson, are part of the building permit process that the develop our staff would be uh, assuring us through their involvement that the building code is met. Yeah, three May Lawrence, there's certain insulation levels that you would have to meet and these, the trusses have the space to accommodate that, so. All right, um, Councillor Howie. I mean, I, I don't have any questions. I, I think approving this is a no brainer. We see similar units um, on that road and in that neighborhood. Um, I, I trust that, you know, Matt has, has gone and, and taken the proper consideration in his plan and developing this uh, before sending it for our approval. So I, I'm in full support of this um, this rezoning. Thank you, Councillor Fallon. Uh, I have no comment on it. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think this is this is uh, it works. It's obviously I think when Matt built this garage, this was somewhat of his intention going forward, seeing as how he, he designed the trusses around this. Um, I think it's good and, and it's willingness to just address maybe some of the public works managers questions or concerns and and going forward I think I think that's fine I have no objections to this thank you councillor Lego yeah again if this is one of the no-brainer um, all of the concerns from public uh, works and uh, health department and about the parking can be addressed to the site plan agreement and Jody will take care of that so I'm quite sure of Oh. Um, is there sorry, uh, Jody? Is there a site plan agreement required for this, or how does that work? Just the building current site plan. There, this wouldn't apply for site plan control, but definitely based on the public works comments, we will ensure we kind of meet his, you know, try to, yeah, alleviate his concerns regarding the park. Very good. Thank you. So I think we'll move on to. Uh, Mr. Clerk, you're there. I'm losing sight. The, the screens move around. Um, yes, I'm people here. Come and go. Your, your face is moving. It's like a, a checkerboard. <laughs> um, 
other, were there any uh, questions? We have to go through the questions from the members of the public, read that through. Uh, yes, uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, Mayor Lawrence, uh, there will not be any further opportunity for the public. Uh, the public had to, uh, to contact us in advance, so uh, there is no further opportunity for public input at this time. Do I need to read this, uh, this, these paragraphs? No. Thank you. Uh, could you proceed with the conclusion and closing of the public meeting, Mr. Clerk? Thank you. Uh, thank you through you, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, this concludes the public uh, meeting regarding zoning bylaw amendment number Z05-2020. If any member of the public wishes to be notified of the decision of council in respect of the application, you must make a written request to the manager of development services. Notice to appeal the decision of council to the local planning appeal tribunal must be filed with the manager of development services no later than 20 days from the date that the notice of decision is circulated. The notice of appeal shall be sent to the attention of the manager of development services and it must include the following information. The reasons for the appeal and the fee as prescribed under the Local Planning uh, Appeal Tribunal Act in the amount of $1,100 payable by certified check to the Minister of Finance, Province of Ontario. Only individuals, corporations, or public bodies may appeal the decision of council to the Local Planning um, Appeal Tribunal. Uh, an appeal may not uh, be filed by an unincorporated association or group. A notice of appeal may be filed in the name of an individual uh, who is a member of the association or group. Thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead with reading the motion option one. The council receives the planning consultant's report dated August 19, 2020, and authorizes the passing of bylaw number 68 20, being a bylaw to amend the municipality of Silicote comprehensive zoning bylaw 85 18 as amended. Moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Howie. Any final discussion, Council? I don't believe so. So, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Confirmatory bylaw number 71-20 to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Municipality of Silicote, August 19, 2020 statutory public meeting. Be read a first, second, third time and passed. Moved by Councillor Howley, seconded by Councillor Timpson. All in favor? Carried. Motion to adjourn the public meeting of August 19, 2020 at 7 39 p.m. Moved by Councillor Fenlon, seconded by Councillor Bath. All in favor? Carried. Mr. Clerk, um, is there anything we need to do now to move to the regular meeting? Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, no, we can uh, we can move to the regular meeting. Um, you may wish to, um, uh, to take a short uh, health break in between the two meetings, uh, but that's entirely your call. We are taking a five minute break with great excuses to those who have been waiting to, to appear. We are taking a five minute break and we'll, we'll commence at uh, 745. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, uh, Jamie.
I see pictures begin to fill in on the screen here. It looks like we have uh, quorum back. So I will call the uh, the regular council meeting to August nineteenth, twenty twenty, to order at uh, seven forty seven p.m. Uh, introduction of amendments to the agenda. Mr. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, Council may wish to add uh, the items from the uh, public, uh, the statutory public meeting. Um, if so, uh, there will be six additions to the agenda. Um, uh, items number um, 7.9, which will be zoning bylaw amendment number Z03-2020. Uh, that's the one respecting the IFNA application for 19 uh, Bernier Way. Yes, the, so, uh, carry on, give, give the list, I, I believe. Okay, the, the, the next item is uh, item uh, 7.10, uh, which will be uh, zoning bylaw amendment application number Z04-2020, IFNA for 98 King Street. And the third uh, addition to the uh, to the that part of the agenda will be item seven point eleven, zoning bylaw amendment num uh, application number Z05 2020 uh, for two Hoey Drive, Matt Cullum and Beth Dasno. And then additionally, uh, under uh, section ten under bylaws, uh, bylaw uh, numbers. Uh, uh, 6720, 6820, and 6920 would be added. Thank you. Any further amendments? Through you, Mayor Lawrence, I have none. Thank you. Uh, a motion to confirm the agenda as amended for the regular council meeting of August 19th. Uh, moved by Councillor Howie, seconded by Councillor Timpson. All in favor? Garyed, declarations of pecuniary interest. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, we have uh, two declarations from Councillor Howie, and that will be respecting items 7.9 and 7.10, uh, as Councillor Howie is uh, an employee of the Independent First Nations Alliance. Thank you. Adoption of minutes, uh, motion to adopt the minutes of the July 15th, 2020 regular council meeting. Moved by Councillor Bath, seconded by Councillor Fenlon. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Determination of items requiring separate discussion. Staff report 7.1, transition the blue box recycling program to full producer responsibility. This is really just confirmation of a, of a date that uh, we must, must submit. Good. 7.2, residential blue box bin and receptacle, receptacle car cost subsidizing. Is that it? Do I see a hand up? Councillor Lego, sorry, your hand's not in the screen. <laughs> Thank you, gotcha. Wastewater dumping station. Councillor Lego. Bigwood Lake service extension. Councillor Timpson, Councillor. FCM municipal asset management program. Seven point six. Boards, commissions, committees. Options for meetings for fall twenty twenty. Councillor Timpson. September September regular council meeting in Hudson. You're scratching your back, I think, Councillor Timpson. Sorry, <laughs> that wasn't a hand raise, was it? No. Thank you. Um, 
Municipal Health and Safety Policy, COVID-19 Reopening Municipal Workplace Safety. Thank you. And we do oh seven, so then the new ones, uh, I don't think we, 7.9, 7.10, 7.11 are the, the bylaws. And I'm, I don't think we need to lift them. We've just discussed them for several hours. So I'm assuming the council is good with not lifting 7, 9, 7, 10, 7, 11. They'll be part of the consent agenda. Good, thank you. So what I have is we have lifted item 7.2, 7.3, 7.4 and 7.6. So a motion to adopt the items not requiring separate discussion. Item 7.1, item 7.5, item 7.7, .7, and item 7.8, 7.9, 7.10, .7 and 7.11. Moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Lego. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Finally, we can get to the delegations. Is that correct, Mr. Kirk? Good. Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, yes, absolutely. And the delegations are here, and I apologize uh, to uh, to Marilyn and Dr. Kitt for keeping you waiting so long. Are you still with us? Marilyn, welcome. And Dr. Kitt? May appear, but Marilyn is here, and we'll, can we proceed to, with you, Marilyn? Marilyn Herb as the CEO from the Northwestern Health Unit. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Sorry about that. Thank you, Dr. Kit, and Dr. Kit Young Hun, Chief Medical Officer of Health from the Northwestern Health Unit. A presentation on COVID-19 and other health unit updates. So the table is yours, uh, whichever one is taking the lead here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Lawrence. Um, and thank you for having us here today. Um, I'm wondering if it would be possible for uh, me to share my screen. Yes. Thank you. Let's make sure I share the right screen. Um, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Okay, great. So I thought because you all live in Sulacau and we're all up in the north, I'd put like a really nice sunset there to get it started. Is that uh, snow on the, on the horizon? Yeah, so it, it's not a summer picture. It was <laughs> the sunset I was going for because um, the, the north reminds me of that. So um just to get us going so um you're gonna have to just bear with me a second because something's going on here my screen there we go so here's our agenda for tonight and we're going to do um an update on COVID-19 we're going to talk about some of the programs that we deliver for the Northwestern Health Unit in Sulacout and we're going to talk a little, a little bit about our Sulacout office, as well as um, public health modernization and what we're thinking is uh, potentially to happen with that coming forward. So I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Dr. Kit Young-Hoon, who's going to talk about the COVID update. And then I will speak to the programs delivered in Sulacout, the Sulacout office plan, and then I'll turn it back to Dr. Kit. So um, hopefully this will go smoothly. Um, and Kit, please get started. And if you can ask me when you want to change the slide, I'll be able to do that for you. Thanks a lot, Marilyn. Hello, everyone. 
Um, I know the attendance from Sulacau um, Council is pretty good at our um, uh, municipal teleconference. So I think most of this you would know already, but I'll, but I'll just, you know, it's just a bit of a summary on what's happening with COVID. So we are at 44 cases across Northwestern Health Units. Um, and then when I developed this presentation, which was a couple of days ago, it's 18,788 negative test results. So you can see a, the, a very low risk, low positivity rate. Um, and just how our cases are distributed across the region, it, it suggests that there is no um, ongoing community transmission, that these are just a, an occasional case being brought in um, from outside the region. Um, so we have um, the other Northern Health units are somewhat similar. They're, we are seeing a small number of cases generally now in North, the rest of Northern Ontario, so that's Sudbury North. Um, and for the entire province, there's only about 100 cases a day, which is much which is um, much lower than in the past and shows generally just as, and so for overall there's a small number of cases across the entire province. Um, so suggesting a low risk for the all of Ontario. Uh, Manitoba, we are seeing an increasing number of cases. So they're, they're getting about 20 to 40 cases a day now in, across Manitoba. But again, when you think about 20 to 40 cases across that large population, it's still considered low risk. And many of these cases are associated with um, a cluster of cases in uh, in the Prairie region, which is the, the area west of Winnipeg. Um, so overall for Ontario, we're in stage three of reopening, which is great and definitely where we want to stay. Next slide. Um, so the mandatory mask policy has come into effect as of August 17th. So that's past, the past Monday. Um, and that's right now, our web page is up to date with all the necessary information. So it has the actual letter of instruction, um, sample policies, signage, and frequently asked questions for both the public and businesses. Uh, we've been getting a fair number of questions through our hotline and through Talk, Talk Public Health. So we've been responding to those. And you can imagine that the response is fairly varied, but for the most part, people are supportive and appreciative of this extra um, measure of safety for preventing COVID-19. Next slide. Oh, geez. Um, I'm just trying to, I have to look at my notes for this one. Um, so overall statistics in Northwestern Health Units, public communications indicate a strong presence um, related to COVID-19 in both regular and social media. So we've had good coverage in local and regional newspapers um, and, and online news, news reports. We've had a broad reach on Facebook with 3,000 new followers um, and our public question and answer sessions that were started with Dr. Gemmel have had a total of 13,000 views. Uh, this particular graph shows website views are in the hundreds of thousands and the hotline has answered a total of over 7,000 calls since it started. And of those 7,000 calls, over 600 are from Sioux Lookout. So really lots and lots of public communication. Um, in addition to the public communication, we do um, a fair bit of stakeholder communication. So we, there are weekly meetings with health sector partners. So that includes primary care, hospitals, um, long-term care homes, and uh, social service boards. We also have weekly meetings with um, those leading the front line. So physicians, nurse practitioners, and other primary care providers. And then we meet with municipalities every two weeks. Um, in addition to these sort of regional meetings, we also have local meetings and local committees. So um, we sit out there a number of um, of these committees in every major community um, or in every health hub, there's, a, there's committees formed, which we participate in. It's either myself, or one of the managers, or one of the staff, and they, they are a variety of different types of committees. It depends on um, how the, the community wanted to come together to address COVID-19. But generally, there's at least one health-focused committee and, and um, one social service committee, and sometimes those are combined. Um, we have case information that's updated regularly on our website. And I know that's been, um, that's been under a lot of scrutiny. That, that particular meme refers to that. Often people want case information yesterday, but it, it does take a while for us to um, make sure to verify some of the information. Often we don't want to put case information out there before we verify that it's true. So that's, um, that's, that's uh, something that we update regularly. And as soon as we can, recognizing that people want this information right away, but almost always we, we always get at least, you know, some feedback saying that people would have liked it sooner. <laughs> so that's, I feel like that's, that's sort of the nature of COVID-19. And it is a new world. It, it's sort of interesting. In the past, we've never communicated individual case information unless there was some particular public health risk. Um, when we think about all our other 
you know, 50 infectious diseases that we have to follow up on, we, we don't talk about every single case as it comes up. So this is, this is a new world when it comes to COVID-19. Um, upcoming communication in the near future would be focused on mask policy, symptoms, schools, and the use of gloves. I'm going to hand it over to Marilyn now. Thank you, Kat. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yeah, we can. Okay, great. So the Northwestern Health Unit works in Sulacout, and uh, a lot of the work that we do, or the work that we do, is outlined in the Ontario Public Health Standards. When we submit our budgets, we outline each program, each standard, we identify the community needs and the priorities, our partners and stakeholders, and what program objectives and interventions we are going to meet and what our indicators of success are. The Northwestern Health Unit works in a decentralized model, as you are aware, and we provide programs in each of our 19 communities, and we currently have 13 offices. In Sulacout, we have 11.5 full-time equivalent positions. So you can see in this, this chart that we have here that we, deliver, that we deliver programming in schools and with school partners. We deliver programs in the community and with our community partners. We work with municipal partners, other partners and our stakeholders. We also have um, various programs in each of these different um, in each of these different circles. So if you think of school services, some of the programs that we offer are oral health services, which is screening, preventive, preventative services, education, and we do that as well in Sulacout as well as in your surrounding communities. We offer in school sexual health and harm reduction, where we provide sexual health services in high schools, which would be presentations on sexual health and those kind of things. For our chronic disease prevention, we work on nutrition and food liter literature programming. We provide food security to, to our schools. We provide drug, alcohol, and tobacco education. We participate in the youth mental health fair. We have a welcome to kindergarten program, injury prevention activities, and we provide school councils with support. In schools, we also have our control of infectious disease. So regular communications to support the exclusion of ill children, reporting requirements, patient or parent education. And then we have our vaccine preventable disease program, which is school immunization and clinics. And we are prepared to respond to outbreaks uh, when there is vaccine preventable diseases. We also have in our environmental health program within schools, food safety inspection and food safety um, training, as well as Smoke Free Ontario. Within the community circle, we provide oral health services such as fluoride varnish treatment on our mobile dental office. We have sexual health and harm reduction programs. And in that we, surprise, we, we support local pride gay straight alliance initiatives. We offer weekly sexual health clinics in the office. Naloxone training and we respond to needle pickup calls and we, sure, we ensure adequate coverage of sharp, sharp containers is available in community. Our chronic disease prevention program offers food skills, physical activity programming, tobacco, cannabis, vaping presentations, mental health activities, and we do extra work around food funding. Our control of infectious diseases supports the community setting for infection control practices in shelters, uh, fellowship centers, um, those, kind of, those kind of areas. Uh, vaccine preventable diseases, we administer vaccines and we prepare to respond to outbreaks within our communities. Our child and reproductive health is Healthy Babies, Healthy Children, and that program screens and risks, uh, does a risk assessment related to the healthy development of children. They take referrals, recommendations, and develop pathways for families. 
Speech language, infant hearing, and blind and low vision is another community program that we offer, and we provide speech and, and language assessments and treat zero to senior kindergarten children. Uh, our environmental health, again, in community, provides food safety inspections, water inspections, private water testing, safe water testing, Part 8 services, smoke-free Ontario, animal bite follow-ups, and health hazard response. With our municipal partners and stakeholders, we provide those same services. And it looks like community, that is in community coalitions related to housing, vulnerable populations, substance use. We're involved in the um, well-being planning with municipalities, support recreation and parks committees, healthy community task force. We support uh, infection control in hospitals and long-term care settings. We distribute vaccine to all healthcare providers in our region. Um, for child and reproductive health, we provide information to support our community partners. We collaborate with partnerships to run family programming and participate in very commun various communities in Sulacout related to health, reproductive health and child health and well being. Uh, speech language, infant hearing, and blind and low vision. We've provided presentations at Confederation College and in service at municipal daycares. So these are some of the things, not all inclusive, but just so that you get a sense of the kind of programming. I actually have a paper that I will share with Michelle and she'll be able to share it with you so you have a little bit more detail rather than just my speaking. Next slide is about, oops, sorry. Next slide is about the Sulacout office. So the Northwestern Health Unit recognizes that Sulacout is a major hub in the North and that it also continues to expand. Currently, we have an office space that is very tight and we have no room to grow. As community needs within Sulacout area increase, we want to be, make sure that the health unit can grow along with the community when we're providing our programming. As such, we're looking to increase our office space. And our manager of IT and operations, Lee Pitt, is working with our landlord to increase the uh, office space that we currently have on Front Street uh, by ad an addition of approximately 920 square feet. So the landlord um, right now is going through all of the um, drawings and stuff. I'm sure that they're going to have to bring something to uh, council to approve, um, approve the the build, and that will be coming your way soon. Um, COVID has presented challenges to our service delivery. That includes the delivery of services within Sulacout. Um, as such, we, um, we are looking to re-engineer re the manner in, manner in which we're delivering our client services so that we can ensure that we are, have uh, safe environments and protection of disease for our staff as well as our clients. To do this, we're looking at reorganizing the space and having access for clients where they would have a direct access into um, a client center where they would be able to collect, uh, get their services that they need. That access would have its own door and a clinical space. We're also looking at piloting a new appointment system and the appointment system will be designed to space out appointments so that our waiting rooms and everything can be manageable as clients are coming in and there's limited crossing of paths. As a part of the Ontario plan for the safe reopening of schools, the Northwestern Health Unit has received notice from the Ministry of Health on August 11th that we are expected to receive one-time funding for additional public health nurse nurses. The priority and the focus will be COVID-19 response with an emphasis on outbreak and case contact management. We're looking to put one of those four positions in our Sulacout office. So that will enhance um, our programming in that office. Kid, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you want to continue and I'll change the slide. Hi, thanks. Thanks everyone. Yep. Thanks Marilyn. Um, 
public health modernization seems like so so long ago, but really it's only uh, eight months ago. Um, so it was in January 2020. Marlon, I don't, I can no longer I'm see the slides. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I yeah. closed it by accident. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. So, but Mia, I can just talk. So, um, so yeah. So the 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 process had been with Jim Pine, and so we had done the verbal consultation, um, and that I think went fairly effectively. Was fairly effective, um, and we were able to give them a true sense of the strengths within Northwestern Health Units and um, and the public health sector here, and and particularly in the north. Um, the as a modernization process was paused, we still were able to send in our written um, submission. So we still sent that in in the spring. Um, and now, um, and we've not had received any feedback, right? So we've not received any individual feed feedback from the province, but definitely there's been indication that they are thinking about um, restarting the public health modernization process or the cons consultation process when COVID-19 is under control. And there's no clear timeline We've not heard any clear timeline on that, if they mean this year or if they're thinking con in control as after the second wave. So I really don't know what that means. Um, without a doubt, COVID-19 has changed the focus of public health. It's, you know, we've had to, as a sector, realign our resources to deal with the COVID-19 crisis, which is reasonable and, and appropriate. Um, but in just, in just thinking through how this could impact public health modernization, it's just recognizing that public health is way more than infectious diseases. And the reason it has it is more than infectious diseases is because in the past, and even right now up, up to this point, um, the, the main driver of things like the main driver of health status, hospitalizations, deaths, mortality, morbidity are, is not infectious diseases. It really is chronic diseases. So we have focused on many other things such as chronic disease prevention, early childhood development, and so on. So recognizing that public health is a broad scope and that broad scope is for a reason. And that's because we're, we're um, responding to the, the population health assessments that we're seeing locally, provincially and nationally. Um, I think moving, next slide, moving forward, really as we approach the modernization process, it's to remember what of the key principles of what makes a strong public health system and what's unique for Northwestern Ontario. Um, I've, I've listed these here. These are all in the, the document that we um, the written document that we submitted, the initial written document that we submitted to the province and that we shared with all the municipalities. Um, so what makes a strong public health system? I think one of the main things is that it's local. It's, a, it's got local connections. It understands the local needs of the community. Um, it, it has people who live locally and therefore can respond to the needs locally and, and really fully understand what our community needs. Um, funding, of course, is a, you know, needs to be appropriate. Um, consistent. It also needs to be evidence-based. Um, I have a, a point there, leverages provincial agencies, and really that's about thinking about agencies like Public Health Ontario, which supports all public health units and is very valued. And so it must be a key player moving forward. Um, strong partnership, safe for pay is really about the municipal um, connection with public health. And again, that's about keeping things local and really addressing local needs and um, maintaining that, that contribution for municipalities. Um, and if, and if I think a strong public health system could be substantially weakened if the transition is not appropriately funded. So if there is talks about measures or making major changes, it needs to be appropriately funded. So those are just some basic principles. Well, however, we move forward. And then a, key, a few key things to remember for Northwestern and Ontario is a decentralized model is important. We don't want, you know, a huge public health organization building that's in just one major city in the north that would be, I think, um, detrimental to public health, how we have it right now. Um, we have a dual leadership model, which works fairly effectively for our organization, and that can be considered moving forward. So uh, having a CEO and a medical officer of health. Um, indigenous engagement and cultural safe, culturally safe services is important. Leveraging di digital technology. And really thinking about risks versus benefits. I think one of the key things had, that had come up was a merger between Thunder Bay District Health Unit and Northwestern Health Unit and recognizing that, that that really doesn't make sense. That perhaps mergers might make sense in other parts of Ontario, but it really doesn't make sense for Northwestern Ontario based on our organizations. And I know Thunder Bay has passed, um, Thunder Bay District Health Unit has passed resolutions expressing concerns with such a merger as well. 
Um, and uh, I'm just thinking also that it costs more up here to provide service um, based on our ge dispersed geography. So just some, just some key principles to remember as we move forward um, in the public health modernization process. Um, otherwise, we've heard very little about what it's going to look like or, or how it's going to turn, what, you know, what sort of direction they're going to turn it into. But I think it's, um, it's always good as we address that, pro that issue is to think about, go back to the basic principles of what's important. Um, that's, that's it from my part. And I, I think that's it for both of our presentations. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll just go to council um, uh, questions. I'll start with uh, Councillor Lego. Um, just, I think the only question I have, um, do we have any idea of percentage of asymptomatic that's out there? Or is that just sort of a shot in the dark guess for COVID? A lot of people um, probably had some mild symptoms but never got tested. And, mm -hmm. and then when did testing actually start? So people back in December, January, February may have had COVID and never got tested, but yep. were sick. So I, I think what you're asking me is, have we, is there anyone who's been missed? I think really, and, and could be missed for a number of reasons. Either they chose not to get tested or they're asymptomatic. Um, so asymptomatics are an interesting one. I think the, the, there is evidence of concerns with asymptomatics. So that's, these are people who've never developed symptoms. Um, and it's still really unclear how much they contribute to the spread of the illness. So that's still a fairly vague. Um, we've, do, we've done lots and lots of testing. Like when you think about it, there's been, I can't remember the number now, I think over 17,000 tests and we have only 44 cases. So I don't think there's a whole lot of hidden asymptomatics in Northwestern Ontario. Um, I think there's been lots of testing happening. Um, I think one thing to remember is that we did not see an impact on our hospitalization rates, our emergency room visits, or our ICU usage. Really, the hospitals were near empty when this occurred, when we were trying to prepare for COVID-19, and they, they were, you know, they were prepared. Everyone was tested that could possibly have had COVID-19 that came into our hospital. So really, if we had gotten hit by COVID-19, we would have seen it in our hospitals at some point and we just we just didn't see it so i really don't think that there's a whole lot of hidden cases um in northwestern ontario based on on some of that all that collective data together okay so my other question would be antibodies is there an, is there an actual test out there that can test for it if you if you've had it and the antibodies that are in you yeah so there is a serology test so that's what it's called and it tests for antibodies it's a blood test um, it's the antibodies generally increase about two weeks after you've gotten the illness and can last for about two to three months. Um, the, the test is not useful in diagnosis of the mm -hmm. patient in the acute setting. So really, it's not the test that we use at all. Um, it's only being considered for very rare um, clinical decisions. So for the most part, there is not a whole lot of serology tests happening. They did do a serology study across Ontario to see the prevalence of infection across the entire province. So they did, I think how it worked is that because um, blood samples were submitted for other reasons, they just randomly chose from those blood samples and got them tested. And generally the prevalence rate was about just over 1%. I think it was like 1.1 to 1.3%, depending on the jurisdiction. In Northern Ontario, the prevalence rate was only about 0.3%. So again, confirming that we really did not get hit by COVID-19 to a substantial level up here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I'm just wondering, going going forward, what what are we going to be looking for with uh, to, to move on from COVID? Like what, what triggers is the health unit going to look for for some of the mask stuff and, and, and going forward like that, um, just with regards to how we proceed <laughs> um you know so okay so I, I i guess a few things to think through on that one is um it's been messaged by the chief medical officer of health of canada that's dr Teresa tam that this could be with us for a couple of years two to three years and we need to be prepared for the long game um so i think a few key things to remember somewhat similar to the previous speakers and the importance of thinking about the the negative effects of public health measures Right, so we know that now that, the, and there is some evidence now that the public me health measures has had a negative impact on um, 
connectivity and some mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. And also there's been um, reports of increased domestic violence rates and so on. So it's really now about moving forward and finding a balance between the public health measures for COVID-19 and then recognizing that the, the negatives that come along with those public health measures. Um, so I think, you know, and then the, there's also the non the non health effects and the negative non health effects like the impact on the economy and so on. Yeah. So I think right now the effort that the main thing that we're focused on is trying to stay in stage three so businesses can stay open schools can stay open the closure of schools has been particularly detrimental in a number of ways to both health and non health issues. Um, and so I'm really trying to to encourage people to maintain those basic principles on physical distancing, hand hygiene, not touching your face, and wearing masks when you're in enclosed indoor spaces. Um, having said that, you know, there, this is not going to be a zero risk um, situation. We will likely see cases and we need to be able to manage them as quickly as we can. So to continue case and contact follow up, which is the main role of public health at this time in managing this emergency. Um, so I, I think that's what the, we're generally focused on. I'm assuming at some point during the winter, like many respiratory illnesses, they get worse. And so we may need to think of the, the government will consider going into stage two. That's a provincial decision. It is not usually decided at locally. Um, so they may go into stage two or back into stage one. Hopefully we can keep that those stages at, at as, as low a level as possible. So I think that's, that's really what we're all trying to do. Um, but I'm not at this time. It's you know, this everyone's just waiting to see because in the end, it's still a new virus and it's still a novel virus. So nobody really fully knows what wave two is going to look like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Fanlon. I'm um, good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bath. I don't have any have any really comments. Just want to you know show show how much we appreciate the uh, work Northwest Health does and keep on supporting them. Councillor Timpson. Yeah, I had a question there. Uh, you said something. Um, eight. I thought at the beginning they said eighteen thousand and such negative tests, and then you mentioned seventy thousand of tests. I'm just wondering were most of these tests sort of routine screening, or were these people that um, maybe had um, a cough or something and then came and voluntarily came in to just to check that they were not symptomatic. Um, I'm just curious about the numbers. If, if you know, is this, is this mass screening or is it people coming in with some sort of symptoms to find out if they've COVID, of which so, 44 were COVID? Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, you're right, um, Joyce, it is just over 18,000. I made a mistake with saying 17,000. Um, it is primarily driven by mask um, testing done at workplaces, essential workplaces. Um, but there is, um, but there, but also a fair bit of symptomatic individuals and so on. So it's, it's a combination of the two, but there is, a, I mean, it's a lot of screening, it's a lot of testing. Um, it, it wouldn't be driven only by people who have symptoms. It, there's a fair bit of just broad testing, particularly of healthcare workers, um, long-term care homes, and then any essential services, other essential services can get tested too. Of the 44, do we know how many were asymptomatic and, and how many required medical attention? Um, I don't know that um, specifically, but I can look it up while um, other questions are coming in, but I, I'm not 100% sure. I'll have to look that up for you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Howie. I don't have any questions. I just wanna thank you uh, for taking the time tonight to uh, give this presentation to us. Thank you. All right, well, Councillor, uh, Dr. Kidd, you could get back to uh, uh, Councillor Timpson if you like on that question. Um, and I should just uh, remind the council, um, I know Councillor Timpson uh, participates as does Michelle and myself when, I, uh, when we can on the, is it the bi-weekly calls uh, with the health unit? The health unit does a special uh, call. I think it's on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock in the morning. Is that about right? Um, and, uh, and it's for municipal councils. So it's uh, Dr. Kitt and Marilyn or one or the other are on online to uh, 
provide an update and to take any questions that anybody on, on any council has. So it's, uh, I think you all get notice of that. So if you want to participate and uh, you can see how, how informative both uh, Marilyn and Kit are, uh, please do if you have questions or send your questions to, to Michelle or myself. Uh, we're trying to participate uh, whenever there are calls. So Marilyn and Kit, again, huge apologies for keeping you waiting so long. It's unpredictable. The statutory public meetings sometimes are just, they're like that. They're un, uh, it can be a little bit unpredictable, but I kept you waiting so long. And we're very appreciative of you coming on and all the work that you and your staff at the health unit uh, are doing. Uh, to protect uh, everybody's health. So thank you very much for, for attending. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having you. us. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right, Council, we'll move on to uh, 8.2. Um, Frank Lopez and, and Richard Jaglowitz, auditors are from Grant Thornton LLP uh, with the Consolidated Audited Financial Statement presentation of the 2019 statements. So uh, I see Richard and I see Frank, uh, the floor is used. And again, you've heard the apologies. That's uh, <laughs> you too, <laughs> we apologize. Yes, yeah, so well, thank you very much. Um, no, that's, that's fine. I understand how these things work. Uh, what, uh, what I'm gonna propose is I, I believe that the, the two documents were circulated uh, ahead of the meeting, the, the report to council and the financial statements. I'm going to ask Richard to, to bring it up and, and share his screen uh, to take you through the report to council first, and then we'll go through the financial statements. Um, so Richard, if you can pull up that, uh, the presentation. I assume everyone can hear me okay? We can. Great, great. No screen sharing just yet, hasn't come. <laughs> no, I don't see it either. And our apologies to you are deeper because you're in a different time zone. I, I'm sure you're well, in Thunder that, Bay. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. quite, that's quite all right. There okay, so Richard, if you just pop us to the first page, page one. Um, so again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through this at a fairly quick pace, just because like I said, it was circulated, but by all means, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll pause at certain points and, and see if there are any questions. So really the purpose of this report um, is, is twofold. I mean, obviously uh, part of our professional standards is that we report to, to council on our audit uh, plan, our audit results uh, and any findings that we have, but also it, it does cover off some of uh, council's sort of roles and responsibilities when it comes to financial reporting. So there is an oversight responsibility that council has, and, and this gives you the opportunity to to see what we did and, and then if you have any questions, you can ask them. Um, the deliverables, uh, so obviously the report on the consolidated financial statements, um, we do assist in the preparation of the financial statements. When we go through our audit report, we're very clear on the fact that these financial statements are your financial statements. The audit report belongs to us, but we do assist uh, with the preparation of a lot of the notes to the financial statements and some of those other things um, that obviously um, management uh, doesn't do on a day-to-day -day basis, they do it once a year. The preparation of the financial information return and then obviously the communication of audit results that we're gonna talk about tonight. The status of our audit, uh, the audit's complete. Uh, obviously we're here to present our findings and, and report to you. Uh, hopefully you will approve the financial statements uh, at which time then we can complete our, our subsequent event review to see if there's anything that's happened um, subsequent to when we completed our field work that would impact the financial statements and then hopefully sign off uh, on the audit report and it would have today's date on it, assuming that uh, council approves the financial statements. So our audit approach, there is a, uh, an appendix, appendix A that uh, deals with our audit report approach in more detail, but basically our audit approach is, is really uh, focused on risk. Uh, we spend a lot of time early on in the engagement sort of assessing where the risk of a, a material error can, can happen or take place. And then obviously design and focus our, our procedures to make sure that we cover off that risk uh, to the best of our ability. And we'll talk a little bit more about it when we get to the appendices. So Richard, to the next one page. So uh, some of the key risks, now obviously I'm not gonna go through all of them, uh, but uh, 
talk about some of the ones that uh, in most cases are, are sort of different uh, this year, but also some of the areas where our standards require us to focus our efforts and our attention. <clears throat> the first one that uh, is obvious is, is COVID-19 and the impact it's had on your financial statements. Keep in mind that these statements are as at December 31st. So the pandemic didn't even happen at, at that point. But the reality is we, we executed our audit subsequent to that date. So obviously we as your auditors need to look at what impact COVID-19 had on has on your organization, whether it be from a going concern perspective, you know, the ability for you to carry on your business uh, the way you did in the past, uh, but also just the, you know, the, the sort of the day-to-day -day operations and the impact that it has. It has required that we, uh, we add a note to the financial statements talking about COVID-19. Um, so, you know, we, we've had a lot of discussions with management. We've looked at your minutes to see what council has done to, uh, to um, minimize the impact of COVID-19, not only to your operations, but to your ratepayers as well. So things like waiving interest and penalty charges, um, we, we're gonna see a significant decrease in, in your airport revenue, um, the impacts it's had on your workforce, those types of things we took a look at and, and, and basically sat down with management to see if there was gonna be any impact to the financial statements that we're gonna be issuing other than the note disclosure. And, came to the conclusion that it's gonna be what we call a non-adjusting subsequent event. So it's something that happened after the year end that isn't gonna require any adjustment to the financial statements at December 31st, okay? Some of the significant transactions, obviously your, your capital program uh, is significant and it's significant every year. So again, this year, you know, the, um, the multiple capital additions totaling close to $3.6 million. Um, a lot of those projects were under construction or still in progress at year end to the tune of about $2.8 million. The other significant uh, um, item this year in your, in your capital assets is the fact that the airport terminal was completed. So every year the, the, that project was going in your work in progress. So, so construction in progress. This year it actually moved into its actual asset category. So you started taking depreciation on that as well. So when you look at your um, little summary we provided with uh, there for you is you had additions of $3.6 million, amortization of about 3.3 million, disposals of about $1.1 million. Now disposals really, you know, if you look at some of the disposals, uh, the old terminal was written off because now you have a new terminal. So $438,000 of that was just the, the terminal itself that was written off, uh, basically whatever was left. Um, and then so a lot of vehicles that were, were replaced or not in use anymore to the tune of about 320. So obviously, um, you know, as you bring on new assets, um, those other, the assets that it's replacing are getting disposed of. Um, and then the, the accumulated amortization on disposals of $772,000. So the net amount there is about, uh, you know, $350,000 approximately of, of net assets that were written off this year. So we spent a fair bit of time looking at that, uh, making sure that that uh, the accounting treatment for your fixed asset additions is is reasonable and based on your your policies that are in place. The government transfers. So these are your government grants. Um, <clears throat> now government grants to the tune of about five point five million dollars. Um, you know, significant government transfers included the OMPF money, about one point four million dollars. You did receive the one time. Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing grant of about $630,000. And then something new this year is the evacuation grant, uh, totaling about $1.2 million. Now, obviously you had expenses uh, that, that played into that as well. So that wasn't free money. Uh, you actually spent some money to earn that, uh, but it is uh, something new and something you didn't budget for. So when Richard goes through the financial statements, he'll make, uh, make reference to that as well. And then deferred revenue. So your federal gas tax, you didn't budget to use uh, any of your federal gas tax this year. So that's sitting in your deferred revenue of, to the tune of about $894,000. So this is money that's uh, available to you to use for, for the projects that uh, are allowed for under the federal gas tax funding model. So we spent a lot of time looking at your grants, making sure that you've earned them. Um, and if you hadn't earned them, they, they're sitting in deferred. Uh, there's a significant receivable balance at the end of the year, the money that's owed to you for, for some of these grants. And Richard will touch on that when he takes you through the financial statements. 
So the next page, Richard, uh, again, some of the significant risks. Now, fraud is, is something that, uh, you know, as auditors, we need to, to take a hard look at. Um, so the fraud risk over revenue recognition um, and really around taxation and grant revenue. Now, this isn't something unique to the municipality of Sioux Lookout. Our professional standards basically tell us that there's a presumed risk over revenue. Uh, so regardless of what organization you're involved with, we take a hard look at revenue uh, because we have to as part of our professional standards. So we do, uh, we took a, took a hard look at, at your um, revenue recognition, especially from taxation and grant perspective, making sure that, like I said earlier, that you've earned the grants that you say you've earned. And if you hadn't earned them, that they're sitting in deferred um, for, for a future date. Um, fraud risk with regards to management override. When we get into the internal control letter, um, I'll make light of the fact that you do have what we call a segregation of duties problem. And that's consistent with what we see in, in a lot of organizations your size. You don't have the budget or the, the, the resources to go out and hire enough people to properly segregate duties. So, you know, it's our role to bring it to your attention, but we're not suggesting you go out and hire a bunch of people to satisfy that risk. Um, there are a, a lot of good compensating controls in place, and we'll touch on that when we go through the internal control letter, but it is something we have to bring to your attention. And, you know, this concept of a lack of, of restricted access to programs and data, you know, having individuals that, uh, that can make adjustments to your uh, financial records is something that uh, obviously heightens the, the risk around errors, but it is uh, something that we take a hard look at. And where we look uh, mostly is, is your adjusting journal entries. So the day-to-day -day operations, they, they, they go into your, your general ledger and your accounts uh, as, as they would normally go in there. Where there's a risk of error is through these adjusting journal entries. And we spend a lot of time looking at them to make sure that they've got properly, proper support and that they're reasonable under the circumstances. And finally, you know, the, the, the fraud and illegal acts, what we normally hear about fraud, you know, people stealing and those kinds of things. Uh, we spend a lot of time, you know, talking to management, looking at some of the riskier areas. And, uh, you know, during the course of our, our audit, we did not reveal any fraud or illegal acts. So that's something that council always wants to hear um, when we come and do our presentations. The next category is accounting estimates. Um, so accounting estimates from an audit perspective are difficult to audit because we don't have invoices or anything to go to. It's really based on um, certain assumptions that management makes uh, and some professional judgment as well. So the two areas that uh, are the most significant estimates in your financial statements is your allowance for doubtful accounts. So uh, what, you, what you've got in your records that you're not sure you're gonna collect on, doesn't mean you're, you're definitely not gonna collect it, but it's, uh, there's some doubt as to whether you will. So that, uh, that total is about $1.3 million. Um, and then your landfill closure and post-closure liability of close to $400,000. So we take a hard look at both of those um, and sit down with management to make sure that they're, they're applying their, their rationale consistent year over year, but also that their rationale is reasonable. And uh, we've come to the conclusion that we support management in their, their calculation of the allowance. The other one is the landfill closure and post-closure um, we work with management to come up with this number. You'll see in our internal control letter that we do recommend that, that, uh, that the municipality um, goes out and has a study done to assess what that liability really is. Um, there's been a lot of uh, changes to compaction and some of those things. So we wanna make sure that you know, management and council know what the liability in the future is and uh, you know, whether or not you decide to start funding that somehow or, or start thinking about how you're gonna you know, either extend the life of that landfill site or, or look for a new one is something that you probably should do uh, before it, the time comes and you have to close it. With regards to adjustments and uncorrected differences, um, you know, anytime we come in and do a, an audit, we find differences. Uh, and then depending on the dollar value, we will go to management and ask them to, to make adjustments uh, or leave it to management. So management has made the decision this year to make all the adjustments that we brought to them are brought to their attention. So there's no unrecorded differences in the financial statements going forward, okay? The other reportable matters, again, with regards to internal control, I touched on it already, you know, the segregation of duties issue and also the landfill liability issue. Um, we can talk about it when we get to the letter itself. The other item I wanna to bring to your attention is cybersecurity. I think we touched on this last year 
it's not, uh, it really isn't so much um, if you're going to get hacked, it's when you're going to get hacked. Uh, that seems to be the, the, the theme nowadays when it comes to cybersecurity. And COVID shed a lot of light on this, on this issue. Um, with people working from home, it's exposed a lot of organizations to new levels of risk. So, you know, as an organization, it's something that uh, you do want to take a hard look at. And it's not uh, that these hackers are going in and, and stealing accounting information. That's, that's probably the least of your concerns. What they do is they, they go and they look for, uh, you know, social insurance numbers, uh, banking information, um, any private uh, type information. And then uh, you get the, the call or the email saying that uh, they're basically holding it hostage and, and they want to get paid. Um, and I, believe it or not, we have a lot of clients that call us and say, what do I do next? Um, and believe it or not, they actually make it easy on organizations where they have links to how you pay them in Bitcoin um, and how you can convert your money to Bitcoin so you can pay them. So they're very sophisticated um, and it's a, it's a reality of the world we live in right now. With regards to independence, uh, we just need to confirm again, based on our standards that we are independent of your organization. So it won't impact our audit report in any way, shape or form. We do, we do uh, provide you with a lot of the technical updates, both from a accounting and an assurance perspective. Again, our expectation is not that you become totally literate in this stuff. And if you want to read on it, you can. But be assured that we'll work with management to make sure that uh, any changes to our standards, whether it be accounting or audit, will uh, make sure that it's, uh, it's probably reflected in your financial statements and, and the audit itself. So then we get into the appendices. And like I said, um, this is just an overview of our approach. You know, we all have a role to play. Uh, again, the role of council is really to oversee the work of the, the auditors and management. Um, but you set the tone for the organization as well, uh, you know, emphasizing honesty, ethical behavior and, and fraud prevention. Management is responsible for these financial statements. They're also responsible for the internal controls that feed into the financial statements. And they provide representations to us. So when we come in and ask questions, um, obviously we expect them to be truthful in their, in their responses. And whenever possible, we corroborate what they tell us to third-party evidence. Our role is to provide an opinion on the financial statements based on our audit and to be a resource to, to counsel and to management uh, when it comes to um, financial reporting and financial accounting issues. Our approach, like I said before, is really there's five buckets to it, but the reality is the first three buckets, whether it's planning, uh, the assessing of risk or the evaluation of internal controls, we spend a lot of time there assessing where the risks uh, of, of error can take place and then we tailor our procedures to make sure we cover off that risk. And that's where the testing of accounts and transactions take place. And then obviously we come and report to you as, as counsel. So Richard, in the essence of time, maybe we jump to Appendix B, the draft auditor's report. So our report, uh, like in the past, is addressed to the members of council, inhabitants and ratepayers of the Corporation and Municipality of Sulaco. That's who we work for. We've got a good relationship, maybe a great relationship with management, but at the end of the day, we know we work for you and our team knows we work for you and, and the rate payer. So we're out, uh, you know, I often use the analogy that uh, we're looking to protect the, the people that live on Main Street. And that's uh, sort of what our role is to make sure that their, their backs are looked, looked after. The opinion itself is that, uh, you know, the first paragraph there is it goes on to state what we've actually audited and we've audited the financial statements that are going to be attached to this audit report. And then in our opinion, the financial statements present fairly in all material respects, the financial position of the municipality as at December 31st. So this is what we would consider a clean audit opinion. Um, the basis of our opinion, again, Canadian generally accepted auditing standards are the standards that we need to abide by. Management's responsible for the financial statements and the internal controls that feed into the financial statements. Management's also responsible for assessing um, the municipality's ability to continue to operate as a going concern. Uh, you know, you, in, in normal times, you would think that that's kind of silly, uh, that they would have to assess whether or not you're going to continue to operate. But in our changing world, it is something that we need to look at every year. Um, Obviously, management believes that you are going to continue to operate as a going concern, and we, we state later on that we concur with management's assessment of that. But it is something that we have to do on an annual basis. And then those charged with governance uh, are responsible for overseeing the municipality's financial reporting process. So again, you know, our objective is, is to obtain reasonable assurance that the, the financial statements are free of material misstatement. 
that's not absolute assurance. Uh, it is a high level of assurance, but again, it's not a guarantee that there aren't any errors in the financial statements. To get to that point, we would have to audit every transaction. It wouldn't be cost effective, and we'd have to be there for 12 months, which which isn't uh, isn't practical or reasonable. Um, so, other than you know, uh, exercising professional judgment and being skeptical, uh, which is why we go to third party evidence whenever possible. You know, part of the our role is to identify and assess those risks uh, of material misstatement and then design procedures to cover off that risk to gain an understanding of your internal controls to evaluate the appropriateness of your policies to conclude on the appropriateness of management's use of the going concern assumption um, to evaluate the overall presentation structure uh, and content of the financial statement so once we're done we completed our audit and prepared the financial statements we actually take a step back and take a look at the financial statements and say, would well, these statements mislead anybody in any way, shape or form? And then uh, obviously we concur that we, they don't. So um, we're able to issue a clean audit opinion. And then if, obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence uh, over those entities that you're consolidating in here. So again, looking at the library, for instance, making sure that uh, their financial statements wouldn't mislead anybody, the, the airport uh, and some of those other entities that are included in here. Then Appendix C is the draft management representation letter. So we ask uh, management to sign this letter. Basically, it's, it's a bit of a form letter, but it is a, an important part uh, of the audit. Basically, management is, a, is representing to us that, uh, that they understand their role and that they've, uh, they've provided us with the information that we needed to, to execute on our audit. Um, Appendix D, the internal control letter. Again, um, you know the two points that we have on there, the segregation of duties, and then the compensating controls, uh, you know, all checks are signed by a member of council. So that's, uh, that's a good compensating control. But really where the, the big one is, is, you know, that, that, that management does come to you with budget to actual reports. And when you review them, I encourage you to take a look at them and, and make sure that they appear reasonable. If they don't look right, they likely aren't, or there's probably something going on that management should be able to explain to you uh, what's happening there. And then there's the landfill liability. Like I said to you before, the, the, the report that you have on file is outdated and likely needs to be updated uh, so that we have some, some accurate numbers in the, in the financial statements. And then finally, the Appendix E is uh, with regards to cybersecurity, giving you some more information around cybersecurity and the importance of, uh, of what's happening in the world right now with regards to this, this, this issue. Um, more and more organizations are being exposed and it, it actually, cyber, cyber crime is more lucrative than the drug trade right now and has been for the last two years. So that gives you some, some understanding as to how pervasive it is in the world right now. And then the other appendices are really just the auditing and accounting developments. Uh, when you take, if you have time and you take a look at them, you'll notice that a number of them have been deferred and they've been deferred as a result of COVID. Um, obviously our standards people have realized that um, having people uh, make changes to their accounting treatment and, and auditing treatment under these times is unreasonable. So a lot of them have been deferred by a year and may be deferred longer depending on how, how long the pandemic lasts. Okay. So are there any questions on the audit before Richard takes you through the financial statements? Council? Yeah, oh. question? Council, uh, I'll just yep. go through. Councillor uh, Timpson, are you starting there? Is that you, your voice? Yeah, yeah. Councillor uh, Timpson. Thanks, Frank. Um, the question, um, you've done the library, but the library is not detailed in, within the financial statement, I understand. But So I'm wondering when will, I'm on the library board, so when will the library board be getting its financial statement, audited statement? The, the audited statement of the library is complete. So once we, we go through this meeting, we can set up uh, the library board meeting at any point. Okay, and, and um, there were three, um, let me see, the landfill closure was a concern, uh, segregated roles, but you sort of indicated that's not realistic for us to worry too much about. And then there was, there's another one and I can't find my, um, I note that I made this afternoon. I think it was internal <laughs> controls or something that you were concerned about. Well, those are the internal controls that we're concerned about, those two items. <clears throat> there, were, yeah. there were a few other items last year. So last year we reported on 
the fact that certain accounts weren't reconciled. So management has corrected that and all the accounts were reconciled when we came in. Uh -huh. um, last, last year, there was also a point with regards to your reserve funds not being fully funded. Uh -huh. um, the reserve funds still aren't fully funded, but there's a reason for it. There's, there's been some transactions that happened at or near year end that, uh, that the money was actually flowed in 2020. So we had that discussion with management and it wasn't material. So we, we took that point out as well. Okay. So the landfill is the biggest thing right, right now. The landfill right. closure is the biggest thing we need to address. Okay, that's good. Okay. Councillor Bath. No, I have no question. Councillor Fanlon. Councillor Fanlon, no questions? Through you, Mayor Lawrence, there'll be the opportunity to ask questions on the financial statements as well. All right. So once Richard goes through them. Councillor Howie. No questions. I'm uh, glad to hear that many of the recommendations made have been acted upon and um, look forward to the continued progress. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. No, nothing here. Councillor Lego. No, nothing here. Thank you, uh, Frank. You move on. Okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to Richard. Richard Jagalowitz is a senior manager in our office. So he, uh, he assisted in, in reviewing and, and overseeing a lot of the audit. So I will turn it over to him and let him walk you through the financial statements. Richard, are you there? <laughs> Am I the only one that can't hear him? <laughs> No, you're you're not alone. I'm not alone. Let me just. Uh, do we have a clerk? Are you there? Is there a? Does he need to be unmuted? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, the issue appears to be at Richard's end. Uh, the uh, mute and unmute functions here are are working. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Perhaps it's uh, Richard's microphone or uh, something of, along the, that line. Just give him a second. I think he's going to just change his speaker. If that doesn't work, I can always walk you guys through the statements. How's that? Is that okay? Yeah. No, nope. you're on. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So thanks, Frank, for that introduction. Um, so as Frank mentioned, I had the pleasure of actually reviewing the file and working with management along with my audit team to prepare these financial statements. So I'll just dive right in. I'm just going to jump straight into and pass the auditor's report as technically Frank's already gone through it. So I don't think I need to clarify through that again. So we'll start off with the consolidated statement of financial position. Um, so to begin with, one of the things you'll notice here is that technically your cash did increase a bit in the year. There's a lot of things that attribute to this. And there's a separate statement in the financial statements that describe this. A couple bigger items that you'll see that attribute to the cash increase is that when we actually get to the statement of operations, you'll see that there is an annual PSAB surplus of $2.2 million that was earned in the year. There's also long-term proceeds of a million dollars. So you obtained an additional million dollars of debt in the year, which means your cash would have went up. And then as for your deferred revenue, as Frank mentioned, your gas tax was not spent in the year, therefore it was deferred, and therefore that cash is still sitting in your bank account at the end of the year. So those are some things that increased your cash. Other things that decreased your cash, You'll notice when we get to it, your accounts receivable did uh, increase by about $688,000, meaning that you've technically earned that cash, but you haven't received it yet. As well, you have a decrease in your accounts payable about $631,000, meaning you've paid out cash of that amount, and as well, purchased some additional investments in the year of $512,000. So those are some of the main reasons in terms of why your cash and cash equivalents uh, increased. So as I mentioned, you purchased some investments in the tune of about $512,000 um, this year or so. So you'll notice that your investments went from uh, just over 1 million to 1.6 million. And that's just, once again, the four annual GICs that are outstanding at the end of the year that mature uh, within different time periods. Your taxes receivable, 
you'll notice that from a net perspective, it decreased by $110,000. However, there's two components that make up this amount. The first amount is your actual gross taxes receivable in terms of the receivable amounts from businesses, um, from residents, et cetera. But then there's also your allowance. So first of all, your gross taxes receivable um, actually increased by about 403,000 this year from 2.2 million to $2.6 million. So there is an increase that happened there. However, your allowance in terms of these um, taxes receivables that are doubtful increased from 817,000 to 1.3 million, meaning that management has set up an additional allowance of $514,000 associated with essentially taxes receivables. They don't believe or there could be risk of collecting those amounts. So it doesn't mean that it's been written off. It just means that they've set up an allowance of there could be some uncollectability there. Okay, but when you take those two considerations in terms of why it's decreased, it's because management has recognized a larger allowance associated with those taxes. Nothing really unique with user charges receivables. It did increase. It's just the timing of, of receivables associated for um, water and sewer receivables there. Your accounts receivable did increase by about $688,000 in the year. So there's a couple things here. Um, your trade receivables is $1.6 million or about $1.7 million of that $4 million. Um, and that's made up of things such as uh, $628,000 from Wasaya Airways, $106,000 from World Fuel Services, and about $142,000 for Premier Aviation. So this once again can fluctuate on a year to year basis, pending on when that cash flow comes in. So it's really dependent on a lot of your customers um, there. Some other receivable amounts that are built up in there, something that's unique this year is the evacuation receivable. So in this case, when it comes down to that revenue, there's about $948,000 still outstanding at the end of the year that hasn't been received. Um, whereas last year, obviously there wasn't anything receivable in terms of the nature of that item. Other things that are in there as well is you have some NOHFC grants and uh, some FedNOR grants where those balances have increased in tune of 50,000 and 236,000 respectively. So once again, this is a timing a lot of those trade receivables and as well grant amounts. And then in this case, unique to this year, the evacuation piece of it. Your inventories for resale, nothing really surprising there. It did decrease by about 16,000, but nothing of concern noted. The investment in government business enterprise deals with Sulukot Hydro. So there's really two components that resulted in this change. One was that it generated income of 292,000 in the year, but then at the same time, it distributed a dividend of $215,000. So that net impact is $77,000, which is what that increase accounts for. So your total financial assets at the end of the year um, are just under $17 million. Going on to your liability side, you'll notice that your liabilities have decreased in the year. And once again, um, that's a result of your accounts payable being one big one where it's decreased by $631,000. Um, essentially at the end of the day, this is timing of payables, right? Like there's no payables essentially outstanding on your trade payables where you're not making payments where required. So it just depends in terms of what kind of actions or operations are happening for the organization at the end of the year. So one of the large outstanding payables you do have at the end of the year um, with your trade payables of 727,000 is there is a payable to FinWay general contracting for in the tune of about $300,000. And then there's other various vendors that build up those amounts for that trade payables. Other things that make up your AP is your payroll accrual, which is in the tune of $276,000. And then there's a, uh, a big change in, tune, tune, um, in terms of a balance due to Q8 and Patricia board school board, uh, where last year there was a receivable of two grand, this year a payable of $241,000. So once again, this is a timing issue that happens where last year, for example, in terms of how things happened, um, write-offs and other items, there could be a payable or receivable. Just happens that this year there was a $241,000 payable to Q8 and Patricia board. Your deferred revenue, about $1.3 million. Frank already touched base on this, but essentially it's increased by about $841,000, primarily for the fact that your gas tax revenue this year wasn't spent and therefore deferred. So as a result, your gas tax balance at the end of the year is now $894,000. You have other donations and, and, and items there that have been deferred in the tune of $324,000 and a new one this year, which is the OPP policing for about $106,000. So Overall, an increase in deferred revenue just because those funds haven't been spent. Your debt, 
at the end of the day has decreased, which is always a positive, but two factors that are considered in there, one being the fact that you did obtain additional debt associated with OSIF, $612,000 for the STP roof, ladder truck, uh, garbage truck, and another $349,000 for Park and Robert Street. So in total, that was about a million dollars that was obtained in terms of new debt in the year. Debt repayment, $1.4 million. When you net those two amounts off, that's what makes up your $426,000 change there. The landfill closure, this will fluctuate on a year-to-year -year basis, but once again, this is an estimate. So right now, when we help management with this estimate, it's based on the closure of your previous landfill, for example, and then information we've received that we've carried forward historically. As Frank mentioned, the problem with this is that this is an estimate for the future, right? And as you fill up the capacity of your landfill, this liability will grow and grow and grow based on the expected closure costs. The problem with not having an up-to-date landfill report, for example, means that this figure could not necessarily be as accurate as you would hope. And that's why we recommended in our internal control letter that it's something that council uh, and management consider for the upcoming year. The employee benefits liability is something where we rely on actuarial report to help us determine what the post-employment benefits are at the end of the year. And this essentially relates to uh, once someone retires, what are they entitled to and what is the municipality on the hook for for those employees? So that's a portion of it. But then at the same time, there is vested non-vested sick leave, vacation payable, and bank time that's in there as well. And so in this case, overall, um, it's fluctuated into a negative position just because mainly the vacation payable has decreased and as well with that um, banked time. So your total liabilities at the end of the year is just in the tune of $24.4 million, just a slight decrease from the prior year. So your net debt at the end of the year did change um, quite significantly actually, um, whereas last year's 9.4, now you have $7.4 million. Some non-financial assets to, as well at the bottom here, you can see is the tangible capital assets. Frank spoke to this already a little bit. So just a high overview, um, you know, in terms of what happened, there was acquisitions of just in the tune of $3.6 million, but amortization of $3.3 million. Um, and then as well, a loss on the disposal of your write-off of existing assets because they've been replaced of about $330,000. So really, there's only a net change of about $78,000 there, but there's a lot that happened, right? And with those acquisitions, as Frank mentioned, a lot of it's uh, assets under construction, where $1.4 million of that relates specifically to the mill road re rehabilitation. 1.3 million relates to the waterfront project. So there is quite a few projects under construction. Um, and prepaid expenses has increased quite a bit in the year and is primarily associated just with insurance that's been paid in full, but hasn't actually been used, meaning that we recognize it on a daily or monthly basis. So at the end of the year, there's $272,000 in insurance that's been prepaid associated with the municipality and $168,000 with the Sioux Lookout Public Library. So that's still outstanding at the end of the year that you'll get the benefit for. So at the end of the day, your accumulated surplus is in the tune of just under $69 million, which there's a schedule in the back of the statements we'll talk to later on that break down uh, what's that, what that is made up of. So before I move on to the statement of operations, does anyone have any questions in regards to the statement of financial position? Council, any questions? Yeah, I just, I just don't understand that issue about liabilities there that uh, we're in debt $20 million, but our net debt is only $7 million. It's when you net the total financial assets against the total liabilities, you get that $7.4 million. So when you take in consideration your $17 million in total financial assets, less your total liabilities, that's how you get to your net debt consideration. You're yeah. muted, uh, Councillor Tinsley. Oh, okay. I, I, <laughs> okay. You're good, Councillor Timpson. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'll, if it's okay with you, Your Worship, I'll continue to move on. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll move on to the consolidated statement of operations. So. Um, in this case, there's budget figures and prior year figures. And in terms of our comparison, what I want to do is focus on some of the bigger variances. So I'm not going to necessarily go through every single variance that's noted here. I want to focus on some of the higher items just for the essence of time um, to focus on the main things. So the first thing that you'll notice here is that from the taxation piece, the residential and farm taxation, there is a bit of a difference associated with the um, budget to actual, which normally is not something that's common for municipalities. But the main reason for that is that there was a residential levy of $8.3 million. However, there was write-offs 
um, where it was directly applied against the revenue, meaning that there wasn't an intention of, or a possibility in this case of collecting that revenue because it could have been a business that went bankrupt in this case specific, but it's made up of a couple different items, but that's why the budget to actual does have a variance. Whereas you can notice with the other items, there isn't as much of a variance associated with them. So that's the primary reason uh, associated with that variance. But at the end, your total taxation revenue was budgeted for 11 million, uh, came in at 10.4. Main difference is that residential and farm taxation write-offs that were applied on a net basis. As for the user charges, nothing really unique here. Your water and sewer billings overall from budget to actual had a variance of about 165,000. And it's just more or less the fact that there was just more revenue earned associated with your wastewater revenue by about 50,000 and your water revenue of about 66,000. So overall an increase there. Your other fees and service charges is quite a few things that are made up in here. I'll first address the fact of the difference between the budget to actual. Your primary thing is your airport improvement fee. It was about $228,000 greater than what was budgeted. Customer uh, parking as well was $82,000 greater than what was budgeted. And your plane servicing was $45,000 greater than what was budgeted. So those are some of the bigger items that had an impact associated with the difference in other fees and service budget to actual. Obviously it's always good to see more revenue uh, than what was budgeted. It means obviously that that's gonna lead to a positive surplus. In terms of the considerations with the prior year difference, um, a lot of the same things I talked about in terms of the variances associated with the budget. Plane servicing was higher. You had some landfill fees increases up by 44,000 from last year, property rentals increased, parking income increased. Um, and then the only real difference is that last year that boosted their income was there was revenue charged for demolition of buildings and, and funds uh, received from collection agencies. So really overall, a lot of positive increases in other fees and service charges. When we move on to government transfers, this is where we focused a lot of our time in the audit, um, just because there's a heightened risk associated with it. So one of the things you'll notice here is that there is quite a variance for the government of Canada from a budget to actual perspective. And the main reason for that is because what was budgeted was the waterfront project originally to be earned associated with it. Um, however, really only 286,000 of that waterfront project was earned when I believe it was budgeted for close to about 900,000. And as a result, there was other projects as well that were very similar to it. Um, but that was the primary difference associated with between the government of Canada and the actual. Um, prior year as well, uh, in terms of it, you'll notice that last year was higher. There was a grant last year associated with the airport terminal, terminal for approximately 290,000 and as well 306,000 for Park Street lane upgrades. So last year there was certain grants that were obtained that this year weren't. Um, and as well, there just weren't projects that came to fruition this year and are still in progress. As for the province of Ontario, similarly as what we commented on Government of Canada, one of the things that did impact the budget is, is the fact that there was uh, the waterfront project budgeted on the province of Ontario side and you only earned 286. So that's one of the reasons why your budget in this case would be higher. As you notice, there's a $660,000 difference. There's other things that are impacting it. Um, one of the primary things is the one-time funding with the, with the MMAH that, we, that Frank commented on for about 628,000. And then the three evacuation totals of about $1.2 million. So things, once again, that were not budgeted for that came to fruition and as a result, increased your total revenue there for the province of Ontario. Um, I'm gonna move on to the other revenues and here I'm just gonna focus on some of the bigger items here. Um, you know, when it comes to investment income, there's earned additional interest income in the year, which is also supported by the fact there was additional cash, more investments, um, which makes sense. Sale of fuel, as I mentioned, um, you know, this was, has been an increase just because of the activity and operations of it. So overall uh, positive increase above the budget for sales to revenue, sales of fuel and from comparison last year, nothing concerning about the fundraising and donations. As for other municipalities, POA, uh, you know, those revenues did increase in the current year, which we were able to confirm and work through. Nothing overly concerning associated with uh, the licenses, permits and rents. Uh, in terms of a current year to prior year comparison, um, permit, increases for revenue did go to 114,000, whereas last year was only 29,000. Um, when it comes down to the income from investment in government businesses, as I mentioned on the on the balance sheet side, two impacts. The income from uh, Sulaco Hydro was 292,000. Dividends paid out of 215. So that net effect is what you see there for the $72,000 or 77,000, sorry. Oh no, 72,000. Um, associated with other, 
things that fall under there are land sales, which are a pr primary thing. So this year there was less land sales than were expected. Um, last year there was $200,000 in land sales. This year, 70,000 um, more municipal land sold in the prior year. Commercial land sales, there was more 115,000 in the current year compared to 104 in the last year. And then as well, the prior year surplus um, was also a consideration in this year's budget of $56,000 that was also picked up in here. So overall, uh, not as much activity associated with land sales compared to the prior year, but more so than what was budgeted for. So at the end of this, your total revenues um, is 38,115,000, which is higher than the prior year as a result of the evacuations and different things that happened that weren't budgeted for. Uh, in a comparison to budget, not too far off, only about $85,000, so very close from a budget perspective in terms of what was done there. Before I move on to the expenses, does anyone have any questions about the revenue side of this? Council? No, it doesn't look, carry on. <laughs> keeping everyone excited, eh? Just the numbers are keeping everyone motivated to stay up. Okay, well, I'm gonna take a, go move on to the expenses side of things then. So. Um, here, I mean, there's about $100,000 in terms of a difference between the budget to actual side of things. Really primarily, uh, wages were the main reason for this. Wages were about $50,000 higher than budgeted, and there's more funds spent on materials and services than budgeted. So not a huge significant, but these are little things that attributed to differences here. In terms of the prior year, last year there was more uh, expenditures than were this year, primarily because of the fact that there was um, wage differences. Um, and as well, materials did decrease as well from the prior year. So there was more activity associated with general government in the prior year than there was this year. And there were mostly smaller things that had an impact. So nothing particularly concerning I wanted to bring to your attention. Protection to persons and property is a bigger one in terms of an impact. Um, you'll notice that your budgeted 3 million came in at 3.6. Main reason, wages, contracted services greater than originally budgeted as a result of the evacuations. So those are things, once again, that were not considered in the budgeting process that did have an impact. So similarly, in terms of the difference between the prior year and the current year, um, one of the big things was is that OPP policing expenses did increase by about 112000 and so did your evacuation expenses. Whereas last year there was none, this year there were more, which explains the difference of the $1.2 million from the prior year to the current year. Transportation services, none of significant differences associated with the budget. Um, but primarily the difference in transportation was what was budgeted associated with uh, fuel purchases versus what was actually obtained. So what was budgeted was 11.1 million. What actually came to fruition was $11.6 million. So that's the prime reason for the difference in the transportation services. Um, in terms of the actual difference from the prior to the current- Sorry, Richard, but you also had the additional revenue as well. So it's not like you lost money on it. You had more revenue as well. So, but yeah. you also had more expenses with regards to the fuel sales. That's right. Not like fuel went missing or anything from that perspective. Um, and then similarly from the prior to the current year, one of the biggest uh, impacts there was once again, the aircraft fuel purchases. It went up by about 515,000 uh, this year as compared to the prior year. And same thing was wages. Um, wages had a bit of a bump as well in the year. And then one of the biggest impacts is your amortization. So because of the fact that the terminal airport was completed and fully operational, now we've been able to recognize amortization associated with it. So amortization this year was $1.3 million, which is about $684,000 more than what it was last year. So that's a big chunk in terms of where that difference came from. I'm not going to focus anything on environmental services. There's nothing really jumped out that I wanted to bring to your attention. As for health services, um, uh, you know, I'll comment on the difference associated with the budget to actual. $253,000 difference, you'll notice there. Um, what was budgeted was $238,000 for wages. You actually incurred $423,000. So a difference of $185,000. That's specifically related to facility wages. So there was more wages that were incurred associated specifically to facility and then other amounts that also bumped up the increase there in consideration. As for the social and family services, similarly budgeted more than what was actually incurred. You budgeted 1.6 million for wages, but only incurred 1.4, difference of 214,000, mainly due to Sioux Lookout Mountain programming and bit of, uh, apologize on this, but uh, bit of band programming wages as well. So that was the primary difference associated with um, the budget to actual. In regards to the prior year to the current year, there was an increase to the home for ages of about 250,000 from the prior year. Um, and that really made up a big difference. And in terms of the other differences to bring that uh, current year prior year difference back down, there was 
wages and benefits that uh, netted it out essentially to the $156,000 difference between the current year and prior year. Nothing uh, impactful in social housing. As for recreation and cultural services, um, you'll notice that your budget is slightly higher than what was actually incurred. You budgeted wages for 1.5 million, actually only incurred 1.3 million. So a difference of about 200,000, I think specifically 160. Um, this and what didn't come to fruition here was uh, wages associated with the fitness center and parks and garden. So budgeted more, didn't come to fruition in terms of those actual expenses. Um, in terms of the prior year, however, and the reason why the budget was actually higher than expected for wages is because wages and benefits did decrease by about $190,000, uh, mainly for the fitness center, um, which had the impact associated from the current year to the prior year, and as well a decrease in materials and contracted services by about $200,000 in the year. As for the planning and development side of things, this is primarily where um, expenses would have been recognized associated with the waterfront development and other things. But you'll notice that the wage, the budgeted amount was 1.2 million, actual incurred was 773,000. Wages were a part of this explanation in terms of the difference. Wages were lower than what was budgeted for the economic development um, officer. Other differences related to various materials and contracted services that did not incur in the year. And these were not specifically items that were to be capitalized for capital purposes, um, but specifically expenses that management determined were not to be capitalized. And similarly, in terms of the prior year, there were more contracted services um, and wages and benefits in the prior year than there were in the current year. So it just comes down to the operations and the activity itself. So you'll note that in terms of your budget for your expenses, you budgeted about $35,347,000, actually incurred $35,584,000, um, which in the end led to an actual uh, net revenues before um, other items of just 2.5. One of the things I do wanna specify here from a budget perspective is that council, you do budget for a, a, a balanced budget. But once again, what I wanna to refer to here is that this budget that you're seeing here is under PSAP perspectives. Meaning the fact that um, we did consider the fact that you had a budgeted balance, but from a PSAP perspective, your budget items here do not consider things like capital expenditures and other items here that would be capitalized on the balance sheet. Um, the only other item that's impacting your actual uh, annual surplus is the loss and disposal of tangible capital assets, which Frank and I have already made reference to. So your annual surplus at the end of the year uh, was just over $2.2 million, bringing your accumulated surplus at the end of the year to just under $69 million. So does anyone have any questions associated with the expense side of the statement of operations? Council? Maybe we should jump to schedule the schedule, Richard, the, the schedule of accumulated surplus, because that'll help clarify, because this $2.2 .2 million is under public sector accounting board standards. That's not really money that you've got to go out and spend. So we, we have a schedule here that actually breaks it down to uh, surpluses that, that actually make more sense in the municipal realm. So yeah. if you go to schedule one, Everyone see schedule one right now on their screens? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Did you want to take them through this, Frank, or would you like me to take them? Yeah, no, I, I can take them through it. So, so again, you know, we made reference to this concept of the accumulated surplus for the municipalities sitting at just under $69 million. And, and again, it's, that's a big number. So I want to clarify what it's made up of. Okay. So, you know, when we look at your surpluses at the top of the page there, your, your general fund surplus. So this includes your oper your operating fund or your general fund and your your capital fund. So in total, you're in a, a deficit position of $1.6 million. But last year you were in a def deficit position of $3.3 million. That $1.6 million is made up of two components. So your capital fund, so your unfinanced capital. So you have capital projects that aren't funded totaling just over $2 million to the tune of $2,057,000. And then you had an operating fund surplus of about $407,000. So the net of those two equals a deficit of $1.6 million. Okay. Now that capital fund deficit is made up of two components. Again, one is there's some projects that, that are legacy projects that have been sitting there that have been unfunded for a number of years that are still unfunded. Right. And uh, we've talked about that in the past, but then there's also projects that, uh, you know, they just weren't completed at year end. And, and the plan is once they're completed, you're going to go out and finance them and then they're funded. 
right? So there's a combination of those two elements that make up that deficit of about $2 million from a capital perspective. So I think it's important for council to know that there's, there's a capital fund deficit and an operating fund surplus that, that, uh, that is created. Now that, those are cumulative amounts. They're not the in-year amounts, right? So keep that in mind as well. So at the end of the year, there's a $1.6 million deficit in your general fund, which is made up of those two numbers. Then we have your invested in capital assets of 75 million. And then the unfunded uh, liability. So your debt, obviously you haven't levied the rate payer for it. So that should come out of your equity. The employee future benefits, the home for the age and the landfill closure, all things that you haven't levied the rate payer for yet. So that should all come out of your, your surplus. So your total surpluses there are $52 million. And the biggest number there, let's be honest, is, is your tangible capital assets of about 76 million. And then your long-term debt comes off of that. Then we get into your reserves and your reserve funds. So your total reserves um, for working capital and then for, for capital expenditures uh, netting $6.8 million. So those are down from 8.2 last year. So you actually use some of your reserves and then your reserve funds. And, and for members of council that don't remember that there is a difference between a reserve and a reserve fund. A reserve fund has an asset to support it, hopefully cash, right? So there's cash set aside to support your reserve funds. Whereas your reserves are really there to, they're like retained earnings in a corporation. There's not necessarily money to support it. It's tied up in things like accounts receivable and accounts payable, your inventory balances. It, it's sitting in your, it, it's helping finance your working capital. So that's what uh, the difference is between your reserves and reserve funds. So when we look at your reserve funds, your reserve funds actually went up by about, uh, you know, $1.4 million this year and, and change. So you went from uh, $4.5 million up to just under 6 million. So that money has been set aside in reserve funds. And, and like I said before, there's close to that amount of cash sort of set aside to support these reserve funds. Then you've got your net equity in government business enterprises. So this is your, your net equity in the hydro of about $3.2 million. And that's, that's what makes up the $68.8 million of accumulated surplus. But really from council's perspective, you know, most councils are concerned with a couple of numbers, one being the general fund surplus or deficit, and then they want to know what's in their reserves and reserve funds, right? So now are there any questions on that schedule? Council? Sounds like we're good, uh, Frank. Okay. So Richard, do you want to take them through a couple of the notes to the financial statements and then we can open the floor for final questions? Absolutely. So I'm not going to take you through all of this. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of these note disclosures are very consistent with what has been in the prior years. So I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it basically goes through your significant accounting policies in terms of how things are recognized. We have a breakdown here in terms of what has, you know, how much cash you actually have in the bank and then transactions going on. I'm not going to focus too much on that, but I will draw your attention to this taxes. Uh, I apologize. I'm trying to zoom it in to make it as easy as possible to see, but I think this is a, a key thing to look at because one of the conversations we've had with management associated with COVID is whether or not there is struggles associated with collecting your receivables um, for property taxes, right? So um, at December 31st, there, there was an increase, as I mentioned, from 2.1 to 2.5 for the gross taxes receivable. But then management also set up an additional allowance associated with specific roll numbers or properties, for example, where um, they, they feel and believe they're not going to necessarily collect those amounts. So it's not that, for example, they've let the taxpayer off the hook. They're just recognizing uh, an expense in the year, essentially, to say, you know, we may not collect it. And it, it's a good practice to do because of the fact that um, you don't want to be lying to yourself in terms of what you actually have in terms of your assets for your receivables, right? So... Um, and especially in a year where you have a surplus like you do, for example, uh, you, it, it's a positive thing to recognize that increase there. So that's one thing I wanted to kind of show council just so to get like a picture view of, of what I was discussing there. Um, the investment is just essentially Sue Lookout uh, Hydro in terms of what they have on their balance on the statement of financial position. I'm not going to take you through that as I kind of we've covered it a couple times already in the discussions. Here's your deferred revenue in terms of what's outstanding. So as I mentioned, you can see that your unearned gas tax has increased from 244 to 893. And it's because of the fact that those funds haven't been spent 
at the end of the year. So they're set aside for another year. But there's other items, as you can see here, that's also uh, a reason for the increase. So those are items that we've looked at, you know, identified the fact that those funds haven't been spent yet and the, ensure that they are being deferred. The debt, I mean, this is a big schedule. I'm not gonna go through it line by line, but this breaks down essentially some of the items associated with your debt. One of the items management has asked us to clarify on here is items associated with um, a due and matured. So in, in the prior year, um, we had situations, for example, where um, we identified whether it was due to or matured. Now it just says due, uh, just to clarify. And then whether or not, for example, these amounts that are due in the following year are amounts that are to be refinanced or repaid. So in this case, you can notice here in terms of the top two, this one for $8,000 going to be repaid in 2020. I believe actually it's already repaid as of, as of today. Um, whereas for example, this one, this fix, fixed term loan at the top for 243,000 is to be refinanced or the terms that are to be renegotiated um, in 2020. So just uh, for those who are gonna be looking at this information, when you do look at those items that are due in 2020, we did specify whether or not they're to be repaid or uh, refinanced. Okay. So I'm going to keep moving along there. And then we do show what your principal repayment does look like over the five-year term um, associated with that debt. And total interest charges that were incurred associated with this debt in the year was $548,000, which has decreased primarily because of your principal repayments that were made in the year, but keeping in mind that you did incur an additional $1 million of debt. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else specifically I wanted to I'd draw your attention to. I don't believe there's anything new here. Uh, this talks about the activity associated around your reserve and reserve fund. So this just looks at transfers that have been made to your reserves and from reserves that have been approved by through the budgeting process or through council resolution. Um, and to Frank's point associated with this, right? Most of this reserve fund is being funded. So this number here actually does not consider the, um, and my apologies, this is something that we can fix does not consider the GIC investment. Those GIC investments are also considered to be set aside uh, for the purposes of your reserve fund. So technically there's another $1.5 million to be added to there. Once you do, you see the fact that that balance at the end of the year is covered. However, there are other considerations like the deferred revenue funds you have in your bank account, for example, that haven't been spent, right? So um, it's still something that we recommend management keep an eye on. Um, I made reference to this earlier on, the budgeted figures. So as I mentioned, we recognize the fact that you have a balanced budget. So you can see here that this annual surplus under the approved fiscal plan is $0. But then there's PSEB items in here, for example, that we have to adjust for so that your statements are actually represented properly. So you can see that this budget at the end is what we actually show in your financial statements. And these are the impacts. So the, there's things like the transfers to and from reserves that you guys recognize as cash inflows and outflows. Capital items that technically, although they are cash outflows, they get capitalized in the year. So there was budgeted amounts of $6.7 million for that. Debt proceeds, plans of getting new debt of over $2 million, debt repayments of 1.6 million, and then amortization of 3.3 million that uh, management does not budget for, which is common practice that we see in a lot of municipalities. Otherwise than that though, um, the other item you'll notice here uh, for example, is the subsequent event note. And this is just to let the user know associated with the fact that COVID-19 was considered in our process throughout our audit and the impacts. Um, there may be still additional uh, dialogue that might be entered in here from management's perspective, just to clarify what impacts have happened specifically. But we've recognized the fact that as it's a non-adjusting entry, meaning that we didn't recognize anything to have significant impairment, that there really hasn't been um, a significant impact for the municipality. So we'll have to revisit this again um, in future years. And then we're back at Schedule 1. And, and I'm not going to go over Schedule 1 again. Schedule 2 is a breakdown of the movement of your tangible capital assets. So it's, it's essentially your biggest non-financial asset at the end of the year of just over or under $76 million, And it shows essentially how things have moved. And then Schedule 3 is just a different way of looking at how revenue and expenses fell into your uh, segments, right? So general government protections, transportation, um, which ties back to your statement of operations there. So, and that's, that's, that's my presentation, your worship. So I'll throw it back to you to see if there's any questions or if, you, if there's anything else you'd like us to respond to. 
All right, I'll go to the I'll go around the council table just to be sure. Councillor Howie. I uh, don't have any questions, uh, but thank you. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for so being uh, so thorough. Yes, thank you for your patience. <laughs> Councillor Timpson. Uh, no questions this time, but I'd like to ask uh, uh, Frank Lopez there. Uh, I would like to come around sometime to clarify a few things whenever you're in the office and Sue look out, or maybe you're not coming up these days, I don't know. But I'd yeah, like I haven't been coming up these days, but we can do something uh, yeah. um, virtually for sure. Yeah, okay, we just yeah. set that up with you pretty yeah. much. Okay, thank you. Right. Councillor Bath. No, no, no questions, just comments. It's a nice presentation. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Councillor Fanlin. No comment, Paula. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, and not, no uh, no actual comments or questions. I did, I, I did actually love the thoroughness of it, so thank you for that. Councillor Lego. Uh, just a question. Is, is it better to put money in reserve funds? than in reserves? Because it seems like there's monies in the reserve fund. Yes. Whenever possible, it is better to put money in reserve funds. That way you have the cash available to go out and spend it versus uh, having to generate cash in reserves. Like in order to spend money out of reserves, that means you have to collect your receivables or defer payment on your payables because there isn't physical cash sitting there. So it's always better to have reserve funds if you can. Okay, it's a cash just... management issue. Yeah, well, I was. We, we seem to put money in reserves and reserve funds, but there's no, there's not much money in the reserves. When, the, like the, reserves are, the reserves are supported by your other assets. Like I said, your working uh, capital, your your accounts receivable, your inventory, and all of that kind of stuff. So the the cash is out of the bank. It's just sitting in an, it's sitting in other assets. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right, that um, looks like we've reached the end of questions, uh, Frank and Richard. Any, okay. Anything further? No, I just want to thank Michelle and, and Carly and your whole team for for their help in, in getting it. It, it. it becomes it makes the audit go a lot more smoothly when we have cooperation on the other side, especially when we're dealing with COVID and trying to do things remotely. So thank you very much. And. Clerk, uh, do we need a motion? I don't see a motion on the anywhere on this. Do we, are we not receiving? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Yes, I've uh, I prepared the motion. Uh, I can read it uh, whenever you like. I think now would be the appropriate time. Very Thank well. Uh, the council adopts the year ending December thirty first, twenty nineteen, municipal consolidated audited financial statements as presented by Grant Thornton LLP at the August nineteenth, twenty twenty regular council meeting. Moved by Councillor Bath, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried. There's your final thank, thank you. you, Frank and Richard. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, apologies again for the late hour. No worries. Thank you for your no time. No worries. Thank you. Bye-bye th now. Thank you. Bye. Council, we're on to, I think, requiring separate discussion. How are we doing here for, uh, I'd like to try and get through this as efficiently as possible. Do we need a break, a short break, or are we okay? We're good. Let's keep rolling. Item 7.2, the council directs staff to continue offering the purchase of blue box bins and or receptacles carts to residents of the municipality of Silicote at 50% of cost as approved by council at the regular council meeting held on June 17, 2020. Moved by Councillor Fanlon, seconded by Councillor Lego. Discussion starting with Councillor Lego. Uh, just a question. Uh, first, were the municipalities paying 50% of the uh, blue boxes and bins? Um, I see that is the, is the first $7,000 covered? Because it says the second nine, the potential Second 9,500 is unbudgeted costs. So if we can get some clarification on that, either from the CAO or from uh, Public Works. CAO, shall I direct this to Public Works? Uh, yes, I'd like to defer that, uh, Your Worship, to Andrew. 
Uh, to, to, thank to you. you, Mayor Lawrence, can you hear me? I can, yep. Uh, essentially, um, both numbers there, the, the, the initial order and the proposed subsequent order, which is an estimate, are, are essentially both unbudgeted expenses because the transition to a new service provider was not expected within the year. For So due to the fact that we had to change the service provider, which involved uh, no longer setting out in bags, um, this is a decision that was made. However, the rationale for the report is because when I sat down and looked back at the June meeting where this was decided by council, the majority of the discussion was on blue box bins, which were a cost of $16 each with council um, viewing as a cost subsidy of approximately $8. Um, there's been a an oversight, uh, probably mainly because of how I perceive the sale of this, not people preferring to use bins instead of these larger carts. That is not the case. There's an overwhelming request for the carts, which in, in essence is creating a higher expense than expected, which is essentially unbudgeted. And I just wanted to bring that to council's attention because the majority of the discussion, as I said, not to reiterate previously, was around the lesser expense of a bin. So I just wanted to make sure that council was aware that this cost was more than originally uh, perceived. Thank you, Councillor Lego. You, you're good with that. I'm just wondering how we're we're going to be covering this, or do we? Since this is, he's apparently we're being asked again to put out more money. Uh, yeah. Do, through, we have, do we have to? Do we have to vote on this again, or? Um, well, th through through you, Mayor Lawrence. I guess essentially I'm asking for council's approval to continue in such a manner. I don't see how we, we can stop now that we've started. So in terms of it being unbudgeted and it, when I reference that it's in terms of the actual blue box program budget, but however, there are components of the public works budget where we're not spending money for reasons. However, I've already spoke with that with the CAO and she's um, directed me to not uh, to, to, to rely too heavily on that because there's other areas in the municipality as a whole that uh, may not be in the same situation. But I am watching the public works operational budget and I know where I do have surplus at this time. So I'm going to be looking at that in terms of compensating the over expenditure in recycling. Regardless, the, the recycling budget this year is going to be considerably over budget, which was presented in the report to council when we uh, decided on a new service provider. I think in that report, I don't have it open in front of me, but off the top of my head, I believe is close to 31 or 37. I'm not sure if it was a one or seven. I'm going to say $37,000 was expected. So um, essentially now these uh, additional costs would be included in that um, the, the, the over budget expense as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, um, um, Andrew, I'm just wondering what the uh, what the rationale for a two week window is, as opposed to just doing another one week window, because these have been kind of like available. Is that just kind of the perceived demand that you have that you think it might take two weeks with the increased wait times and stuff like that because of COVID? And that? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, it's it's somewhat of a window whereby. Um, after that time, there is no longer the ability to set out in plastic bags. And I think it was just, it was, it was in consultation with um, Brian McLennan, the, the municipal clerk. It's possibly just something that was thrown out there. We could reduce it to a week if, uh, if, if such is desired, but I don't think there was any um, hard uh, rationale as to why we said two weeks. It was just a general time frame as to let people be, uh, get proper notice that they could be available and that they need to actually confirm that they want one prior to placing an order. CAO? Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think the CAO has a comment. Um, uh, through you, uh, Mayor Lawrence, what I will do is defer to the clerk first and then I will add uh, any information that uh, needs to be added. 
Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, yeah, the, the the rationale for the two week window uh, is uh, is several fold. Uh, one, it is the summer. Uh, people are away on vacation. Uh, we wanted to uh, provide uh, ample opportunity uh, for advertising to get the word out so that people know uh, that the uh, they have this two week window to place their their orders. Um, additionally, uh, we're hoping that by having a two week window, we will avoid uh, the extreme congestion that we experienced at the municipal office uh, during the previous sale. Um, um, uh, we had lineups uh, to King Street uh, uh, from the municipal office door uh, 30 minutes before we opened to the public um, and it did create some other uh, uh, concerns. We had to call an ambulance twice because uh, people got ill from waiting in line and so on and so forth. So um, uh, all of those reasons uh, uh, went into uh, uh, suggesting a two week window. Sounds like a pretty good uh, precaution. CIO, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, just to add, we want to make sure that we have people have ample opportunity to be able to order their bins in advance up during the two week period because just that we had an overwhelming uh, response to uh, wanting to get the carts versus the bins and didn't expect it. And we did leave people uh, slightly unhappy when we ran out. So uh, we want to make sure that we cover everybody that has not been able to purchase them at this point. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Good. Fair enough. Thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Fanlon. No, it's uh, good handling of it, I guess, and trying to keep the public happy. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bath. No comment. I was in one of the short lines. <laughs> Councillor Thompson. No, I, I see it as a very positive thing that people are enthusiastic about recycling. And uh, when we talk about our landfill, uh, extending the life of the landfill, I think this is actually an investment in our encouraging recycling and um, eventually re extending the life of that landfill much longer than we anticipated. So I support this fully. Councillor Howie. Yeah, no other comments uh, than supporting this. Thank you. So I think I'll get quickly to the vote. Uh, I will say that a neighbor or a close neighbor of mine said that uh, they wanted the um, the larger container because they bought one of the smaller ones and it was stolen right away. So <laughs> they feel that the larger one is less less susceptible to theft. Uh, we've read the motion. It was, uh, I believe, moved by Clerk. You'd have to help me. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, moved by uh, Councillor Fenelon and seconded by Councillor Lego. All in favor? Carried. Item 7.3, wastewater dumping station that council creates, sorry, the council directs staff to cease public access to and use of the wastewater dumping station located at Moscato's Marina, which is connected to municipal sanitary wastewater infrastructure in Sulacoat. Moved by Councillor Howie, seconded by Councillor Timpson. Discussion starting with Councillor Lego. So you're muted, Councillor Lego. Uh, was there an option or was it written in uh, Andrew's report that the potential to keep it, but keep it locked and then have a set of fee to use it, but they'd have to come and get the key, but also put out the education that they can also go out to Abram Park to dump. I believe that was written in that report. If Andrew can answer that. Yeah, Public Works, Andrew. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Um, yes, that that is, uh, Councillor Lego is exactly right. There is an option in there for that, for a council to consider. However, uh, my, my, uh, the recommendation was worded differently at the beginning. However, um, in consultation with other staff, it was uh, advised to put in the recommendation what I actually prefer, and if for lack of better term, sorry. So the resolution was changed to cease the public access to it. Although if council does not regard that as a way as they, uh, or sorry, as a service they would like to have continue uh, to the public, then I did uh, list some other options for council to consider 
or open to other ideas as well. Councilor Nagel? Oh, it's just going to be up to whether the council wants to keep it there for people to use. There's a lot of people that RV sales are going through the roof this year. Um, I can't even probably a, there's probably a hundred RVs in, in town, if not more. So I don't know if it's, we're just going to wash our hands of this and not, not allow it and keep it locked and walk away from it. But that'll be up to the discussion at the table. Uh, yeah, through, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I, I would suggest, although I may be speaking on behalf of uh, Brian McKinnon, the clerk, that uh, if council defeats the motion, then then yes, we would look at uh, altering the the, uh, the recommendation to, to suit how council would like to see the service uh, remain for residents uh, or or visitors to Sioux Lookout. That's correct. I, I would like to just further add that this has been on my agenda to complete for uh, a couple of years at least. Uh, I, I discussed it with a former CAO, Ann Mitchell, and uh, it's one of those reports that is on your to-do list that it's easy to uh, push back because it's uh, not as uh, um, relevant and or, or immediate as some other reports. But however, there was a recent incident where some somebody was not happy with it being locked and it caused uh, them some... Uh, some issues. So uh, uh, at that time, I said it's a good time for me to bring this forward because I what the what the request was from the resident uh, was something that uh, I told him that I believe it should be uh, made by council in terms of whether this service should be uh, available or not. And then if if it is, then then it's up to public works to determine how how we could work it best in terms of operations. But it would still be a decision. I thought that council would want to make or should make in terms of uh, service delivery to the to the public and and visitors to Sioux Lookout. All right, I'll keep going, Councillor Lego. You're you're good for now. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Lego. No, no, I'm fine. Thanks. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I'm just my I I know in order to get not with with why we want to close it. My concern I just is I guess is if people don't have access to dump it somewhere appropriately, where are they going to dump it? Where are they, it, they're going to have it, but where's it going to go? Uh, are they going to pull up next to a storm drain and dump it down there? Are they going to drive up the highway and dump it? And like, where, where's this going to go? If we, if we have access, if it's something there, if it's locked and keyed and we charge for it and, and go for it. And that's, what it is it's a service we provide and it's a it's under the user pay we recoup the costs of the treating the water and where it goes and and go from there councillor family yeah i agree with <clears throat> somewhat with uh, andrew's report there that um we don't know what people could be throwing in there and it, it is uh there is a lot of people around that have uh, RVs nowadays working, uh, running around out there. And, and some visitors, I've probably over the years seen a few of visitors that there are dumping there too. But we got to know what they're dumping. And if we can't, well, then we have to do something about it, something different and try and make it work. Uh, has I don't know, I guess for Andrew, has he talked to the marina people to see if they are willing to look after it or anything like that? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, no, I, I have not gone that far yet. Uh, just in a conversation with a marina employee who's been there for several years, that's where I got the background on it, that it was at one time. Um, uh, you, you, you may know about this more, Councillor Fenlon, than I do. For, uh, you've been a longtime resident here. But it, 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 he, I was told that it was at one time operated and controlled by marina staff uh, it's just been i think kind of forgotten about over the years and then every once in a while you see someone using it and we stop and inquire as to what they're doing or so forth i don't know what goes on on weekends or after hours when we're not privy to anyone dumping in it but however like i said it's just an outstanding not an issue but an outstanding 
incident waiting to happen, I think that I just wanted to bring to attention. So just we could move it forward and I could get it off my desk. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's yeah. touch and go. I mean, I'm not try I'm not against it, but I think that if we were to operate it to the public, I mean, I'm not sure if it would meet the requirements in terms of when and how they would like to service to have access to it. But I mean, that's something that the public would have to work around. We could go as far as posting a sign. But I think the, that's a good point, though, that, you know, the, anyone who's using it is essentially accessing it on private property. So first and foremost, I guess we should talk to the owner of uh, the marina and, uh, and, and determine whether uh, they have any issues or, or, or concerns with uh, someone using it if, it if we did post signage there on, on how it could be used. That, that's a very good point. And last comment, I guess, is that uh, we should put a daytime uh, time frame on that for dumping, like, you know, like eight to four or something like that. Because you don't need people, the marina's open, I think, till six or something at night. And uh, there's, we shouldn't have, have an expense of looking after it after hours. That's it for me. Thank you. Councillor Bath. I think we, we need to have the avail people have to have the availability to dump. So because as uh, I think Councillor Lego said, it's, you know, there's more and more HRVs or HRVs, RVs on the road, and uh, and you know we don't we don't want to be chasing them out. In fact, the the local uh, uh, there's, there's a plan in place now to encourage more HRVs to come and travel our highways and come to our communities. So you know it's uh, we this is not the time to close it. We definitely need a proper plan. And I don't think it should be free, but uh, we, uh, I think we need to uh, work and give the Andrew something to do. <laughs> Councillor Timpson. No, I support a user fee um, a system for it. Um, I guess the only other thing would be to ask whether or not uh, is this competing with the Abram Lake who is providing this service. Uh, any comments there, uh, Public Works? Um, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, I, I guess we've we've I've contacted Abram Lake Park in the past for that exact reason, and and they do have the uh, the means to do this. I, I guess from here, if, it, if based on the conversation so far, it sounds like Council uh, would like to continue possibly providing such a service. So, having said that, I think to move forward. Uh, I would have to go out and number one, talk to the owner of the Moscato's Marina to ensure that they are uh, willing to have um, vehicles encroach on their property and on their business area to dump. And then secondly, I could also approach uh, Abram Lake Park to find out if they have any issues if we were to provide this service to the public, knowing that they had such a service available out there. Um, those could possibly be the first two steps, come back to council with the results of those inquiries and we could move forward from there. Councillor Howie. Well, the, the decision's almost been made before I get a chance to comment. <laughs> so, I, I I fully support now Andrew's uh, Andrew's pr proposal to uh, go and, and consult uh, first Moscatos and then also Abram. Um, yeah. Thank you. If you feel that way, imagine how I feel. I get to. I'm, I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think uh, we're about to defeat the, the motion and notwithstanding getting Andrew's desk clean uh, and send him back to do some more work. Uh, I, I just, a couple of comments and we don't know what people put down their toilets either, Andrew. So it's, I mean, we don't, that's in an enclosed space in a house. I mean, that, I don't think that's reason enough to say we, we, we shouldn't be doing it. Um, and I agree with many of the comments around the council table. Uh, and our views uh, are, are, are growing and we need also tourists, uh, what do we do with tourists coming to town? So I think you also, as, as well as the, the two items you, you discussed doing, Andrew, I think look at other options. Uh, is there, what would be the cost of developing uh, something in a different location? For example, if Ms. Cotters doesn't want it there anymore, um, is it close to the sewage plant? Is it, uh, where, where would it be? Um, no, Ojibwe Park does have a, have a, a dump site as well. I, I don't think you, it's a long way out of town, and they're I think closed for the year. But it is it is another another uh, dumping station. All that being said, I 
I think I sense we're ready to defeat this. And is there sufficient, Mr. Clerk? Are you you're you're chomping uh, to say something? Yeah, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, I would respectfully suggest to Council that uh, the motion be withdrawn and not defeated, uh, simply because uh, after um, the public works managers' investigations and so on and so forth and, and information that may came, come forward, uh, it may turn out that the final decision will be to close it and if you defeat uh, this motion now then we enter into the uh, the process of reconsideration and timelines and so on and so forth so i believe councillor howie moved and councillor timpson seconded please pull us um, work us through the deferral with the uh, poll pulling uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, providing both the mover and seconder uh, agree uh, to uh, to the withdrawal, uh, that's all we're required to do. Councillor Howie, good. Councillor Timpson, Councillor Howie did yes. thumbs up. You're doing elbows up. That's good enough. I agree. Thank good you. Call. Thank you. Okay, so motion uh, off the table. 7.4, Big Red Lake Service Extension. The Council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 66- and it is the... Public Works Manager staying for this, this motion? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, if there's a uh, reason to believe that I, my opinion would be, or uh, yeah, my opinion, or uh, yeah, I'll You've say. been here this long, another another few minutes won't hurt, thanks. Okay, the, thank you. Uh, the council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 66-20, being a bylaw to authorize and direct the mayor and the clerk to execute a contribution agreement between the municipality and her majesty as represented by the Minister of Economic Development and Official Languages. Okay. Um, agreement for the water and sanitary waste servicing to the Big Red Lake and North Airport commercial development projects. Moved by. Councillor Fanlon, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Discussion starting with Councillor Timpson. I'm just wondering how close are we to some sort of confirmation that a con uh, that the a contractor is willing to go ahead? Is this uh, is it um, conditional that we put? You know, do we have commitments from contractors based on our doing this, or, or, or is it speculation still, or just where are we where are we with that uh, process? Uh, CIO, can I look at you for a response here? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you, Mayor uh, Lawrence, I would like to defer this to uh, Vicki Blanchard, our Economic Development Manager, for comment. Well, right now we have the approval of FedNOR, and I would um, recommend that we acknowledge that um, by signing the agreement. Um, NOHSC has completed its phase two due diligence for approval process and would not uh, move our project forward without FedNOR um, confirming the funding. As far as speculation, I think um, I would defer to Andrew. Andrew did a, you know, a detailed um, um, estimate and incorporated some cost increase based on our previous consultants recommendations and until such time, it's my understanding that um, until such time as we have all the money, um, the public works manager is um, waiting to start the process. And my recommendation to the CAO is um, it wouldn't probably hurt to at least um, uh, look at getting the RFPs ready um, as it's looking positive at this time. Cereal. Um, if I can just add um, uh, through you, Mayor uh, Lawrence, to uh, Councillor Timpson and rest of Council, um, part of, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Vicki, part of the funding uh, due diligence is to ensure that we have secured um, um, significant investment and developers for the property. Uh, we can't speak to it specifically at this point because it's still confidential, but uh, we are making significant headway and do have all the partnerships uh, coming to, into uh, in place and uh, all of these meetings that we are having involve both FedNOR and NOHFC representatives as well. 
Thank you. That's what I was wanting to know. Thank you. Council, any further questions? Councilor Cassidy. Yeah, I'm just looking at the uh, the agreements there and just can you, the completion date that's listed in there, December 31st, 2020, what's because it, it's for the project as it's described there, what's our potential um, to make that date? We, or? we have amended the dates for um, NOHFC and um, I have sent those over and it would be my recommendation that we would amend that schedule. The, the uh, treasurer um, uh, normally looks very closely at that. Um, and um, that's just done through a request um, or it can be written in on the agreement. So um, I have sent that new schedule over after consulting with Andrew Jewell. Okay, so there's something else in play with the schedule with regards to absolutely, yeah. Stuff. We've deferred it out three years. Yeah, no, nope, that's good. That's kind of my only comments on that from what I saw. So thank you. Anything further, Council? So public works, uh, just uh, and and uh, economic development. Just a question for me: the this this project will uh, be the upgrade to the airport uh, in terms of the um, the firefighting requirements, the fire pressure at the airport, as well as taking the sewer and water under the highway to Bigwood uh, Lake. Is that correct? It'll do correct. all of that? Correct. The booster station. Yeah. And Andrew can answer it to that. Uh, th through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, from my understanding here, essentially the application is uh, threefold in terms of uh, projects if you wanted to break them out that way and and one yeah. you're, you're correct is the extension of water and sewer services from the existing connection points just uh, below the airport terminal underneath the highway uh, to a connection point adjacent to Bigwood Lake property uh, the second component of and the most major uh, aspect of the project is uh, an extension of a trunk water main under Fifth Avenue to the booster station then an upgrade to the booster station to provide adequate fire flow to the airport terminal and as well as the expansion to the Bigwood Lake development area. And then I believe the third aspect of it was uh, to cover some of the costs that were incurred just recently when we extended water and sewer service uh, to the northern part of the airport industrial area specifically for uh, connection to uh, that the work camp that's there now. And I concur so, that that's how it's laid out in the application. So this is a really good deal for the municipality to accomplish all those things and, and taking the, the water and sewer under the highway to Bigwood, uh, which is municipally owned land, uh, serviceable, it's, it's very serviceable in terms of its, uh, the, the geotechnical and topography, very desirable. Um, and it's a large area we own, I believe, but it's uh, in excess, it's about 100 acres that it's municipally owned and controlled it, with no environmental uh, uh, requirements there beyond, beyond normal. So th this is a really good deal for us. We don't have too many places where we can go to expand uh, into such a large municipally owned area. So uh, good work staff, thank you very much. No further discussion. I will call the vote. On uh, the sorry, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, we do have uh, two comments from members of the public. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, but before we get to those, I do require, uh, or I would ask that council uh, pass a resolution to extend the meeting beyond 10 o'clock. Moved by Councillor Howey, seconded by Councillor Timpson, that we extend the meeting no later than 10.30, past 10 o'clock. Um, all in favor? Carried. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Mayor Clinton, Lawrence. And, and lead me through the comments from the public. So this is uh, council discussion is over. So I'll go to the public, I guess. And uh, you're 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 the public uh, for tonight. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Thank you. So we've received uh, two uh, submissions from members of the public uh, regarding this item. The first one um, uh, is from Ansel Tell, uh, and it reads. 
The infrastructure of sewer and water has been extended outside the original Sulaco boundary several times for the purpose of attracting businesses and developers. This current proposal will cost the municipality $250,000. Can Ms. Blanchard or CAO LaRose outline what development and what businesses have opened in Sulaco with the earlier infrastructure development? Because a grant is available does not mean the municipality should expand for speculation. I realize that negotiations go on behind the scenes, cannot name particular developers by name, but can the public be told why this development is necessary, what development is being sought, hospitality, retail, mining? The citizens of Sulaco should be made aware as to why we're using $250,000 to expand. Respectfully, and Saltel. Uh, so the, um, I'm not sure, it's Help me. There was a question in there, and in many ways, I think the questions have been answered by the discussion at the table. Um, well, I, I through ahead, you, Mayor, I was, sure. Yeah, through you, Mayor Lawrence. I, I just think it's really important. The CAO and I have discussed the economic in, um, impacts of of this investment, and I'd like to share with you that information so that the public has a, a more uh, a more of a comfort level. So the Conci big would- con con Concisely, please. Yes, well, the, the overall project application is $2.2 million. 1.4, let's say approximately for the booster station and 432.5 for the 21 acre land preparation and water extension and sewer extension. And then to the 21 acres, 370,000 was the water sewer extension. So the booster center upgrade is required mostly for safety purposes and that growth that we're already experiencing with the new facility and other growth. 21 acre land in 2020, a 250 man camp, Ballard Construction, and the and who is the contractor of Wate Power Project, $1.6 billion, over 770 jobs, 261 are in our region. Bigwood property sewer water and extension. It is to continue, we are continuing to negotiate a hotel conference center. As uh, circumstances operate uh, right now, our, our occupancy rate under normal uh, would be 85%. Also to secure three 40 unit apartment complexes and to incorporate 20 additional housing units on the lake and um, with an excess of $50 million of economic development back to the community. Thank you, economic development manager. I tried uh, to do it as fast as I could. Good, uh, Mr. McClurk, you have a, a second uh, public comment? Sorry, you're muted. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, yes. Uh, second uh, comment and question, this is from um, Judy Hendrickson, um, and it reads, uh, it, it appears that far too often when a grant is flashed before council's eyes, we make up a new development project in order to access the dollars, all while cost ha uh, costing the taxpayer. For example, the Boreal Trails project, which ap appears to be a, fail a complete failure. My question is, what exactly is the Bigwood project going to host? We need more information. Possibly council should begin looking at getting a vote from the taxpayer before spending our tax dollars on wish projects. I think the uh, the question was answered uh, in by the economic development manager. Good. Uh, I didn't see any flashes tonight uh, or any time at the council table. Um, sorry. Let's move on to the vote on. We've have we voted on this, uh, Mr. Clerk? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, no, your mover is uh, Councillor Fenelon and your seconder is Councillor Cassidy. All in favor. Carried. Thank you. I believe we've come, to, no, we have one more, 7.8. That Council directs that all of its boards, commissions and committees, which operate under the provisions of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended, remain Oh, thank you. I should have said thank you to Vicky and Andrew. Please pass that along tomorrow, CAO. I'm sorry I missed that. A late night point. Please pass along our thanks. Uh, under the Municipal Act 2001 as amended, remain on hiatus until the Municipal Services Delivery Review is complete and Council has had an opportunity to review 
the findings and recommendations relative to its boards, commissions, and committees. Moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Howie. Discussion starting with Councillor Timpson. Yeah, I think we're I think we're really moving here away from the whole the whole community engagement uh, pillar that we have committed ourselves to. Um, these committees were developed by council. In terms of reference, have been approved. I don't agree that we should be waiting for uh, another study to tell us whether you know how and whatever it's whatever the intention of the study is concerning committees. Um, you know, we by the time that gets done, we're going to only have a year and a half left on this council to get anything done. And um, we've already lost a half of a year. Uh, specifically, I, when I look at the two committees that I'm involved in, and I can't speak for the others, but the Environment Committee, for example, we were, uh, there was an uh, inquiry made as to whether we could help with waste reduction week. Well, there's not much we can do if we can't meet. Um, I think there would be ideas. And we also know that we have to look at our waste reduction when it comes to our landfill. The other committee, the uh, TRC, um, we had just gotten started on a signature, on a signature project that has been sitting on the shelf since 2001. We have a member who is passionate to get moving on this and uh, we just need to get we just we just need to give them the given the the um, momentum to go ahead. Uh, and the other thing too, and another thing that in TRC we had talked about any new streets uh, being given an Aboriginal name. And then I hear today that um, there's a street up on the boreal that's called Bernier Bernier Way. Well, maybe it's you know, if that committee was more active, we could have gone to the the uh, Finway and, and said, could, you know, just negotiated that maybe an Aboriginal name could be given. So these are all kinds of things that are just going to be put on the back burner and will likely not happen. Um, I don't see what we don't have to have Zoom meetings. Why can't we do it by teleconference? My understanding of electronic meetings is it can be done by phone and anybody could phone in. So I cannot support just um, uh, canceling all the work that we're doing. Uh, basically, that's what's going to happen. We're just going to be, you know, there's going to be no committee involvement, no community engagement. Um, our, 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 our strategic plan talks about honoring our volunteers. Well, this is not honoring our volunteers when they basically say they're, they're uh, dispensable. When we do have, we can, uh, we can do this by teleconference. So I cannot support this. I cannot support this resolution. Thank you. I'll uh, go around the table. Councillor Howie. I, uh, I, I do agree with Joyce that it would be important or I think beneficial if committees and commissions could participate by a teleconference or similar to what we've uh, been doing uh, with our Zoom meetings. Um, but given that, I understand that currently with our procedure bylaw and uh, under the emergency measures, that's why we're meeting this way. Um, hopefully in the future when we have our special council meeting on September 9th and to kind of hash things out about our procedure bylaw, we can come to some kind of consensus that would allow for those meetings to occur on regular terms as well. That's all I have right now. Okay, um, Councillor uh, Bath. Yeah, I think uh, Councillor Howie hit it right on the nose. I kind of agree with him on that one. Councillor Fenlon. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to say about this, uh, whether the, the committees, the meetings for the committees should be taken some form and uh, keep moving them on. We've been, the, the committees have been down long enough, I think, and uh, we could, we, it's a chance that we could lose a lot of people off our committees if we don't uh, explain and, and 
why we're trying to do things and why we can't do it, I guess. Okay, that's good. Councilman Cassidy. Yeah, I do. I do agree with uh, Councilor Timpson as well. I think we've gone on long enough, and we heard in the the from the Northwest Health Unit tonight that we could be dealing with this for two years. Um, we got to find a new way to, to deal with it. And my other thought on this is, let's let the committees tell us if they think they have some meaningful function right now. Let's let them tell us if they want to continue, if they feel that their time spent can still be effective or not, instead of us sitting here speculating whether or not it can be. So my suggestion would be is to allow a meeting to happen. We take our procedural bylaw in September. We can figure out some stuff there and how things would work. If our committees come back to us and say, yes, our committee voted that we would like to continue our operations then we can go firm it based on what the committees feel and how they feel. And I feel that's respecting our volunteers. Councillor Nagel. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Councillor Cassidy. And even if it's just going into quarter four and figuring out what we're gonna do for 2021, at least it gives us some purpose. So I agree after our September 9th meeting and we hear, we should reach out to all of our volunteers that come out to these meetings that are on, on these committees and we, we should move forward. Okay, um, I think I'd like to hear the clerk, the clerk uh, uh, speak to this uh, now. Uh, this, so what I've heard is, I'm not sure if Councilor Timpson says immediately, um, others are, are saying, let's wait till the September uh, meeting where we, we uh, hopefully uh, bring a new procedural bylaw in. Uh, clerk? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, there, um, if, if I have your permission, there, there's also a comment from a member of the public on this one, which I think would be germane to share prior to sharing my comments. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so this comment is from, um, is also from Ann Saltel. Um, she, she writes, the Environment Committee has been very active. Even after meetings cease, the members continued with the action items planned for educational purposes. There has been a huge upsurge in, of single-use plastics during the pandemic, which is very problematic. There are members that would like to meet. We have the hazardous waste day as well as October's waste management week to name just two action items. I, for one, would like to continue with our work, even with no budget at this time. With Zoom meetings being cost prohibitive, has Council considered allowing active committees to meet via teleconference? A teleconference call is relatively inexpensive. The public will be able to access the call and actually provide input and ask questions in real time. Will the Council sanction teleconference meetings for active committees? Respectfully submitted, and Salt Help. Uh, so, Mayor Lawrence, my my comments um, um, uh, on uh, Ms. Saltel's question, uh, as well as the discussion that have been held by uh, by members of council this evening, are as follows. Uh, so, the first uh, point is looking at uh, teleconferencing as an option to Zoom. Um, I outlined the costs for Zoom in the report. Um, um, uh, so, uh, so those costs are known to council. It's going to be about ten thousand dollars for all the committees to meet for um, September, October, November, and December. Um, I've also, um, after having received this uh, uh, this comment, uh, have done some research. Uh, the cost to hold teleconference meetings for that same period of time would be five thousand dollars plus. Uh, however, many members of the public would call in uh, to participate would add to that cost of $5,000. Um, just so council is aware of the costs. Uh, another consideration with respect to the resumption of boards, commissions and committees uh, meetings is the availability of staff resources to provide the necessary support. Department heads who serve as staff resources to the various BCCs have been extremely busy over the last number of months and uh, a significant backlog of work has, uh, has built up uh, due to the fact that we had to lay off almost 50% of our staff for three months due to the pandemic. Uh, so there's the, the availability of staff uh, resources to keep up with uh, committees this fall, uh, given the backlog of work that we're all facing. Um, finally, um, 
uh, uh, some other considerations. I have heard from some committee members um, who have said that uh, they will resign if the only option is to meet virtually. Uh, they only want to meet if they can meet in person. Um, the Another uh, problem with teleconferencing is that um, unlike Zoom, the meetings aren't recorded, uh, which then creates uh, an issue uh, for transparency and accountability. Um, all of these meetings, uh, all of the council meetings that have transpired uh, virtually are available after the meeting as well. Um, there's, uh, again, and, and, and just going back to the comments I made in the report, um, the possibility of a second wave of COVID-19 in the fall um, and the limitations and potential additional closures that, uh, that we may face, that's speculative and I acknowledge that. Um, um, and with respect to uh, the Municipal Service Delivery Review, Council has commissioned that report. They want to hear uh, about ways uh, the municipality can operate more effectively. Um, committees will be part of that report, is my understanding. Um, and, um, and finally, um, again, there are no funds available for committees to carry out their work at this time. That, was, uh, that decision was made by Council last month. Um, uh, so that's all I have at this point. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll just go around the table one more time. Uh, starting with uh, Councillor Lego. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it should be up to the people that volunteer, to be honest with you. It's, uh, it's their time and their effort and their passion that uh, make these uh, committees what they are. Um, whether we're able to meet, um, I don't know where we're gonna find the money to do the teleconferencing. So we're sort of in a bind either way. Um, I guess it's gonna be up to council which, which way we're gonna, we're gonna take. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I know I you do raise good points, Brian. I, I hear I hear what you're saying. I'm just my concern is what impact this is gonna have on our boards and committees going forward. Um it's yeah, it's a dollar value and it's 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 gonna cost us or, or it's gonna do that. I'm weather's still nice for another month or two. I'll I'll go meet at the travel information center outside. <laughs> A, where people can social distance. I, I don't know. We got to get creative. Um, got to find something to work. I, I want to see. I want to see us try and reconnect and bring our committees back around. And I, I agree with Councillor Lego. Is that we got to support our volunteers and the people that drive these committees. Otherwise, they're going to dry up. So, Councillor Fenlon. I agree with everybody. I've we'll, uh, got to look after our committees. Thank you. Councillor Beth. There's no doubt we, we don't want to lose the committee, but you know, there's, there's some onus on the committees to look after themselves too. If you're really keen on being on a committee, then there's no reason just like, like Councillor Cassidy said, go, go to the travel information center and sit outside. It's nice weather. I don't think it all necessarily has to run through the municipality for, for things like environment committee, particularly, you know, they're, they're doing stuff already. So I don't know if it has to become formal, certainly to be a council committee, it does. But maybe there's a, maybe there's a bit of a break here. We, they don't have to be hard nosed council committee, just be a bunch of people who are interested in the environment or interested in whatever you're interested in. Do your thing. And, and uh, obviously, we're not going to be putting out uh, ten or twenty thousand dollars for video conferences or virtual conferences. So, uh, I, I think some of the owners should be on the committee members if they feel they want to keep going. Go for it, Councillor Timpson. Yeah, I like the idea of um, holding a meeting with. Um, every committee hold a meeting and just say like what do you want to do and i really like the idea of doing it outside we've got the travel information center we've got the pavilion at cedar bay hudson you've got a pavilion out there we could do that in uh, september 
and just ask them what what how can we make this work and um in in terms of the teleco i, I mean i think some committees are going to say they they they're not into it enough anyways to carry on and they may say let's just suspend until january or whenever but other committees will want to go ahead and um and and so it's not going to be the the total five thousand or ten thousand and if we go the teleconference route i i, I mean rarely it does a i've never been at, at a, a council meeting where um somebody from the public has, has or rather a committee meeting where a, a public person has come to sit down on it they've been delegates or whatever but nobody just shows up from the public so i just really don't think that's going to be an issue so i say yeah let's ask the committees or we're going to lose we're going to lose them so councillor howie oh sorry councillor howie uh, i second i believe the cao might have something to add <laughs> no. Well, Councillor Howie first. You go go for it, Councillor Howie. Um, yeah, I just think it's important that we support our, our committees and um, we don't want to lose our volunteers, of course. But like I said earlier, if we, we hash something out at our procedure bylaw, I mean, it's it's less than a month away when we have that meeting. So, but but again, let's be creative. I agree with Councillor Cassidy too. So, Thank you. CRO, you're about to be creative, I can tell. I just uh, would like to caution council that um, going to the individual committees to see if they want to meet, I don't think is appropriate. Uh, they are subcommittees of council. I think it should be a decision of council. So whatever way council decides to go in the future with the committees, I think it should be a decision for all committees, not just a one a polling committee members. We either go with all committees or, or none. And Mr. Clerk. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, thanks. And, and uh, you know, I, I just want to reiterate uh, that uh, comments and recommendations that are coming from me with respect to committees um, in no way are meant to undermine or devalue the work uh, of our committee volunteers. Um, I, have, I have worked with almost all committees um, um, uh, in the municipality uh, over my, my 14 year tenure here. And um, at one point, I was the staff resource for at least five all at one time. So um, I absolutely understand and value uh, what committees bring to the organization and to council, um, and and certainly uh, very much appreciate their um, their tireless efforts uh, to coming out to meetings on a regular basis. So. I just wanted to underscore that my uh, my reports and recommendations are coming from a perspective of um, uh, financial concern um, of uh, the availability and ability of staff resources to to actually host these meetings at this time. Um, I, I appreciate that that the committee volunteers come together and put a lot of work in, but respectfully, uh, so does staff. They create the agendas, they do the minutes, they do the research in between um, and so on and so forth. So, um, and, and I do feel that that point was uh, somewhat overlooked in the last round of comments. So I wanted to draw everyone's attention to that again. Um, again, in, in no way are we saying we don't want committees or we don't value the work they do. Um, uh, my report is, is and recommendation is simply a recognition of the limitations and the constraints that we're facing right now. Understood. I think everybody's uh, understanding that. And we're, we're all, I think, in a bit of a tough place here in terms of, of this, trying to get uh, something that works. So I'm, I'm notwithstanding the, the motion that's already on the table, I'm going to just throw this out as a, a possibility. A question first, the Municipal Services Delivery Review when will that be complete? That's the AO. Um, it's um, we're a little bit uh, behind due to COVID and other restraints, but um, it's we're still on on track to be finished uh, in the um, in the later fall before okay. before the deadline of December fifth with a so presentation to council. All right. Prior so, to that. Thanks. As it went around the table, I heard a few councillors say. Um, uh, make a decision on this at the September. Uh, there's a date set for the. 
I'm, I'm, my synapses are not connecting anymore. Right? Procedural bylaw. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's uh, that's the late hour, not the late age. Um, the uh, procedural bylaw. If we come back with perhaps some creative ideas at, at that procedural bylaw uh, meeting uh, that would not extend this closure right through to the fall, but extend it through to the procedural bylaw review, or sorry, the yeah, uh, which is about three weeks away. Um, give staff some time to come up with some creative ideas to um, and for uh, to put a proposal for council that would, uh, and I agree with the CIO, this needs to come from council to the committees, not uh, not the other way. Um, these are committees of council. Um, the, and the decision made at that time how we can open up some committees, the committees that choose to. Is that? I'm looking at the CAO and the clerk. How, how do you feel about that? We're amenable to it. And uh, uh, council, how would you feel? So then, it would it would either the clerk can help us here with this. We, do we need a motion tonight? Because is do we need to extend the 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 uh, the hiatus of the committees? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, yes. Presently, they're only uh, on hiatus until the end of August. Um, if a motion of, um, I'm not sure if any committees are scheduled to meet before September 9th. Uh, that's the date of the procedure uh, bylaw review meeting. Um, but right now, any, whatever the regular meeting dates for committees in September, uh, as of right now, uh, they will proceed um, unless some type of resolution is passed this evening. So could uh, I'm just going to propose a, a, a friendly amendment to the, the hi remain on hiatus until the procedural bylaw review meeting, at which time a decision would be made, something like that. Sure. I'd have to check with the mover and, and seconder. I'd have to check with you who, the, who those people are. Uh, so that would be uh, councillors uh, uh, Lego and Howie. And I'm putting that out to council as a sort of a, a compromise for trying to get a compromise for everybody that so, Councillor Lego, would you be comfortable with that uh, amendment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Councillor Howie, I think you suggested it actually. Um, so, uh, Councillor, uh, so I'll now I'll put that uh, motion on the table for discussion. Uh, Councillor Timpson, you're waving your hand. Yeah, I'm not actually sure why we need to wait for the procedure bylaw. It's already in the um, uh, amended the amendment that we made to our existing procedure bylaw, and it's also in the new proposed procedure bylaw. It's covered. I, I'm not really quite sure why, what the rationale is to wait, what the procedure Mr. bylaw has to do with it. Mr. Clerk is waving his head, so please go ahead. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, just to clarify, Councillor Timpson, we're only allowed to meet this way right now because the municipality of Sioux Lookout is still under a declared emergency. As soon as that emergency is lifted uh, by the mayor, uh, these virtual meetings can no longer occur in the procedure bylaw the way it is currently written. Well then, that, so if the emergency then is um, whatever, ceased, then we can meet in person, right? I, I mean, I don't quite get the procedure. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, the, the at this point, I am not aware of any venue that we have access to that would accommodate in-person meetings while also uh, maintaining all of the public health guidelines with respect to social distancing and so on and so forth. Uh, um, we would have to look at a minimum renting a facility that would be large enough to accommodate um, uh, all the committee members uh, so that they would be able to, uh, to social distance during the meeting. All right. So. Any other comments on the motion that's on the table now, which is that uh, this would be uh, brought to the table at the September 9th, 11th? 9th. 9th procedural bylaw meeting. All in favor? Carried. Wait, sorry, um, all in favor? I want to make sure. Thank you, carried. Bylaws, I believe. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead, Mr. Kirk. Uh, certainly. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, there are um, 
uh, five bylaws. Uh, so bylaw number 6620 being a bylaw uh, to authorize and direct the mayor and the clerk to execute a contribution agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacout and Her Majesty the Queen and Right of Canada as represented by the Minister of Economic Development and Official Languages. Agreement for water and sewer sanitary Sorry, water and sanitary waste servicing to Bigwood Lake and North Airport commercial development projects. Uh, bylaw number 6720 being a bylaw to amend the uh, Corporation of the Municipality of Sulaco comprehensive zoning bylaw uh, as amended. Uh, that is respecting the Independent First Nation Alliance application for 19 Vermeer Way. Bylaw number 6820 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 8518 being a bylaw to uh, adopt, uh, pardon me, um, uh, being a by the comprehensive zoning bylaw of the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacout. Uh, that is respect uh, to the um, um, Cullum Dasno application on Two Hoey Drive. Uh, bylaw number 6920. Uh, being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 8518, uh, being uh, the comprehensive uh, zoning bylaw for the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacout, and that's respecting uh, the IFNA application for 98 King Street. And finally, bylaw number 7020, being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 5420, being a bylaw to establish a health and safety policy manual for the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulacout and, and to adopt certain health and safety policies. Um, sorry. Yeah. So the motion then, uh, just because uh, I threw a lot of numbers out there all at once, uh, the bylaw numbers 6620, 6720, 6820, um, and 7020 be read a first, second, and third time and passed. Moved by Councillor Timpson, seconded by Councillor Bath. All in favor? Carried. No notices of motion to reconsider. No outside resolutions. Uh, reports from members of council. Councillor Howie. Uh, I had one uh, meeting with uh, MP Eric Malolo just to talk about Sulacout, how things are going, and his uh, travels in the region. Um, other than that, just uh, discussing with local residents um, regarding some of the matters for tonight. Thank you, Councillor Timpson. Uh, just the KDMA, uh, KDMA meeting, a hospital board meeting, um, uh, Northwest Health Unit um, teleconferences. Uh, that's about it, I think, yeah. Councillor Bath. I've done a couple of PACE meetings and some more, some more of the of the RIF loan uh, approvals, but and that's about all. My battery's almost dead, so. Councillor Fanning. <laughs> no meetings for me. Been quiet. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I attended the grand opening at Slam uh, this week. That went very well. Uh, it's, Kind of nice to see something come from our table and get completed and it's uh quite the complex out there and did the ground turning for the second building and then they're hoping to get working on developing the shop out there so really good progress made out in hudson there so good to see um other than that just kind of various uh communications with uh community members over some of the issues or some of the uh applications for tonight so that's about it Councillor Lego. Uh, I had a discussion with Nick Chauvin for the uh, community safety and wellness, and I had a Kenora over the aged uh, board meeting as well. That's everything. And I'm assuming that when people are reporting on all these meetings, are they all virtual? Is that uh, everybody's virtual? Have, have any, were any of those meetings in person? Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, thanks. I, I, uh, I won't go through. I've had a fairly busy month and certainly a busy week. This week was AMO, so as the CIO has been keeping you up to date on uh, delegations that we had, I think we had uh, six delegations and the, the briefing notes are being sent out. I participated on six delegations with KDSP as well, and some of them 
overlapped with the same ministers, which is always a good way to, to get Sula out in front of them twice. Um, today, I, uh, working on uh, documents that, with help from the uh, CAO and uh, Economic Development and the EA, we presented a, a briefing note to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on uh, finance for small and medium enterprises and uh, focused uh, today on um, help for our tourist outfitters. Uh, we were fortunate again that they scheduled these our sessions for, for three presentations and somebody at Splash Parks Canada didn't show up. So so it was uh, left for, for our, our delegation and one other that had to do with uh, rent relief and mortgages. Um, so we had good time and really, I think, thanks to input from, from staff and some tourist outfitters, we presented some good material, putting really in advocacy for assistance for the, uh, the tourist outfitters. Uh, tonight, apparently I was on TV, TVO, The Agenda, uh, an interview that was uh, pre-recorded uh, with uh, Wendy Landry, um, talking about indigenous relations, sort of a follow-up to the AMO signing of the, with the Ontario Federation of Indian Friendship Centers. Confirmatory bylaw number 7220 to confirm the proceedings of the municipality of Sulacote for the August 19th regular council meeting. Read a first, second, and third time and passed. Moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. All in favor? Carried. And that's it. We have a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Timpson, seconded by Councillor Bath. And as we adjourn, thank you very much to staff and the staff that we forgot, that I forgot to thank uh, that stayed on late. It was a long, a long meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. All in favor, carried. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.